Section 15 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3 by Robert Burton, Section 15. Partition 3, Section 2, Member 2, Subsection 5. Boards, Filters, Causes. When all other engines fail, that they can proceed no farther of themselves, their last refuge is to fly to boards, panders, magical filters, and receipts, rather than fail, to the devil himself. Flecteri si nequeunt superos, acaronta moribunt. And by those indirect means many a man is overcome, and precipitated into this malady, if he take not good heed. For these boards, first they are everywhere so common, and so many, that, as he said of old Croton, omnes hic aut captantur, aut captant. Either inveigle, or be inveigled, we may say of most of our cities, there be so many professed, cunning boards in them. Besides, bordery is become an art, or a liberal science, as Lucian calls it, and there be such tricks and subtleties, so many nurses, old women, panders, letter-carriers, beggars, physicians, friars, confessors, employed about it, that nullus tradere stilus sufficiat, one saith, tricentis versibus, suas impuritias traloqui nemo potest, such occult notes, stenography, polygraphy, nuntius animatus, or magnetical telling of their minds, which Cabeus the Jesuit, by the way, counts fabulous and false, cunning conveyances in this kind, that neither Juno's jealousy, nor Danae's custody, nor Argo's vigilancy can keep them safe. Tis the last and common refuge to use an assistant, such as that Catanean Philippa was to Joan, Queen of Naples, a board's help, an old woman in the business, as Myra did when she doted on Cinyrus, and could not compass her desire. The old jade, her nurse, was ready at a pinch. Dic inquit, opemque me sine fere tibi, et in hac mea, pone timorum, sedulitas erit apta libi. Fear it not, if it be possible to be done, I will effect it. Non est mulieri mulier insuperabilis. Calistina said, let him or her be never so honest, watched and reserved, tis hard but one of these old women will gain access, and scarce shall you find, as Austin observes, in a nunnery a maid alone, if she cannot have egress, before her window you shall have an old woman, or some prating gossip, tell her some tales of this clerk and that monk, describing or commending some young gentleman or other unto her. As I was walking in the street, saith a good fellow in Petronius, to see the town served one evening, I spied an old woman in a corner selling of cabbages and roots, as our hogsters do plums, apples, and such like fruits. Mother, quoth he, can you tell where I can dwell? She, being well pleased with my foolish urbanity, replied, And why, sir, should I not tell? With that she rose up and went before me. I took her for a wise woman, and by and by she led me into a by-lane, and she told me there I should dwell. I replied again, I knew not the house, but I perceived on a sudden, by the naked queens, that I was now come into a bawdy house, and then too late I began to curse the treachery of this old jade. Such tricks you shall have in many places and amongst the rest it is ordinary in Venice, and in the island of Zante, for a man to be bored to his own wife. No sooner shall you land or come on shore, but as the comical poet hath it, morem hunc meretrices habent, ad portum mitunt cerbulos, ancillulus, si qua peregrina navis in portum aderit, rogant cujatis sit, quod ei nomen siet, 
post illae extemplo sese ad plicent. These white devils have their pandas, boards, and factors in every place to seek about, and bring in customers, to tempt and waylay novices and silly travellers. And when they have them once within their clutches, as Aegidius Muscrius, in his comment upon Valerius Flaccus, describes them, with promises and pleasant discourse, with gifts, tokens, and taking their opportunities, they lay nets which Lucretia cannot avoid, and baits that Hippolytus himself would swallow. They make such strong assaults and batteries that the goddess of virginity cannot withstand them, give gifts and bribes to move Penelope, and with threats able to terrify Susanna. How many proserpinas with those catchpoles doth Pluto take? These are the sleepy rods with which their souls touched descend to hell, this the glue or lime with which the wings of the mind once taken cannot fly away, the devil's ministers to allure, entice, etc. Many young men and maids, without all question, are inveigled by these Eumenides and their associates. But these are trivial and well known. The most sly, dangerous, and cunning boards are your knavish physicians, empirics, mass priests, monks, Jesuits, and friars. Though it be against Hippocrates' oath, some of them will give a dram, promise to restore maidenheads, and do it without danger, make an abortion if need be, keep down their paps, hinder conception, procure lust, make them able with satyrions, and now and then step in themselves. No monastery so close, house so private, or prison so well kept, but these honest men are admitted to censure and ask questions, to feel their pulse beat at their bedside, and all under pretense of giving physic. Now, as for monks, confessors, and friars, as he said, non audet stigius Pluto tentare quod audet, Ephrenus monachus, plenaque fraudis anus. That Stygian Pluto dares not tempt or do, what an old hag or monk will undergo, either for himself to satisfy his own lust, for another, if he be hired thereto, or both at once, having such excellent means, for under colour of visitation, auricular confession, comfort and penance, they have free egress and regress, and corrupt God knows how many. They can such trades, some of them, practice physic, use exorcisms, etc. That whereas was wont to walk, and elf, there now walks the limiter himself, in every bush and under every tree, there needs no other incubus but he. In the mountains between Dauphine and Savoy, the friars persuaded the good wives to counterfeit themselves possessed, that their husbands might give them free access, and were so familiar in those days with some of them, that, as one observes, wenches could not sleep in their beds for necromantic friars, and the good abbess in Boccaccio may in some sort witness that, rising betimes, mistook and put on the friar's breeches instead of her veil or hat. You have heard the story, I presume, of Paulina, a chaste matron in Aegisippus, whom one of Isis's priests did prostitute to Mundus, a young knight, and made her believe it was their god Anubis. Many such pranks are played by our Jesuits, sometimes in their own habits, sometimes in others, like soldiers, courtiers, citizens, scholars, gallants, and women themselves. Proteus-like, in all forms and disguises, that go abroad in the night, to inescate and beguile young women, or to have their pleasure of other men's wives, and, if we may believe some relations, they have wardrobes of several suits in the colleges for that purpose. Howsoever in public they pretend much zeal, seem to be very holy men, and bitterly preach against adultery, fornication, there are no verier boards or whoremasters in a country, whose soul they should gain to God, they sacrifice to the devil. But I spare these men for the present. 
the last battering engines are filters amulets spells charms images and such unlawful means if they cannot prevail of themselves by the help of boards pandas and their adherents they will fly for succour to the devil himself i know there be those that deny the devil can do any such thing crato epistle too and many divines there is no other fascination than that which comes by the eyes of which i have formerly spoken and if you desire to be better informed read camerarius it was given out of old that a thessalian wench had bewitched king philip to dote upon her and by philters enforced his love but when olympia the queen saw the maid of an excellent beauty well brought up and qualified these quoth she were the philters which inveigled king philip those the true charms as henry to rosamond one accent from thy lips the blood more warms than all their philters exorcisms and charms with this alone lucretia brags in aretine she could do more than all philosophers astrologers alchemists necromancers witches and the rest of the crew as for herbs and philters i could never skill of them the sole filter that ever i used was kissing and embracing by which alone i made men rave like beasts stupefied and compelled them to worship me like an idol in our times it is a common thing saith erastus in his book de lamis for which is to take upon them the making of these filters to force men and women to love and hate whom they will to cause tempests diseases etc by charms spells characters knots hic thessala vendit filtra st hieromi proves that they can do it as in hilarius's life book three he hath a story of a young man that with a filter made a maid mad for the love of him which maid was after cured by hilarion such instances i find in john nider book five chapter five plutarch records of lucullus that he died of a filter and that cleopatra used filters to inveigle antony amongst other allurements eusebius reports as much of lucretia the poet panormiton book four de gestis Afonsi, have a story of one stephan a neapolitan knight that by a filter was forced to run mad for love but of all others that which petrarch epistles to his family book one epistle five relates of charles the great charlemagne is most memorable he foolishly doted upon a woman of mean favour and condition many years together wholly delighting in her company to the great grief and indignation of his friends and followers when she was dead he did embrace her corpse as apollo did the bay tree for his daphne and caused her coffin richly embalmed and decked with jewels to be carried about with him over which he still lamented at last a venerable bishop that followed his court prayed earnestly to god commiserating his lord and master's case to know the true cause of this mad passion and whence it proceeded it was revealed to him in fine that the cause of the emperor's mad love lay under the dead woman's tongue the bishop went hastily to the carcass and took a small ring thence upon the removal the emperor abhorred the corpse and instead of it fell as furiously in love with the bishop he would not suffer him to be out of his presence which when the bishop perceived he flung the ring into the midst of a great lake where the king then was from that hour the emperor neglected all his other houses dwelt at Arca, built a fair house in the midst of the marsh to his infinite expense and a temple by it where after he was buried and in which city all his posterity ever since used to be crowned marcus the heretic is accused for Irenaeus to have inveigled a young maid by this means and some writers speak hardly of the lady catherine of cobham that by the same art she circumvented humphrey duke of gloucester to be her husband Sicinius Aemilianus summoned Apuleius to come before Cnaeus Maximus, proconsul of Africa, that he being a poor fellow had bewitched by philters Prudentilla, an ancient rich matron, to love him, 
and being worth so many thousand sesterces to be his wife. Agrippa, Book One, Chapter Forty Eight, attributes much in this kind to philters, amulets, images, and salmuts, Title Ten de Horologius. Leo Arthur, Book Three, saith, "'Tis an ordinary practice at fairs in Africa. Prestigiatores ibe plures, qui cogunt amores et concubitus. As skilful all out as that Hyperborean magician, of which Cleodemus in Lucian tells so many fine feats performed in this kind. But Erastus, Verus, and others are against it. They grant indeed such things may be done, but as Verus discourseth, Book Three, De Lamias, Chapter Thirty Seven, not by charms, incantations, philters, but the devil himself. Book Five, Chapter Two. He contends as much. So doth Freitagius, Chapter Seventy Four, Andreas Kisalpinus, Chapter Five, and so much Sigismundus Scheretzius, Chapter Nine. De herco nocturno proves at large. Unchaste women, by the help of these witches, the devil's kitchen maids, have their loves brought to them in the night, and carried back again by a phantasm flying in the air in the likeness of a goat. I have heard, saith he, divers confess, that they have been so carried on a goat's back to their sweethearts many miles in a night. Others are of opinion that these feats, which most supposed to be done by charms and philters, are merely affected by natural causes, as by man's blood, chemically prepared, which much avails, saith Ernestus Bugravius, in Lucana Vitae et Mortis Indicae, ad amorem conciliandum et odium. So huntsmen make their dogs love them, and farmers their pollen. Tis an excellent filter, as he holds, said vulgo prodere grande nefas, but not fit to be made common, and so be mala insana, mandrake roots, mandrake apples, precious stones, dead men's clothes, candles, mala bacchia, panis porcinus, hypomanes, a certain hair in a wolf's tail, etc., of which rasis, dioscorides, porta, becca, rubius, misaldus, albertus, treat a swallow's heart, dust of a dove's heart, multum valent linguae viperarum, carabella asinorum, tela equina, paliola quibus infantes of volute nascuntor, funis strangulati ominis, lapis di nido aquilae, etc. See more in Scencius, Observationes Medicinales, Book Four, etc., which are as forcible and of as much virtue as that fountain Salmachus in Vitruvius. Ovid, Strabo, that made all such mad for love that drank of it, or that hot bath in Ai in Germany, wherein Cupid once dipped his arrows, which ever since hath a peculiar virtue to make them lovers all that wash in it. But hear the poet's own description of it. Unde hic fervor aquis terra erum pentibus uda, tela olim hic ludens ignea tinxit amor et gaudens stridore novo, fervete perennes inquit, et haec faratrae sint monumenta mei, ex illo fervet, rarusque hic mergito hospes, cui non titillet pectora blandus amor. These above-named remedies have happily as much power as that bath of I, or Venus's enchanted girdle, in which, saith Natales Comes, Love toys and dalliance, pleasantness, sweetness, persuasions, subtleties, gentle speeches, and all witchcraft to enforce love was contained. Read more of these in Agrippa, Book One, Chapter Fifty and Forty Five, Malleus Maleficarum, Part One, Quaestio Seven, Del Rio, Tome Two, Question Three, Book Three, Virus, Pomponatis, Chapter Eight, De Incantationibus. Ficinus, Book Thirteen, Calcagninus, etc. End of section fifteen. Section sixteen of the Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume Three. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Moyer. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3, by Robert Burton. Section 16, Partition 3, Section 2, Member 3, Part 1. Symptoms or signs of love melancholy in body, mind, good, bad, etc. Symptoms are either of body or mind, of body, paleness, leanness, dryness, etc. Pallidus omnis amans color hic est aptus amanti, as the poet describes lovers, fecit amor maciem, love causeth leanness. Avicenna, de Ilishi, chapter 33, makes hollow eyes, dryness, symptoms of this disease, to go smiling to themselves, or acting as if they saw or heard some delectable object. Valeriola, Book 3, Chapter 7, Laurentius, Chapter 10, Alianus Montaltus, Langius, Epistle 24, Book 1, Epistolae Medicae, Deliver, as much corpus ex angue palet corpus gracile oculi cavi lean pale ut nudis qui presit calcibus anguem as one who trod with naked foot upon a snake hollow eyed their eyes are hidden in their heads tenerque nitidi corposis cecidit decor they pine away and look ill with waking cares sighs et qui tenebant signa febeae facis oculi nihil gentile nec patrium micant and eyes that once rivalled the locks of phoebus lose the patrial and paternal lustre with groans griefs sadness dullness nulla jam cereris subi cura aut salutis want of appetite etc a reason of all this jason pratensis gives because of the distraction of the spirits the liver doth not perform his part nor turns the aliment into blood as it ought and for that cause the members are weak for want of sustenance they are lean and pine as the herbs of my garden do this month of may for want of rain the green sickness therefore often happeneth to young women a cachexia or an evil habit to men besides their ordinary sighs complaints and lamentations which are too frequent as drops from a still ut occluso stilat ab igne liquor doth cupid's fire provoke tears from a true lover's eyes the mighty mars did oft for venus shriek privily moistening his horrid cheek with womanish tears ignis distillat in undas testis erit largus quirigat ora liquor with many such like passions when Caraclea was enamoured of Theagenes, as Heliodorus sets her out, she was half distracted, and spake she knew not what, sighed to herself, lay much awake, and was lean upon a sudden. And when she was besotted on her son-in-law, Palor deformis, marcentes oculi, etc., she had ugly paleness, hollow eyes restless thoughts short wind etc euryalus in an epistle sent to lucretia his mistress complains amongst other grievances tu mihi et somni et cibi usum abstulisti 
thou hast taken my stomach and my sleep from me so he describes it aright his sleep his meat his drink in him bereft that lean he waxeth and dry as a shaft his eyes hollow and grisly to behold his hue pale and ashen to unfold and solitary he was ever alone and waking all the night making moan theocritus idyll too makes a fair maid of delphos in love with a young man of minda confess as much ut vidi ut insanii ut animus mihi male affectiis est miserae mihi forma tabescebat neque amplius pompam ulum curabam aut quando domum redieram novi sed me ardens quidam morbus consumebat decubui in lecto dies decem et noctes decem defluebant capite capili ipsaque sola reliqua ossa et cutis no sooner seen i had but mad i was my beauty failed and i no more did care for any pomp i knew not where i was but sick i was and evil i did fare i lay upon my bed ten days and nights a skeleton i was in all men's sights all these passions are well expressed by that heroical poet in the person of dido at non in felix animi finissa nec unquam solvitur in somnos oculisque ac pectore amores accipit in geminant curae rursusque resurgens saevit amor etc unhappy dido could not sleep at all but lies awake and takes no rest and up she gets again whilst care and grief and raging love torment her breast accius sanazarius ecloga two de galatea in the same manner feigns his lycoris tormenting herself for want of sleep sighing sobbing and lamenting and eustathius in his ismenias much troubled and panting at heart at the sight of his mistress he could not sleep his bed was thorns all make leanness want of appetite want of sleep ordinary symptoms and by that means they are brought often so low so much altered and changed that as he jested in the comedy one can scarce know them to be the same men attenuant juvenum vigilatae corpora noctes curaque et immenso qui fit amore dolor many such symptoms there are of the body to discern lovers by quis enem bene celet amorem can a man saith solomon proverbs six twenty seven carry fire in his bosom and not burn it will hardly be hid though they do all they can to hide it it must out plus quam mille notis it may be described quoque magis tegitur tectus magis aestuat ignis twas antiphanes the comedian's observation of old love and drunkenness cannot be concealed celare alia posis haec praeter duo vini potum etc words looks gestures all will betray them but two of the most notable signs are observed by the pulse and countenance when antiochus the son of seleucus was sick for stratonici his mother-in-law and would not confess his grief or the cause of his disease erasistratus the physician found him by his pulse and countenance to be in love with her because that when she came in presence or was named his pulse varied 
and he blushed besides. In this very sort was the love of Callices, the son of Polycles, discovered by Panacaeus the physician, as you may read the story at large in Aristinatus. By the same signs, Galen brags that he found out Justa, Boethius the consul's wife, to dote on Pilades the player, because at his name still she both altered pulse and countenance, as Polyarchus did at the name of Argenis. Franciscus Valesius, Book 3, Controversia 13, denies there is any such pulsus amatorius, or that love may be so discerned. But Avicenna confirms this of Galen out of his experience, and Gordonius chapter 20. Their pulse, he saith, is ordinate and swift, if she go by whom he loves. Langius, Epistle 24, Book 1. Neviscanus, Book 4, Number 66. Valescus de Taranta, Huianerius, Tractatus 15. Valeriola sets down this for a symptom. Difference of pulse, neglect of business, want of sleep, often sighs, blushings, when there is any speech of their mistress, are manifest signs. But amongst the rest, Josephus Struthis, that Polonian, in the fifth book, chapter 17, of his Doctrine of Pulses, holds that this and all other passions of the mind may be discovered by the pulse. And if you will know, saith he, whether the men suspected be such or such, touch their arteries, etc. And in his fourth book, fourteenth chapter, he speaks of this particular pulse, love makes an unequal pulse, etc. He gives instance of a gentlewoman, a patient of his, whom by this means he found to be much enamoured, and with whom. He named many persons, but at the last when his name came whom he suspected, her pulse began to vary and to beat swifter, and so by often feeling her pulse he perceived what the matter was. Apollonius Argonautica, Book 4, poetically setting down the meeting of Jason and Medea, makes them both to blush at one another's sight, and at the first they were not able to speak. Totus parmeno tremo horeoque postquam aspexi hanc. Phaedria trembled at the sight of Thais. Others sweat, blow short. Crura tremunt ac poplites. Are troubled with palpitation of heart upon the like occasion. Cor proximum ori saith Aristinatus, their heart is at their mouth, leaps, these burn and freeze, for love is fire, ice, hot, cold, itch, fever, frenzy, pleurisy, what not. They look pale, red, and commonly blush at their first congress, and sometimes through violent agitation of spirits bleed at nose, or when she is talked of, which very sign Eustathius makes an argument of Ismene's affection, that when she met her sweetheart by chance, she changed her countenance to a maiden blush. Tis a common thing amongst lovers, as Arnulfus, that merry conceited bishop, hath well expressed in a facetious epigram of his, Alterno facies sibi dat responsa rubore, et tenera fectum prodit utrique pudor, etc. Their faces answer, and by blushing say, how both affected are, they do betray. But the best conjectures are taken from such symptoms as appear when they are both present. All their speeches, 
amorous glances, actions, lascivious gestures, will betray them. They cannot contain themselves, but that they will be still kissing. Stratocles, the physician, upon his wedding day, when he was at dinner, nihil prius sorbilavit quam tria basia puellae pangeret, could not eat his meat for kissing the bride, etc. First a word, and then a kiss, then some other compliment, and then a kiss, then an idle question, then a kiss, and when he had pumped his wits dry, can say no more, kissing and calling are never out of season. Hoc non deficit incipitque semper, tis never at an end, another kiss, and then another, another, and another, etc. Hoc ades, o Thesaira, come, kiss me, Corinna. Centum basia centies, centum basia milies, mille basia milies, et tot milia milies, quot gutae siculo mari, quot sunt sidera celo, istis purpureis genis, istis turgidulis labris, ocelisque loquaculis, figam continuo impetu, o formosa neaira, as Catullus to Lesbia, da mihi basia mille de indi centum, de in mille altera da secunde centum, de in usque altera millia de inde centum. First give a hundred, then a thousand, then another hundred, then unto the other add a thousand, and so more, etc till you equal with the store all the grass, etc. So Venus did by her Adonis, the moon with Endymion. They are still dallying and culling as so many doves. Columbatimque labra conserentes labiis, and that with alacrity and courage, Affligunt avide corpus, junguntque salivas, oris, et inspirant prensantes dentibus ora. Tam impresso ore ut vix inde labra detrahant, cervice reclinata, as Lamprias in Lucian kissed Thais, Philippus her Aristinitus, amore limfato tam oriose adhaisit, ut vix labra solvere esset, totumque os mihi contrivit. Aretine's Lucretia, by a suitor of hers, was so saluted, and tis their ordinary fashion. Dentes illudunt saipe labellis, atque premunt arete ad figentes oscula. They cannot, I say, contain themselves, they will be still not only joining hands, kissing, but embracing, treading on their toes, etc., diving into their bosoms, and that libenter et cum delectatione, as Philostratus confesseth to his mistress, and Lamprias in Lucian, mamilas premens per sinum clam dextra, etc., feeling their paps, and that scarce honestly sometimes, as the old man in the comedy well observed of his son, non ego te videbam manum huic puellae in sino mincere. Did I not see thee put thy hand into her bosom? Go to with many such love tricks. Juno in Lucian, Deorum, Tome 3. Dialogus three, complains to Jupiter of Ixion, he looked so attentively on her, and sometimes would sigh and weep in her company, and when I drank by chance, and gave Ganymede the cup, he would desire to drink still in the very cup that I drank of, and in the same place where I drank, and would kiss the cup, 
and then look steadily on me and sometimes sigh and then again smile if it be so they cannot come near to dally have not that opportunity familiarity or acquaintance to confer and talk together yet if they be in presence their eye will betray them ubi amor ibi oculus as the common saying is where i look i like and where i like i love but they will lose themselves in her looks alter in alterius jactantes lumina vultus quaerebant taciti noster ubi esset amor they cannot look off whom they love they will impregnare eam ipsis oculis deflower her with their eyes be still gazing staring stealing faces smiling glancing at her as apollo on leucothoe the moon on her endymion when she stood still in caria and at latmos caused her chariot to be stayed they must all stand and admire or if she go by look after her as long as they can see her she is animae auriga as anacreon calls her they cannot go by her door or window but as an adamant she draws their eyes to it though she be not there present they must needs glance that way and look back to it aristinatus of exthemus lucian in his amaginem of himself and tatius of clitophon say as much ille oculos de leucippe nonquam deiciebat and many lovers confess when they came in their mistress's presence they could not hold off their eyes but looked wistfully and steadily on her in coniuo aspectu with much eagerness and greediness as if they would look through or should never have enough sight of her fixis ardens obtutibus hairet so she will do by him drink to him with her eyes nay drink him up devour him swallow him as marshall's mamura is remembered to have done inspexit moles pueros oculisque comedit etc there is a pleasant story to this purpose in navigationes vertomani book three chapter five the sultan of sana's wife in arabia because vertomanus was fair and white could not look off him from sun rising to sun setting she could not desist she made him one day come into her chamber et geminae horae spatio into ebatur non a me anquam aciam oculorum aver tebat me observans veluti cupidinem quendam for two hours space she still gazed on him a young man in lucian fell in love with venus's picture he came every morning to her temple and there continued all day long from sunrising to sunset unwilling to go home at night sitting over against the goddess's picture he did continually look upon her and mutter to himself i know not what if so be they cannot see them whom they love they will still be walking and waiting about their mistress's doors taking all opportunity to see them as in longus sophista daphnis and chloe two lovers were still hovering at one another's gates he sought all occasions to be in her company to hunt in summer and catch birds in the frost about her father's house in the winter that she might see him and he her a king's palace was not so diligently attended saith aretnes lucretia as my house was when i lay in rome 
the porch and street was ever full of some walking or riding on set purpose to see me their eye was still upon my window as they passed by they could not choose but look back to my house when they were past and sometimes hem or cough or take some impertinent occasion to speak aloud that i might look out and observe them tis so in other places tis common to every lover tis all his felicity to be with her to talk with her he is never well but in her company and will walk seven or eight times a day through the street where she dwells and make sleeveless errands to see her plotting still where when and how to visit her levesque sub nocte susuri composita repetuntur hora and when he is gone he thinks every minute an hour every hour as long as a day ten days a whole year till he see her again tempora si numeres bene quae numeramus amantes and if thou be in love thou wilt say so too et longum formosa vale farewell sweetheart vale carissima argenis etc farewell my dear argenis once more farewell farewell and though he is to meet her by compact and that very shortly perchance to-morrow yet both to depart he'll take his leave again and again and then come back again look after and shake his hand wave his hat afar off now gone he thinks it long till he see her again and she him the clocks are surely set back the hours past hospita demophon tua te rodefeia filis ultra promissum tempus abese queror she looks out at window still to see whether he come and by report phyllis went nine times to the seaside that day to see if her demophon were approaching and troilus to the city gates to look for his cresseid she is ill at ease and sick till she see him again peevish in the meantime discontent heavy sad and why comes he not where is he why breaks he promise why tarries he so long sure he is not well sure he hath some mischance sure he forgets himself and me with infinite such and then confident again up she gets out she looks listens and inquires hearkens kens every man afar off is sure he every stirring in the street now he is there that's he male aurorae male soli dicit deratque etc the longest day that ever was so she raves restless and impatient for amor non patitur moras love brooks no delays the times quickly gone that's spent in her company the miles short the way pleasant all weather is good whilst he goes to her house heat or cold though his teeth chatter in his head he moves not wet or dry tis all one wet to the skin he feels it not cares not at least for it but will easily endure it and much more because it is done with alacrity and for his mistress's sweet sake let the burden be never so heavy love makes it light jacob served seven years for rachel and it was quickly gone because he loved her none so merry if he may happily enjoy her company 
he is in heaven for a time and if he may not dejected in an instant solitary silent he departs weeping lamenting sighing complaining but the symptoms of the mind in lovers are almost infinite and so diverse that no art can comprehend them though they be merry sometimes and wrapped beyond themselves for joy yet most part love is a plague a torture a hell a bitter sweet passion at last amor mele et fele est faecundissimus gustum dat dulcem et amarum tis suavis americies dolentia delectabilis hilare tormentum et me mele beant suaviora et me fele necant amariora like a summer fly or sphinx's wings or a rainbow of all colours quae ad solis radios conversae auriae erant adversus nubes ceruleae quale jabar iridis fair foul and full of variation though most part irksome and bad for in a word the spanish inquisition is not comparable to it a torment and execution as it is as he calls it in the poet an unquenchable fire and what not from it saith augustine arise biting cares perturbations passions sorrows fears suspicions discontents contentions discords wars treacheries enmities flattery cozening riot impudence cruelty knavery etc dolor querelae lamentatio lacrimae perennes languor anxietas amaritudo aut si triste magis potest quid esse hos tu das comites neaera vitae these be the companions of lovers and the ordinary symptoms as the poet repeats them in amore haec insunt vitia suspiciones inimiciae audaciae bellum pax rursum etc in somnia aerumna error terror et fuga ex cogitantia ex cors immodestia petulantia cupiditas et malevolentia in haeret etiam aviditas desidia injuria inopia contumelia et dispendium etc in love these vices are suspicions peace war and impudence detractions dreams cares and errors terrors and affrights immodest pranks devices slights and flights heart-burnings wants neglects desire of wrong loss continual expense and hurt among every poet is full of such catalogues of love symptoms but fear and sorrow may justly challenge the chief place though hercules de saxonia chapter three tractatus de melancholia will exclude fear from love melancholy yet i am otherwise persuaded res est soliciti plena timoris amor tis full of fear anxiety doubt care peevishness suspicion it turns a man into a woman which made hesiod belike put fear and paleness venus's daughters marti clupeos atque arma secanti alma venus peperit palorum onaque timorem because fear and love are still linked together moreover they are apt to mistake amplify too credulous sometimes too full of hope and confidence and then again very jealous 
unapt to believe or entertain any good news the comical poet hath prettily painted out this passage amongst the rest in a dialogue betwixt mitio and aeschines a gentle father and a lovesick son be of good cheer my son thou shalt have her to wife ah father do you mock me now i mock thee why that which i so earnestly desire i more suspect and fear get you home and send for her to be your wife what now a wife now father etc these doubts anxieties suspicions are the least part of their torments they break many times from passions to actions speak fair and flatter now most obsequious and willing by and by they are averse wrangle fight swear quarrel laugh weep and he that doth not so by fits lucian holds is not thoroughly touched with this lodestone of love so their actions and passions are intermixed but of all other passions sorrow hath the greatest share love to many is bitterness itself rem amaram plato calls it a bitter potion an agony a plague eripite hanc pestem perniciemque mihi quae mihi sobrepens imos ut torpor in artus ex pulit ex omni pectore laetitias o oh, take away this plague this mischief from me which as a numbness over all my body expels my joys and makes my soul so heavy phaedria had a true touch of this when he cried out o thais utinam eset mihi pars aequa amoris tecum ac paritor fieret ut aut hoc tibi doleret itidem ut mihi dolet o thais would thou hadst of these my pains a part or as it doth me now so it would make thee smart so had that young man when he roared again for discontent iactor crucior agitor stimulor versor in amoris rota miser ex animor feror distrahor deripior ubi sum ibi non sum ubi non sum ibi est animus i am vexed and tossed and racked on love's wheel where not i am but where am do not feel the moon in lucian made her moan to venus that she was almost dead for love pereo equidem amore and after a long tale she broke off abruptly and wept o oh, venus thou knowest my poor heart carmides in lucian was so impatient that he sobbed and sighed and tore his hair and said he would hang himself i am undone o oh, sister tryphena i cannot endure these love pangs what shall i do vos odii averunci solvite me his curis o ye gods free me from these cares and miseries out of the anguish of his soul theocles prays shall i say most part of a lover's life is full of agony anxiety fear and grief complaints sighs suspicions and cares hi ho my heart is woe full of silence and irksome solitariness frequenting shady bowers in discontent to the air his fruitless clamours he will vent except at such times that he hath lucida intervalla pleasant gales or sudden alterations 
as if his mistress smile upon him, give him a good look, a kiss, or that some comfortable message be brought him, his service is accepted, etc. He is then too confident, and rapt beyond himself, as if he had heard the nightingale in the spring before the cuckoo, or, as Callisto was at Malebias's presence, quis unquam hac mortali vita tam gloriosum corpus vidit, humanitatem transcendere videor, etc. Who ever saw so glorious a sight, what man ever enjoyed such delight? More content cannot be given of the gods, wished, had, or hoped of any mortal man. There is no happiness in the world comparable to his, no content, no joy to this, no life to love, he is in paradise. Quis me uno vivit felicior, aut magis hac est optandum vita dicere quis poterit? Who lives so happy as myself? What bliss in this our life may be compared to this? He will not change fortune in that case with a prince. Donec gratus eram tibi persarum vigui rege beatior. The Persian kings are not so jovial as he is. O festus dies hominis! O happy day! So Chirea exclaims when he came from Pamphila his sweetheart well pleased, Nunc est profecto interfici cum perpeti me possem, ne hoc gaudium contaminet vita aliqua aigritudine. He could find in his heart to be killed instantly, lest if he live longer some sorrow or sickness should contaminate his joys. A little after, he was so merrily set upon the same occasion that he could not contain himself. O populares, equis me vivit hodie fortunatior, nemo hercule quisquam, nam in me dii plane potestatem suam omnem ostendere. Ist possible, O my countrymen, for any living to be so happy as myself. No, sure, it cannot be, for the gods have shown all their power, all their goodness in me. Yet, by and by, when this young gallant was crossed in his wench, he laments and cries and roars downright, Ocidi, I am undone. Neque virgo es usquam, neque ego, qui e conspectu ilam amisi meo, ubi quaeram, ubi investigem, quem percunter, quam insistam viam. The virgin's gone, and I am gone. She's gone, she's gone, and what shall I do? Where shall I seek her? Where shall I find her? Whom shall I ask? What way? What course shall I take? What will become of me? Vitalis auras invitus agebat. He was weary of his life, sick, mad, and desperate. Utinam mihi esit aliquid hic, quo nunc me praecipitem darem. Tis not Chiraeus's case this alone, but his and his and every lover's in the like state. If he hear ill news, have bad success in his suit, she frown upon him, or that his mistress in his presence respect another more, as Hedus observes, prefer another suitor, speak more familiarly to him, or use more kindly than himself, if by nod, smile, message she discloseth herself to another he is instantly tormented none so dejected as he is utterly undone a castaway 
inquem fortuna omnia odiorum suorum crudelissima tela exonerat a dead man the scorn of fortune a monster of fortune worse than not the loss of a kingdom had been less aretine's lucretia made very good proof of this as she relates it herself for when i made some of my suitors believe i would betake myself to a nunnery they took on as if they had lost father and mother because they were for ever after to want my company omnes labores leves fuere all other labor was light but this might not be endured tui carendum quod erat for i cannot be without thy company mournful amintas painful amintas careful amintas better a metropolitan city were sacked a royal army overcome an invincible armada sunk and twenty thousand kings should perish than her little finger ache so zealous are they and so tender of her good they would all turn friars for my sake as she follows it in hope by that means to meet or see me again as my confessors at stool-ball or at barley-break and so afterwards when an importunate suitor came if i had bid my maid say that i was not at leisure not within busy could not speak with him he was instantly astonished and stood like a pillar of marble another went swearing chafing cursing foaming illa sibi vox ipsa jovis violentior ira cum tonat etc the voice of a mandrake had been sweeter music but he to whom i gave entertainment was in the elysian fields ravished for joy quite beyond himself tis the general humour of all lovers she is their stern pole-star and guide deliquiumque animi deliquiumque sui as a tulipant to the sun which our herbalists call narcissus when it shines is admirandus flos ad radios solis se pandens a glorious flower exposing itself but when the sun sets or a tempest comes it hides itself pines away and hath no pleasure left which carolus gonzaga duke of mantua in a cause not unlike sometimes used for an impress do all enamorates to their mistress she is their son their primum mobile or anima informans this one hath elegantly expressed by a windmill still moved by the wind which otherwise hath no motion of itself sic tua ni spirit gratia truncus ero he is wholly animated from her breath his soul lives in her body sola claves habet interitus et salutis she keeps the keys of his life his fortune ebbs and flows with her favour a gracious or bad aspect turns him up or down mens mea lucescit lucia luce tua howsoever his present state be pleasing or displeasing tis continuate so long as he loves he can do nothing think of nothing but her desire hath no rest she is his cynosure hesperus and vesper his morning and evening star his goddess his mistress his life his soul his everything dreaming waking she is always in his mouth his heart his eyes ears 
and all his thoughts are full of her his laura his victorina his columbina flavia flaminia caelia delia or isabella call her how you will she is the sole object of his senses the substance of his soul nidulus animae suae he magnifies her above measure totus in illa full of her can breathe nothing but her i adore melibaea saith lovesick callisto i believe in melibaea i honour admire and love my melibaea his soul was soused imparadised imprisoned in his lady when thais took her leave of phaedria me phaedria et nun quid aliud vis sweetheart she said will you command me any further service he readily replied and gave this in charge egone quid velim dies noctesque ames me me desireres me somnies me expectes me cogites me speres me te oblectes mecum totasis meus fac postremo animus quando ego sum tuus dost ask my dear what service i will have to love me day and night is all i crave to dream on me to expect to think on me depend and hope still covet me to see delight thyself in me be wholly mine for know my love that i am wholly thine but all this needed not you will say if she affect once she will be his settle her love on him on him alone illum absens absentem auditque videtque she can she must think and dream of naught else but him continually of him as did orpheus on his eurydice te dulcis coniux te solo in litore mecum te veniente die te discedente canebam on thee sweet wife was all my song morn evening and all along and dido upon her aeneas et quae me insomnia terent multa viri virtus et plurima curit imago and ever and anon she thinks upon the man that was so fine so fair so blithe so debonair clitophon in the first book of achilles tatius complaineth how that his mistress leucippe tormented him much more in the night than in the day for all day long he had some object or other to distract his senses but in the night all ran upon her all night long he lay awake and could think of nothing else but her he could not get her out of his mind towards morning sleep took a little pity on him he slumbered a while but all his dreams were of her te nocte sub atra oloquor amplector falsaque in imagine somni gaudia solicitam palpant evanida mentem in the dark night i speak embrace and find that fading joys deceive my careful mind the same complaint euryalus makes to his lucretia day and night i think of thee i wish for thee i talk of thee call on thee look for thee hope for thee delight myself in thee day and night i love thee nec mihi vespere surgente decedunt amores nec rapidum fugiente solem morning evening all is alike with me i have restless thoughts te vigilans oculis animo te nocte requiro still i think on thee 
anima non est ubi animat sed ubi amat i live and breathe in thee i wish for thee o niveam quae te poterit mihi redere lucem o mihi felicem terque quaterque diem o happy day that shall restore thee to my sight in the meantime he raves on her her sweet face eyes actions gestures hands feet speech length breadth height depth and the rest of her dimensions are so surveyed measured and taken by that astrolabe of fantasy and that so violently sometimes with such earnestness and eagerness such continuance so strong an imagination that at length he thinks he sees her indeed he talks with her he embraceth her ixion like pro junone nubem a cloud for juno as he said nihil praeter lucipen cerno lucipe mihi perpetuo in oculis et animo versatur i see and meditate of naught but lucipe be she present or absent all is one et quam vis aberat placidae praesentia formae quem dederat praesens forma manebat amor that impression of her beauty is still fixed in his mind haerent infixi pectora vultus as he that is bitten with a mad dog thinks all he sees dogs dogs in his meat dogs in his dish dogs in his drink his mistress is in his eyes ears heart in all his senses valeriola had a merchant his patient in the same predicament and ulricus molitor out of augustine hath a story of one that through vehemency of his love passion still thought he saw his mistress present with him she talked with him et comisceri cum ea vigilans videbatur still embracing him now if this passion of love can produce such effects if it be pleasantly intended what bitter torments shall it breed when it is with fear and continual sorrow suspicion care agony as commonly it is still accompanied what an intolerable pain must it be non tam grandes gargara culmos quot demerso pectore curas longa nexas usque catena vel quae penitus crudelis amor vulnera miscet mount gargarus hath not so many stems as lover's breast hath grievous wounds and linked cares which love compounds end of section 16section 17 of the anatomy of melancholy volume 3 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by cynthia moyer the anatomy of melancholy volume 3 by robert burton section 17 partition 3 section 2 member 3 part 2 when the king of babylon would have punished a courtier of his for loving of a young lady of the royal blood and far above his fortunes apollonius in presence by all means persuaded to let him alone for to love and not enjoy was a most unspeakable torment no tyrant could invent the like punishment as a gnat at a candle in a short space 
he would consume himself. For love is a perpetual flux, angor animi, a warfare, militat omnis amans, a grievous wound is love still, and a lover's heart is Cupid's quiver, a consuming fire, acere ad hunc ignem, etc., an inextinguishable fire. Alitur et crescit malum, et ardet intus, qualis aetnaeo vapor exundat antro. As etna rageth, so doth love, and more than etna or any material fire. Nam amor saepe lupareo vulcano ardentiorem flamam incendere solet. Vulcan's flames are but smoke to this. For fire, saith Xenophon, burns them alone that stand near it or touch it. But this fire of love burneth and scorcheth afar off, and is more hot and vehement than any material fire. Ignis in igne furit, tis a fire in a fire, the quintessence of fire. For when Nero burnt Rome, as Callisto urgeth, he fired houses, consumed men's bodies and goods. But this fire devours the soul itself, and one soul is worth a hundred thousand bodies. No water can quench this wild fire. In pectus coecos absorbuit ignes, ignes qui nec aqua perimi potuere, nec imbre diminui, neque graminibus, magicisque susuris. A fire he took into his breast, which water could not quench, nor herb, nor art, nor magic spells could quell, nor any drench. Except it be tears and sighs, for so they may chance find a little ease. Sic candentia cola, sic patens frons, sic me blanda tui neaira ocelli, sic pares minio genae perurunt, ut nime lacrimae rigent perenes, totus intenues eam fauilas. So thy white neck, neaira, me, poor soul, doth scorch, thy cheeks, thy wanton eyes that roll. Were it not for my dropping tears that hinder, I should be quite burnt up forthwith to cinder. This fire strikes like lightning, which made those old Grecians paint Cupid in many of their temples, with Jupiter's thunderbolts in his hands. For it wounds, and cannot be perceived how, whence it came, where it pierced. Urimur et coecum pectora vulnus habent, and can hardly be discerned at first. Est molis flama medulas, et tacitum insano vivit sub pectore vulnus. A gentle wound, an easy fire it was, and sly at first, and secretly did pass. But by and by it began to rage and burn amain. Pectus in sanum vapor, amorque torret, intus saevus vorat, penitus medulas, atque pervenas meat, visceribus ignis mersus, et venis latens, ut agilis altas flama percurit trabes. This fiery vapour rageth in the veins, and scorcheth entrails, as when fire burns a house, it nimbly runs along the beams, and at the last the whole it overturns. Abraham Hophimanus relates, out of Plato, how that Empedocles, the philosopher, was present at the cutting up of one that died for love. His heart was combust, his liver smoky, his lungs dried up, insomuch that he verily believed his soul was either sodden 
or roasted through the vehemency of love's fire which belike made a modern writer of amorous emblems express love's fury by a pot hanging over the fire and cupid blowing the coals as the heat consumes the water sic sua consumit viscera cacus amor so doth love dry up his radical moisture another compares love to a melting torch which stood too near the fire sic quo quis proprior suae puellae est hoc stultus proprior suae ruinae est the nearer he unto his mistress is the nearer he unto his ruin is so that to say truth as castilio describes it the beginning middle end of love is naught else but sorrow vexation agony torment irksomeness wearisomeness so that to be squalid ugly miserable solitary discontent dejected to wish for death to complain rave and to be peevish are the certain signs and ordinary actions of a lovesick person this continual pain and torture makes them forget themselves if they be far gone with it in doubt despair of obtaining or eagerly bent to neglect all ordinary business pendent opera interrupta minaeque murorum ingentes aequataque machina celo lovesick dido left her work undone so did phaedra palladis telai vacant et interipsus pensa labuntur manus faustus in mantuan took no pleasure in anything he did nulla quies mihi dulcis erat nullus labor aegro pectore sensus iners et mens torpore sepulta carminis occiderat studium and tis the humour of them all to be careless of their persons and their estates as the shepherd in theocritus et haec barba in culta est squalidique capili their beards flag and they have no more care of pranking themselves or of any business they care not as they say which end goes forward oblitusque greges et rura domestica totus uritur et noctes in luctum expendit amaras forgetting flocks of sheep and country farms the silly shepherd always mourns and burns lovesick chirea when he came from pamphila's house and had not so good welcome as he did expect was all amort parmeno meets him quid tristis es why art thou so sad man unde es whence comest how doest but he sadly replies ego hercle nescio neque unde eam neque quorsum eam ita prorsus oblitus sum mei i have so forgotten myself i neither know where i am nor whence i come nor whether i will what i do parmeno how so chirea i am in love prudens sciens vivus videnceque pereo nec quid agam scio he that erst had his thoughts free as philostratus lemnius in an epistle of his describes this fiery passion and spent his time like a hard student in those delightsome philosophical precepts he that with the sun and moon wandered all over the world with stars themselves ranged about and left no secret or small mystery in nature unsearched since he was enamoured can do nothing now but think and meditate of love matters day and night 
composeth himself how to please his mistress all his study endeavour is to approve himself to his mistress to win his mistress's favour to compass his desire to be counted her servant when peter abelard that great scholar of his age cui soli patuit scibile quis quid erat whose faculties were equal to any difficulty in learning was now in love with heloise he had no mind to visit or frequent schools and scholars any more tidiosum mihi valde fuit as he confesseth ad scolas procedere vel iniis morari all his mind was on his new mistress now to this end and purpose if there be any hope of obtaining his suit to prosecute his cause he will spend himself goods fortunes for her and though he lose and alienate all his friends be threatened be cast off and disinherited for as the poet saith amori quis legem det though he be utterly undone by it disgraced go a-begging yet for her sweet sake to enjoy her he will willingly beg hazard all he hath goods lands shame scandal fame and life itself non recedam neque quiescam noctu et interdio profecto quam aut ipsam aut mortem investigavero i'll never rest or cease my suit till she or death do make me mute partenis in aristinatus was fully resolved to do as much i may have better matches i confess but farewell shame farewell honour farewell honesty farewell friends and fortunes etc o harpedona keep my counsel i will leave all for his sweet sake i will have him say no more contra gentes i am resolved i will have him gobrias the captain when he had espied rodante the fair captive maid fell upon his knees before mistilus the general with tears vows and all the rhetoric he could by the scars he had formerly received the good service he had done or whatsoever else was dear unto him besought his governor he might have the captive virgin to be his wife virtutis suae spolium as a reward of his worth and service and moreover he would forgive him the money which was owing and all reckonings besides due unto him i ask no more no part of booty no portion but rodante to be my wife and when as he could not compass her by fair means he fell to treachery force and villainy and set his life at stake at last to accomplish his desire tis a common humour this a general passion of all lovers to be so affected and which aemilia told aratine a courtier in castilio's discourse surely aratine if thou wert not so indeed thou didst not love ingenuously confess for if thou hadst been thoroughly enamoured thou wouldst have desired nothing more than to please thy mistress for that is the law of love to will and nil the same tantum velle et nolle velit nolit quod amica undoubtedly this may be pronounced of them all they are very slaves drudges for the time madmen fools dizzards atrabellarii beside themselves and as blind as beetles their dotage is most eminent 
amore simul et sapere ipsi iovi non datur as seneca holds jupiter himself cannot love and be wise both together the very best of them if once they be overtaken with this passion the most staid discreet grave generous and wise otherwise able to govern themselves in this commit many absurdities many indecorums unbefitting their gravity and persons quisquis amat servit sequitur captivus amantem fert domita cervice jugum samson david solomon hercules socrates etc are justly taxed of indiscretion in this point the middle sort are between hawk and buzzard and although they do perceive and acknowledge their own dotage weakness fury yet they cannot withstand it as well may witness those expostulations and confessions of dido in virgil incipit effari mediaque in voce resistit phaedra in seneca quod ratio poscit vincit ac regnat furor potensque totamente dominatur deus mira in ovid illa quidem sentit fedoque repugnat amori et secum quo mente feror quid molior inquit dii precor et pietas etc she sees and knows her fault and doth resist against her filthy lust she doth contend and whither go i what am i about and god forbid yet doth it in the end again per vigil igne carpitur indomito furiosaque vota retrectat et modo desperat modo vult tentare pudetque et cupit et quid agat non invenit etc with raging lust she burns and now recalls her vow and then despairs and when tis past her former thoughts she'll prosecute in haste and what to do she knows not at the last she will and will not abhors and yet as medea did doth it trahit in vitam nova via aliudque cupido mens aliud suadet video meliora proboque deteriora sequor reason pulls one way burning lust another she sees and knows what's good but she doth neither o fraus amorque et mentis emotai furor quo me abstulistis the major part of lovers are carried headlong like so many brute beasts reason counsels one way thy friends fortunes shame disgrace danger and an ocean of cares that will certainly follow yet this furious lust precipitates counterpoiseth weighs down on the other though it be their utter undoing perpetual infamy loss yet they will do it and become at last insensati void of sense degenerate into dogs hogs asses brutes as jupiter into a bull apuleus an ass lycaon a wolf tereus a lapwing callisto a bear elpenor and grillus into swine by circe for what else may we think those ingenious poets to have shadowed in their witty fictions and poems but that a man once given over to his lust as fulgentius interprets that of apuleius alciat of tereus is no better than a beast rex fueram sic christa docet sed sordida vita immundam e tanto culmine fecit avem i was a king my crown my witness is 
but by my filthiness am come to this their blindness is all out as great as manifest as their weakness and dotage or rather an inseparable companion an ordinary sign of it love is blind as the saying is cupid's blind and so are all his followers quisquis amat ranam ranam putat esse dianam every lover admires his mistress though she be very deformed of herself ill-favoured wrinkled pimpled pale red yellow tanned tallow-faced have a swollen juggler's platter face or a thin lean chitty face have clouds in her face be crooked dry bald goggle-eyed blear-eyed or with staring eyes she looks like a squist cat hold her head still awry heavy dull hollow-eyed black or yellow about the eyes or squint-eyed sparrow-mouthed persian hook-nosed have a sharp fox nose a red nose china flat great nose nare simo patuloque a nose like a promontory gubber tushed rotten teeth black uneven brown teeth beetle browed a witch's beard her breath stink all over the room her nose drop winter and summer with a bavarian poke under her chin a sharp chin lave eared with a long crane's neck which stands awry too pendulis mamis her dugs like two double jugs or else no dugs in that other extreme bloody fallen fingers she have filthy long unpaired nails scabbed hands or wrists a tanned skin a rotten carcass crooked back she stoops is lame splay-footed as slender in the middle as a cow in the waist gouty legs her ankles hang over her shoes her feet stink she breed lice a mere changeling a very monster an oaf imperfect her whole complexion savours a harsh voice incondite gesture vile gait a vast virago or an ugly tit a slug a fat fustilugs a truss a long lean raw-bone a skeleton a sneaker si qua latent meliora puta and to thy judgment looks like a murd in a lantern whom thou couldst not fancy for a world but hatest loathest and wouldst have spit in her face or blow thy nose in her bosom remedium amoris to another man a dowdy a slut a scold a nasty rank rammy filthy beastly queen dishonest peradventure obscene base beggarly rude foolish untaught peevish eros's daughter thersetus's sister grobian's scholar if he love her once he admires her for all this he takes no notice of any such errors or imperfections of body or mind ipsa haec delectant veluti balbinum polypus agni he had rather have her than any woman in the world if he were a king she alone would be his queen his empress oh that he had but the wealth and treasure of both the indies to endow her with a carrack of diamonds a chain of pearl a cascanet of jewels a pair of calfskin gloves of fourpence a pair were fitter or some such toy to send her for a token she should have it with all his heart he would spend myriads of crowns for her sake venus herself panthea cleopatra tarquin's tanaquil 
Herod's Mariamne, or Mary of Burgundy, if she were alive, would not match her. Vincit vultus haec tindarios qui moerunt horrida bella. Let Paris himself be judge. Renowned Helen comes short, that Rhodophean Phyllis, Larisean Coronis, Babylonian Thisbe, Polyxena, Laura, Lesbia, etc. Your counterfeit ladies were never so fair as she is. Quisquid erit placidi, lepidi, grati, atque faceti, vivida cunctorum retines pandora deorum. What air is pretty, pleasant, facete, well, what air Pandora had, she doth excel. Dicebam trivioe formam nihil esse Dianae. Diana was not to be compared to her, nor Juno, nor Minerva, nor any goddess. Thetis's feet were as bright as silver, the ankles of Hebe clearer than crystal, the arms of Aurora as ruddy as the rose, Juno's breasts as white as snow, Minerva wise, Venus fair. But what of this? Dainty, come thou to me. She is all in all. Caelia ridens est Venus incedens Juno Minerva loquens. Fairest of fair, that fairness doth excel. Ephemerus in Aristinatus so far admireth his mistress's good parts, that he makes proclamation of them, and challengeth all comers in her behalf. Whoever saw the beauties of the east or of the west, let them come from all quarters, all, and tell truth, if ever they saw such an excellent feature as this is. A good fellow in Petronius cries out, No tongue can tell his lady's fine feature, or express it, quisquid dixeris minus erit, etc. No tongue can her perfections tell, in whose each part all tongues may dwell. Most of your lovers are of his humour and opinion. She is nulli secunda, a rare creature, a phoenix, the sole commandress of his thoughts, queen of his desires, his only delight. As Triton now feelingly sings, that lovesick sea-god, Candida lucothoe placet, et placet atra maline, sed Galatea placet longe magis omnibus una. Fair Leucothoe, black Melene, please me well, but Galatea doth by odds the rest excel. All the gracious elogies, metaphors, hyperbolical comparisons of the best things in the world, the most glorious names, whatsoever I say is pleasant amiable, sweet, grateful, and delicious, are too little for her. Febo pulcrior et sorore Phoebe. His Phoebe is so fair, she is so bright, she dims the sun's lustre and the moon's light. Stars, sun, moons, metals, sweet-smelling flowers, odors, perfumes, Colours, gold, silver, ivory, pearls, precious stones, snow, painted birds, doves, honey, sugar, spice, cannot express her, so soft, so tender, so radiant, sweet, so fair is she. Molior cuniculi capillo, etc. Lydia bella puelia candida, Quae bene superas lac et lilium, albamque simul rosam et rubicundam, et expolitum ebur indicum. Fine Lydia, my mistress, white and fair, the milk, the lily, do not thee come near, the rose so white, 
the rose so red to see and indian ivory comes short of thee such a description our english homer makes of a fair lady that emilia that was fairer to seen than is lily upon the stalk green and fresher than may with flowers new for with the rose colour strove her hue i not which was the fairer of the two in this very phrase polyphemus courts galatea candidior folio nivei galatea ligustri floridior prato longa procerior alno splendidior vitro tenero lascivior haedo etc molior et cygni plumis et lacte coacto whiter galet than the white withy wind fresher than a field higher than a tree brighter than glass more wanton than a kid softer than swan's down or aught that may be so she admires him again in that conceited dialogue of lucian which john secundus an elegant dutch modern poet hath translated into verse when doris and those other sea-nymphs upbraided her with her ugly misshapen lover polyphemus she replies they speak out of envy and malice et plane invidia huc mera vos stimulare videtur quod non vos itidem ut me polyphemus amet say what they could he was a proper man and as heloise writ to her sweetheart peter abelard si me augustus orbis imperator uxorem expeteret malem tua esse meretrix quam orbis imperatrix she had rather be his vassal his queen than the world's empress or queen non si me jupiter ipse forte velit she would not change her love for jupiter himself to thy thinking she is a most loathsome creature and as when a country fellow discommended once that exquisite picture of helen made by zeuxis for he saw no such beauty in it nicomachus a lovesick spectator replied sume tibi meos oculos et deam existimabis take mine eyes and thou wilt think she is a goddess dote on her forthwith count all her vices virtues her imperfections infirmities absolute and perfect if she be flat-nosed she is lovely if hook-nosed kingly if dwarfish and little pretty if tall proper and manlike our brave british bodicea if crooked wise if monstrous comely her defects are no defects at all she hath no deformities immo nec ipsum amicae stercus fetit though she be nasty fulsome as sostratus's bitch or parmeno's sow thou hadst as lief have a snake in thy bosom a toad in thy dish and callest her witch devil hag with all the filthy names thou canst invent he admires her on the other side she is his idol lady mistress venerila queen the quintessence of beauty an angel a star a goddess thou art my vesta thou my goddess art thy hallowed temple only is my heart the fragrancy of a thousand courtesans is in her face nec pulcrae effigies haec cypridis aut stratonices tis not venus's picture that nor the spanish infantas as you suppose good sir no princess or king's daughter no no but his divine mistress forsooth 
his dainty dulcinea his dear antiphila to whose service he is wholly consecrate whom he alone adores cui comparatus indecens erit pavo in amabilis sciurus et frequens phoenix to whom conferred a peacock's indecent a squirrel's harsh a phoenix too frequent all the graces veneries elegancies pleasures attend her he prefers her before a myriad of court ladies he that commends phyllis or neraea or amaryllis or galatea titurus or melibea by your leave let him be mute his love the praises have nay before all the gods and goddesses themselves so quintus catullus admired his squint-eyed friend roscius pace mihi liceat celestes dicere vestra mortalis visus pulcrior esse deo by your leave gentle gods this i'll say true there's none of you that have so fair a hue all the bombast epithets pathetical adjuncts incomparably fair curiously neat divine sweet dainty delicious etc pretty diminutives corculum suaviolum etc pleasant names may be invented bird mouse lamb puss pigeon pig's knee kid honey love dove chicken etc he puts on her meum mel mea suavitas meum cor meum suaviolum mei lepores my life my light my jewel my glory margareta speciosa cuius respectu omnia mundi pretiosa sordent my sweet margaret my sole delight and darling and as rodomant courted isabella by all kind words and gestures that he might he calls her his dear heart his soul beloved his joyful comfort and his sweet delight his mistress and his goddess and such names as loving knights apply to lovely dames every cloth she wears every fashion pleaseth him above measure her hand o quales digitos quos habet illa manus pretty foot pretty coronets her sweet carriage sweet voice tone o oh, that pretty tone her divine and lovely looks her everything lovely sweet amiable and pretty 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 her very name let it be what it will is a most pretty pleasing name i believe now there is some secret power and virtue in names every action sight habit gesture he admires whether she play sing or dance in what tires soever she goeth how excellent it was how well it became her never the like seen or heard mille habet ornatus mille decenter habet let her wear what she will do what she will say what she will quisquid enim dicit seu facit omne decet he applauds and admires everything she wears saith or doth ilam quisquid agit quoquo vestigia vertit composuit furtim subsequiturque decor seu solvit crines fusis decet esse capillis seu compsit comptis est reverenda comis what e'er she doth or whither e'er she go a sweet and pleasing grace attends forsooth or loose or bind her hair or comb it up she's to be honoured in what she doth vestem induetur formosa est exuitur 
tota forma est let her be dressed or undressed all is one she is excellent still beautiful fair and lovely to behold women do as much by men nay more far fonder weaker and that by many parasangs come to me my dear lucius saith musaeus in aristinatus come quickly sweetheart all other men are satyrs mere clowns blockheads to thee nobody to thee thy looks words gestures actions etc are incomparably beyond all others venus was never so much besotted on her adonis phaedra so delighted in hippolytus ariadne in theseus thisbe in her pyramus as she is enamoured on her mopsus be thou the marigold and i will be the sun be thou the friar and i will be the nun End of section 17section eighteen of the anatomy of melancholy volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by cynthia moyer the anatomy of melancholy volume three by robert burton section eighteen partition three section two member three part three i could repeat centuries of such now tell me what greater dotage or blindness can there be than this in both sexes and yet their slavery is more eminent a greater sign of their folly than the rest they are commonly slaves captives voluntary servants amator amicae mancipium as castilio terms him his mistress's servant her drudge prisoner bondman what not he composeth himself wholly to her affections to please her and as amelia said makes himself her lackey all his cares actions all his thoughts are subordinate to her will and commandment her most devote obsequious affectionate servant and vassal for love as cyrus in xenophon well observed is a mere tyranny worse than any disease and they that are troubled with it desire to be free and cannot but are harder bound than if they were in iron chains what greater captivity or slavery can there be as tully expostulates than to be in love is he a free man over whom a woman domineers to whom she prescribes laws commands forbids what she will herself that dares deny nothing she demands she asks he gives she calls he comes she threatens he fears nequissimum hunc servum puto i account this man a very drudge and as he follows it is this no small servitude for an enamorite to be every hour combing his head stiffening his beard perfuming his hair washing his face with sweet water painting curling and not to come abroad but sprucely crowned decked and apparelled yet these are but toys in respect to go to the barber baths theatres etc he must attend upon her wherever she goes 
run along the streets by her doors and windows to see her, take all opportunities, sleeveless errands, disguise, counterfeit shapes, and as many forms as Jupiter himself ever took, and come every day to her house, as he will surely do if he be truly enamoured, and offer her service, and follow her up and down from room to room, as Lucretia's suitors did. He cannot contain himself, but he will do it. He must and will be where she is, sit next her, still talking with her. If I did but let my glove fall by chance, as the said Aretine's Lucretia brags, I had one of my suitors, nay, two or three, at once ready to stoop and take it up and kiss it, and with a low congé deliver it unto me. If I would walk, another was ready to sustain me by the arm, a third to provide fruits, pears, plums, cherries, or whatsoever I would eat or drink. All this and much more he doth in her presence, and when he comes home, as Troilus to his Cressida, tis all his meditation to recount with himself his actions, words, gestures, what entertainment he had, how kindly she used him in such a place, how she smiled, how she graced him, and that infinitely pleased him. And then he breaks out, O oh, sweet Ariusa, O oh, my dearest Antiphila, O oh, most divine looks, O oh, lovely graces, and thereupon instantly he makes an epigram, or a sonnet to five or seven tunes, in her commendation. Or else he ruminates how she rejected his service, denied him a kiss, disgraced him, etc., and that as effectually torments him. And these are his exercises between comb and glass, madrigals, elegies, etc. These his cogitations, till he see her again. But all this is easy and gentle, and the least part of his labour and bondage. No hunter will take such pains for his game, fowler for his sport, or soldier to sack a city, as he will for his mistress's favour. Ipsa comes veniam, neque me salebrosa muebunt saxa, nec obliquo dente timendus aper. As Phaedra to Hippolytus, no danger shall affright, for if that be true the poets feign, love is the son of Mars and Venus, as he hath delights, pleasures, elegances from his mother, so hath he hardness, valour, and boldness from his father. And tis true that Bernard hath, Amore nihil molius nihil volentius, nothing so boisterous, nothing so tender as love. If once, therefore, enamoured, he will go, run, ride many a mile to meet her, day and night, in a very dark night, endure scorching heat, cold, wait in frost and snow, rain, tempest, till his teeth chatter in his head, those northern winds and showers cannot cool or quench his flame of love. In tempesta nocte non deteretor, he will, take my word, sustain hunger, thirst, penetrabit omnia perumpit omnia love will find out a way through thick and thin he will to her expeditissimi montes videntur omnes tranabiles he will swim through an ocean ride post over the alps apennines or pyrenean hills ignem marisque fluctus atque turbines venti paratus est transire though it rain daggers, 
with their points downward light or dark all is one roscida per tenebras faunus ad antravenit for her sweet sake he will undertake hercules's twelve labours endure hazard etc he feels it not what shall i say saith hydus of their great dangers they undergo single combats they undertake how they will venture their lives creep in at windows gutters climb over walls to come to their sweethearts anointing the doors and hinges with oil because they should not creak tread soft swim wade watch etc and if they be surprised leap out at windows cast themselves headlong down bruising or breaking their legs or arms and sometimes losing life itself as callisto did for his lovely melibaea hear some of their own confessions protestations complaints proffers expostulations wishes brutish attempts labours in this kind hercules served omphale put on an apron took a distaff and spun thraso the soldier was so submissive to thais that he was resolved to do whatever she enjoined ego me thaedi dedam et faciam quod jubet i am at her service philostratus in an epistle to his mistress i am ready to die sweetheart if it be thy will allay his thirst whom thy star hath scorched and undone the fountains and rivers deny no man drink that comes the fountain doth not say thou shalt not drink nor the apple thou shalt not eat nor the fair meadow walk not in me but thou alone wilt not let me come near thee or see thee contemned and despised i die for grief polyenus when his mistress circe did but frown upon him in petronius drew his sword and bade her kill stab or whip him to death he would strip himself naked and not resist another will take a journey to japan longae navigationis molestis non curans a third if she say it will not speak a word for a twelve months space her command shall be most inviolably kept a fourth will take hercules's club from him and with that centurion in the spanish celestina will kill ten men for his mistress ariusa for a word of her mouth he will cut bucklers in two like pippins and flap down men like flies elige quo mortis genere illum occidi cupis galeatus of mantua did a little more for when he was almost mad for love of a fair maid in the city she to try him belike what he would do for her sake bade him in jest leap into the river po if he loved her he forthwith did leap headlong off the bridge and was drowned another at ficinum in like passion when his mistress by chance thinking no harm i dare swear bade him go hang the next night at her doors hanged himself money saith xenophon is a very acceptable and welcome guest yet i had rather give it my dear clinia than take it of others i had rather serve him than command others i had rather be his drudge than take my ease undergo any danger for his sake than live in security for i had rather see clinia than all the world besides and had rather want the sight of all other things than him alone i am angry with the night and sleep that i may not see him 
and thank the light and sun because they show me my clinia i will run into the fire for his sake and if you did but see him i know that you likewise would run with me so philostratus to his mistress command me what you will i will do it bid me go to sea i am gone in an instant take so many stripes i am ready run through the fire and lay down my life and soul at thy feet tis done so did aeolus to juno tuus o regina quod optas explorare labor mihi iussa capescere fas est o queen it is thy pains to enjoin me still and i am bound to execute thy will and phaedra to hippolytus me well sororem hippolyte aut famulam voca famulamque potius omne servitium feram o call me sister call me servant choose or rather servant i am thine to use non me per altas ire si jubeas nives pigeat galatis ingredi pindi jugis, non si per ignes ire aut infesta agmina cuncter paratus ensibus pectus dare te tunc jubere me decet jussa execui it shall not grieve me to the snowy hills or frozen pindus's tops forthwith to climb or run through fire or through an army say but the word for i am always thine callicratides in lucian breaks out into this passionate speech o god of heaven grant me this life for ever to sit over against my mistress and to hear her sweet voice to go in and out with her to have every other business common with her i would labour when she labours sail when she sails he that hates her should hate me and if a tyrant kill her he should kill me if she should die i would not live and one grave should hold us both finiet illa meus moriens morientis amores abracomus in aristinatus makes the like petition for his delphia tecum vivere amem tecum obeam lubens i desire to live with thee and i am ready to die with thee tis the same strain which theagenes used to his caraclea so that i may but enjoy thy love let me die presently leander to his hero when he besought the sea waves to let him go quietly to his love and kill him coming back parcite dum propero mergite dum redeo spare me whilst i go drown me as i return tis the common humour of them all to contemn death to wish for death to confront death in this case quippe queis nec fera nec ignis neque praecipitium nec fretum nec ensis neque laqueus gravia videntur tis their desire saith tyrius to die haut timet mortem cupit ire in ipsos obvius enses he does not fear death he desireth such upon the very swords though a thousand dragons or devils keep the gates cerberus himself scyron and procrustes lay in wait and the way as dangerous as inaccessible as hell through fiery flames and over burning coulters he will adventure for all this and as peter abelard lost his testicles for his heloise he will i say 
not venture an incision but life itself for how many gallants offered to lose their lives for a night's lodging with cleopatra in those days and in the hour or moment of death tis their sole comfort to remember their dear mistress as zerbino slain in france and brandemart in barbary as archite did his emily when he felt death dusked been his eyes and faded is his breath but on his lady yet casteth he his eye his last word was mercy emily his spirit changed and out went there whither i cannot tell nay where when captain gobrius by an unlucky accident had received his death's wound heu me miserum exclamat miserable man that i am instead of other devotions he cries out shall i die before i see my sweetheart rodante sic amor mortem saith mine author aut quisquid humanitus acidit aspernatur so love triumphs contemns insults over death itself thirteen proper young men lost their lives for that fair hippodamias's sake the daughter of onomaus king of elis when that hard condition was proposed of death or victory they made no account of it but courageously for love died till pelops at last won her by a slight as many gallants desperately adventured their dearest blood for atalanta the daughter of scenius in hope of marriage all vanquished and overcame till hippomenes by a few golden apples happily obtained his suit perseus of old fought with a sea monster for andromeda's sake and our saint george freed the king's daughter of sabea the golden legend is mine author that was exposed to a dragon by a terrible combat our knights errant and the sir lancelots of these days i hope will adventure as much for ladies favours as the squire of dames knight of the sun sir bevis of southampton or that renowned peer orlando who long time had loved dear angelica the fair and for her sake about the world in nations far and near did high attempts perform and undertake he is a very dastard a coward a block and a beast that will not do as much but they will sure they will for it is an ordinary thing for these inamorotos of our time to say and do more to stab their arms carouse in blood or as that thessalian thero that bit off his own thumb provocans rivalem ad hoc aemulandum to make his co-rival do as much tis frequent with them to challenge the field for their lady and mistress's sake to run a tilt that either bears so furiously they meet the other down under the horse's feet and then up and to it again and with their axes both so sorely power that neither plate nor mail sustained the stour but rivelled reek like rotten wood asunder and fire did flash like lightning after thunder and in her quarrel to fight so long till their headpiece bucklers be all broken and swords hacked like so many saws for they must not see her abused in any sort tis blasphemy to speak against her a dishonour without all good respect to name her tis common with these creatures to drink healths upon their bare knees though it were a mile to the bottom 
no matter of what mixture off it comes if she bid them they will go barefoot to jerusalem to the great cham's court to the east indies to fetch her a bird to wear in her hat and with drake and candish sail round about the world for her sweet sake adversis ventis serve twice seven years as jacob did for rachel do as much as gesmunda the daughter of tancredus prince of salerna did for guisardus her true love eat his heart when he died or as artemisia drank her husband's bones beaten to powder and so bury him in herself and endure more torments than theseus or paris et his colitor venus magis quam ture et victimis with such sacrifices as these as aristinatus holds venus is well pleased generally they undertake any pain any labour any toil for their mistress's sake love and admire a servant not to her alone but to all her friends and followers they hug and embrace them for her sake her dog picture and everything she wears they adore it as a relic if any man come from her they feast him reward him will not be out of his company do him all offices still remembering still talking of her nam si abest quod ames praesto simulacra tamun sunt ilius et nomen dulce observatur ad aures the very carrier that comes from him to her is a most welcome guest and if he bring a letter she will read it twenty times over and as lucretia did by Euryalus, kiss the letter a thousand times together and then read it and Caledonia by philonius after many sweet kisses put the letter in her bosom and kiss again and often look thereon and stay the messenger that would be gone and asked many pretty questions over and over again as how he looked what he did and what he said in a word vult placere sese amicae vult mihi vult pedisequae vult famulis vult etiam anchilis et catulo meo he strives to please his mistress and her maid her servants and her dog and's well apaid if he get any remnant of hers a busk point a feather of her fan a shoe tie a lace a ring a bracelet of hair pignusque direptum lacertis aut digito male pertinaci he wears it for a favour on his arm in his hat finger or next his heart her picture he adores twice a day and for two hours together will not look off it as laodamia did by protesilaus when he went to war sit at home with his picture before her a garter or a bracelet of hers is more precious than any saint's relic he lays it up in his casket o oh, blessed relic and every day will kiss it if in her presence his eye is never off her and drink he will where she drank if it be possible in that very place etc if absent he will walk in the walk sit under that tree where she did use to sit in that bower in that very seat et foribus miseroscula figit many years after sometimes though she be far distant and dwell many miles off he loves yet to walk that way still to have his chamber window look that way to walk by that river's side which 
though far away, runs by the house where she dwells. He loves the wind blows to that coast. O quoties dixi zephyris properantibus illuc, felices pulcram visuri amirilada venti. O happy western winds that blow that way, for you shall see my love's fair face to-day. He will send a message to her by the wind. Vos aurae alpinae placidis de montibus aurae haec illi portate. He desires to confer with some of her acquaintance, for his heart is still with her, to talk of her, admiring and commending her, lamenting, moaning, wishing himself anything for her sake, to have opportunity to see her. Oh, that he might but enjoy her presence! So did Philostratus to his mistress, O oh, happy ground on which she treads, and happy were I if she would tread upon me. I think her countenance would make the rivers stand, and when she comes abroad birds will sing and come about her. Redebunt vales, redebunt obvia tempe, in florem viridis protinus ibi humus. The fields will laugh, the pleasant valleys burn, and all the grass will into flowers turn. Omnis ambrosiam spirabit aura. When she is in the meadow, she is fairer than any flower, for that lasts but for a day. The river is pleasing, but it vanisheth on a sudden. But thy flower doth not fade, thy stream is greater than the sea. If I look upon the heaven, methinks I see the sun fallen down to shine below, and thee to shine in his place whom I desire. If I look upon the night, methinks I see two more glorious stars, Hesperus and thyself. A little after he thus courts his mistress, If thou goest forth of the city, the protecting gods that keep the town will run after to gaze upon thee. If thou sail upon the seas, as so many small boats, they will follow thee. What river would not run into the sea? Another, he sighs and sobs, swears he hath cor scissum, a heart bruised to powder, dissolved and melted within him, or quite gone from him to his mistress's bosom belike he is in an oven a salamander in the fire so scorched with love's heat he wisheth himself a saddle for her to sit on a posy for her to smell to and it would not grieve him to be hanged if he might be strangled in her garters he would willingly die to-morrow so that she might kill him with her own hands. Ovid would be a flea, a gnat, a ring, Catullus a sparrow. O si tecum ludere sicut ipsa possem et tristes animi levari curas. Anacreon, a glass, a gown, a chain, anything. Sed speculum ego ipse fiam, ut me tuum usque cernas, et vestis ipse fiam, ut me tuum usque gestes. Mutare et opto in undam, lauem tuos ut artus nardus puella fiam, ut ego te ipsum in ungam, sim fascia in papilis, tuo et monile colo. Fiamque calceos me saltem ut pede usque calces but I a looking-glass would be, still to be looked upon by thee, or I, my love, would be thy gown, by thee to be worn up and down, or a pure well full to the brims, that I might wash thy purer limbs, 
or I'd be precious balm to noint with choicest care each choicest joint. Or if I might, I would be fain about thy neck thy happy chain, or would it were my blessed hap to be the lawn or thy fair pap, or would I were thy shoe to be daily trod upon by thee. O oh, thrice happy man that shall enjoy her, as they that saw Hero in Museus, and Salmachis to Hermaphroditus. Felices mater, etc., Felix nutrix, sed longe cunctis, longe que beatior ille, quem fructu sponsi et socii dignabere lecti. The same passion made her break out in the comedy. Nae illae fortunatae, sunt quae cum illo cubant. Happy are his bedfellows. And, as she said of Cyprus, Beata quae illi uxor futura eset. Blessed is that woman that shall be his wife. Nay, thrice happy she that shall enjoy him but a night. Una nox jovis sceptro aequiparanda. Such a night's lodging is worth Jupiter's scepter. Qualis nox erit illa, dii deaeque, quam molis torus. Oh, what a blissful night would it be, how soft, how sweet a bed! She will adventure all her estate for such a night, for a nectarian, a balsam kiss alone. Qui te vidit beatus est, beatior qui te audiet, qui te potitur est Deus. The sultan of Sana's wife in Arabia, when she had seen Vertomanus, that comely traveller, lamented to herself in this manner. O oh God, thou hast made this man whiter than the sun, but me, mine husband, and all my children black. I would to God he were my husband, or that I had such a son. She fell a-weeping, and so impatient for love at last, that, as Potiphar's wife did by Joseph. She would have had him gone in with her. She sent away Gazella, Tegea, Galzerana, her waiting-maids, loaded him with fair promises and gifts, and wooed him with all the rhetoric she could. Extremum hoc miserae da munus amanti. Grant this last request to a wretched lover but when he gave not consent, she would have gone with him, and left all, to be his page, his servant, or his lackey. Certa sequicarum corpus ut umbra solet, so that she might enjoy him, threatening, moreover, to kill herself, etc. Men will do as much and more for women, spend goods, lands, lives, fortunes. Kings will leave their crowns, as King John for Matilda the nun at Dunmo. But kings in this yet privileged may be, I'll be a monk so I may live with thee. The very gods will endure any shame. Atque aliquis de diis non tristibus inquit, etc., be a spectacle, as Mars and Venus were, to all the rest. So did Lucian's Mercury wish, and peradventure, so dost thou. They will adventure their lives with alacrity, pro qua non metuam mori, nay, more, pro qua non metuam bis mori. I will die twice, nay, twenty times for her. If she die, there's no remedy. They must die with her. They cannot help it. A lover in Calcagninus wrote this on his darling's tomb. Quincia obiit, sed non quincia sola obiit. Quincia obiit, 
sed cum quincia et ipse obii risus obit obit gratia lusus obit nec mea nunc anima in pectore at in tumulo est quincia my dear is dead but not alone for i am dead and with her i am gone sweet smiles mirth graces all with her do rest and my soul too for tis not in my breast how many doting lovers upon the like occasion might say the same but these are toys in respect they will hazard their very souls for their mistress's sake atque aliquis interiuenis miratus est et verbum dixit non ego in caelo cuperem deus esse nostram uxorem habens domi hero one said to heaven would i not desire at all to go if that at mine own house i had such a fine wife as hero venus forsook heaven for adonis's sake caelo praefertur adonis old janivere in chaucer thought when he had his fair may he should never go to heaven he should live so merrily here on earth had i such a mistress he protests caelum diis ego non suum in viderem sed sortem mihi dii meam in viderent i would not envy their prosperity the gods should envy my felicity another as earnestly desires to behold his sweetheart he will adventure and leave all this and more than this to see her alone omnia quae patior mala si pensare velit force una aliqua nobis prosperitate dii hoc precor ut faciant faciant me cernere coram cor mihi captivum quae tenet hoce deam if all my mischiefs were recompensed and god would give me what i requested i would my mistress's presence only seek which doth mine heart in prison captive keep but who can reckon upon the dotage madness servitude and blindness the foolish phantasms and vanities of lovers their torments wishes idle attempts yet for all this amongst so many irksome absurd troublesome symptoms inconveniences fantastical fits and passions which are usually incident to such persons there be some good and graceful qualities in lovers which this affection causeth as it makes wise men fools so many times it makes fools become wise it makes base fellows become generous cowards courageous as cardan notes out of plutarch covetous liberal and magnificent clowns civil cruel gentle wicked profane persons to become religious slovens neat churls merciful and dumb dogs eloquent your lazy drones quick and nimble feras mentes domat cupido that fierce cruel and rude cyclops polyphemus sighed and shed many a salt tear for galatea's sake no passion causeth greater alterations or more vehement of joy or discontent plutarch symposion book five question one saith that the soul of a man in love is full of perfumes and sweet odours and all manner of pleasing tones and tunes insomuch that it is hard to say as he adds whether love do mortal men more harm than good it adds spirits and makes them 
otherwise soft and silly, generous and courageous. Audacem faciebat amor. Ariadne's love made Theseus so adventurous, and Medea's beauty Jason so victorious. Expectorat amor timorem. Plato is of opinion that the love of Venus made Mars so valorous. A young man will be much abashed to commit any foul offence that shall come to the hearing or sight of his mistress. As he that desired of his enemy, now dying, to lay him with his face upward, ne amasius videret eum a tergo vulneratum, lest his sweetheart should say he was a coward. And if it were possible to have an army consist of lovers, such as love or are beloved, they would be extraordinary valiant and wise in their government. Modesty would detain them from doing amiss, emulation incite them to do that which is good and honest, and a few of them would overcome a great company of others. There is no man so pusillanimous, so very a dastard, whom love would not incense, make of a divine temper and an heroical spirit. As he said in like case, tota ruat caeli moles non tereor, etc. Nothing can terrify, nothing can dismay them. But as Sir Blandimor and Paradel, those two brave fairy knights, fought for the love of fair Florimel in presence. And drawing both their swords with rage anew, like two mad mastiffs each other slew, and shields did share, and mails did rash, and helms did hew, so furiously each other did assail, as if their souls at once they would have rent out of their breasts, that streams of blood did trail adown as if their springs of life were spent, that all the ground with purple blood was sprent, and all their armour stained with bloody gore, yet scarcely once to breath would they relent. So mortal was their malice, and so sore, that both resolved than yield to die before. Every base swain in love will dare to do as much for his dear mistress's sake. He will fight and fetch Argivum Clipeum, that famous buckler of Argos, to do her service, adventure at all, undertake any enterprise. And as Serranus the Spaniard, then governor of Slois, made answer to Marquis Spinola, if the enemy brought fifty thousand devils against him, he would keep it. The nine worthies, Oliver and Roland, and forty dozen of peers are all in him. He is all metal, armor of proof, more than a man, and in this case improved beyond himself. For as Agatho contends, a true lover is wise, just, temperate, and valiant. I doubt not, therefore, but if a man had such an army of lovers, as Castilio supposeth, he might soon conquer all the world, except by chance he met with such another army of enamoratos to oppose it. For so perhaps they might fight as that fatal dog and fatal hare in the heavens, course one another round, and never make an end. Castilio thinks Ferdinand, king of Spain, would never have conquered Granada had not Queen Isabel and her ladies been present at the siege. It cannot be expressed what courage the Spanish knights took when the ladies were present. A few Spaniards overcame a multitude of Moors. 
they will undergo any danger whatsoever, as Sir Walter Manny in Edward the Third's time, stuck full of ladies' favours, fought like a dragon. For, soli amantes, as Plato holds, pro amicis mori appetunt, only lovers will die for their friends and in their mistress's quarrel and for that cause he would have women follow the camp to be spectators and encouragers of noble actions upon such an occasion the squire of dames himself sir lancelot or sir tristram caesar or alexander shall not be more resolute or go beyond them. End of section 18。section 19 of the Anatomy of Melancholy, volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Moyer. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3, by Robert Burton. Section 19. Partition 3. Section 2. Member 3. Part 4. Not Courage only doth love add, but, as I said, subtlety, wit, and many pretty devices. Namque dolos inspirat amor, fraudesque ministrat. Jupiter in love with Leda, and not knowing how to compass his desire, turned himself into a swan, and got Venus to pursue him in the likeness of an eagle, which she doing, for shelter he fled to Leda's lap. Et in eus gremio se collocavit. Leda embraced him, and so fell fast asleep. Sed dormientem Jupiter compressit, by which means Jupiter had his will. Infinite such tricks love can devise, such fine feats in abundance, with wisdom and wariness quis fallare posit amantem. All manner of civility, decency, compliment, and good behavior, plus solis et leporis, polite graces and merry conceits. Boccaccio hath a pleasant tale to this purpose, which he borrowed from the Greeks, and which Beroaldus hath turned into Latin, Bebelius in verse, of Cimon and Iphigenia. This Cimon was a fool, a proper man of person, and the governor of Cyprus's son, but a very ass, insomuch that his father, being ashamed of him, sent him to a farmhouse he had in the country to be brought up, where, by chance, as his manner was, walking alone, he espied a gallant young gentlewoman named Iphigenia, a burgomaster's daughter of Cyprus, with her maid, by a brookside in a little thicket, fast asleep in her smock, where she had newly bathed herself. When Cimon saw her, he stood leaning on his staff, gaping on her, immovable and in amaze. At last he fell so far in love with the glorious object, that he began to rouse himself up, to bethink what he was, would needs follow her to the city, and for her sake began to be civil, to learn to sing and dance, to play upon instruments, and got all those gentlemanlike qualities and compliments in a short space, which his friends were most glad of. In brief, he became, from an idiot and a clown, to be one of the most complete gentlemen in Cyprus, did many valorous exploits, and all for the love of Mistress Iphigenia. In a word, I may say thus much of them all, 
let them be never so clownish rude and horrid grobians and sluts if once they be in love they will be most neat and spruce for omnibus rebus et nitidis nitoribus antevenit amor they will follow the fashion begin to trick up and to have a good opinion of themselves venus tatim enem mater venus a ship is not so long a rigging as a young gentlewoman a trimming up herself against her sweetheart comes a painter's shop a flowery meadow no so gracious aspect in nature's storehouse as a young maid nubilis puella a novitza or venetian bride that looks for a husband or a young man that is her suitor composed looks composed gait clothes gestures actions all composed all the graces elegances in the world are in her face their best robes ribbons chains jewels lawns linens laces spangles must come on praeter quam res patitur student elegantiae they are beyond all measure coy nice and too curious on a sudden tis all their study all their business how to wear their clothes neat to be polite and terse and to set out themselves no sooner doth a young man see his sweetheart coming but he smugs up himself pulls up his cloak now fallen about his shoulders ties his garters points sets his band cuffs slicks his hair twires his beard etc when mercury was to come before his mistress clamidemque ut pendeat apte collocat ut limbus totumque appareat aurum he put his cloak in order that the lace and hem and gold work all might have his grace salmachis would not be seen of hermaphroditus till she had spruced up herself first nec tamen ante adiit et si properabat adire quam se composuit quam circumspexit amictus et finxit vultum et meruit formosa videri nor did she come although twas her desire till she composed herself and trimmed her tire and set her looks to make him to admire venus had so ordered the matter that when her son aeneas was to appear before queen dido he was os humerosque deo similis namque ipsa decorum caeseriem nato genetrix lumenque juentae purpureum et laetos oculis afflarat honores like a god for she was the tire-woman herself to set him out with all natural and artificial impostures as mother mamea did her son heliogabalus new chosen emperor when he was to be seen of the people first when the hirsute cyclopial polyphemus courted galatea yamque tibi formae yamque est tibi curae placendi yam rigidos pectis rastris polypheme capillos yam libet hirsutam tibi falce recidere barbam et spectare feros in aqua et componere vultus and then he did begin to prank himself to plait and comb his head and beard to shave and look his face i the water as a glass and to compose himself for to be brave he was upon a sudden now spruce and keen as a new ground hatchet he now began to have a good opinion of his own features and good parts now to be a gallant yam galatea veni nec munere despice nostra certe ego minoi liquidaque in imagine vidi nuper aquae placuitque mihimea forma videnti 
come now my galatea scorn me not nor my poor presence for but yesterday i saw myself in the water and methought full fair i was then scorn me not i say non sum adeo informis nu per me in litore vidi cum placidum ventis staret mare tis the common humour of all suitors to trick up themselves to be prodigal in apparel pure lotus neat combed and curled with powdered hair comptus et calimistratus with a long love-lock a flower in his ear perfumed gloves rings scarves feathers points etc as if he were a prince's ganymede with every day new suits as the fashion varies going as if he trod upon eggs as heinsius writ to primieros if once he be besotten on a wench he must like awake at nights renounce his book sigh and lament now and then weep for his hard hap and mark above all things what hats bands doublets breeches are in fashion how to cut his beard and wear his locks to turn up his mustachios and curl his head prune his pic de vin or if he wear it abroad that the east side be correspondent to the west he may be scoffed at otherwise as julian that apostate emperor was for wearing a long hirsute goatish beard fit to make ropes with as in his misopogone or that apologetical oration he made at antioch to excuse himself he doth ironically confess it hindered his kissing nam non liquit inde pura puris eoque suavioribus labra labris adjungere but he did not much esteem it as it seems by the sequel de accipiendis dandisue osculis non laboro yet to follow mine author it may much concern a young lover he must be more respectful in this behalf he must be in league with an excellent tailor barber tonsorem pucrum sed arte talem qualis nec talamis fuit neronis have neat shoe ties points garters speak in print walk in print eat and drink in print and that which is all in all he must be mad in print amongst other good qualities an amorous fellow is endowed with he must learn to sing and dance play upon some instrument or other as without all doubt he will if he be truly touched with this lodestone of love for as erasmus hath it musicam docet amor et poesia love will make them musicians and to compose ditties madrigals elegies love sonnets and sing them to several pretty tunes to get all good qualities may be had jupiter perceived mercury to be in love with philologia because he learned languages polite speech for suadela herself was venus's daughter as some write arts and sciences quo virgini placeret all to ingratiate himself and please his mistress tis their chiefest study to sing dance and without question so many gentlemen and gentlewomen would not be so well qualified in this kind if love did not incite them who saith castilio would learn to play or give his mind to music learn to dance or make so many rhymes love songs as most do but for women's sake because they hope by that means to purchase their good wills and win their favour we see this 
daily verified in our young women and wives they that being maids took so much pains to sing play and dance with such cost and charge to their parents to get those graceful qualities now being married will scarce touch an instrument they care not for it constantine makes cupid himself to be a great dancer by the same token as he was capering amongst the gods he flung down a bowl of nectar which distilling upon the white rose ever since made it red and callistratus by the help of daedalus about cupid's statue made a many of young wenches still a-dancing to signify belike that cupid was much affected with it as without all doubt he was for at his and psyche's wedding the gods being present to grace the feast ganymede filled nectar in abundance as apuleius describes it vulcan was the cook the hours made all fine with roses and flowers apollo played upon the harp the muses sang to it sed suavi musicae super ingressa venus saltavit but his mother venus danced to his and their sweet content witty lucian in that pathetical love passage or pleasant description of jupiter's stealing of europa and swimming from phoenicia to crete makes the sea calm the winds hush neptune and amphitrite riding in their chariot to break the waves before them the tritons dancing round about with every one a torch the sea nymphs half naked keeping time on dolphins backs and singing hymenaeus cupid nimbly tripping on the top of the waters and venus herself coming after in a shell strewing roses and flowers on their heads praxiteles in all his pictures of love feigns cupid ever smiling and looking upon dancers and in st mark's in rome whose work i know not one of the most delicious pieces is a many of satyrs dancing about a wench asleep so that dancing still is as it were a necessary appendix to love matters young lasses are never better pleased than when as upon a holiday after evensong they may meet their sweethearts and dance about a maypole or in a town green under a shady elm nothing so familiar in france as for citizens wives and maids to dance around in the streets and often too for want of better instruments to make good music of their own voices and dance after it yea many times this love will make old men and women that have more toes than teeth dance john come kiss me now mask and mum for comus and hymen love masks and all such merriments above measure will allow men to put on women's apparel in some cases and promiscuously to dance young and old rich and poor generous and base of all sorts paulus jovius taxeth augustine nephus the philosopher for that being an old man and a public professor a father of many children he was so mad for the love of a young maid that which many of his friends were ashamed to see an old gouty fellow yet would dance after fiddlers many laughed him to scorn for it but this omnipotent love would have it so hiacintino bacillo properans amor me adegit violenter ad sequendum love hasty with his purple staff did make me follow and the dance to undertake and tis no news this no indecorum for why a good reason may be given of it 
Cupid and Death met both in an inn, and, being merrily disposed, they did exchange some arrows from either quiver. Ever since, young men die, and oftentimes old men dote. Sic moritur juvenis, sic moribundus amat. And who can then withstand it? If once we be in love, young or old, though our teeth shake in our heads like virginal jacks, or stand parallel asunder like the arches of a bridge, there is no remedy. We must dance trench more for a need over tables, chairs, and stools, etc., and prinkum prankum is a fine dance. Plutarch, Symposium, Book One, Question Five, doth in some sort excuse it, and telleth us, moreover, in what sense, musicam docet amor, licet prius fuerit rudis. How love makes them that had no skill before learn to sing and dance. He concludes, tis only that power and prerogative love hath over us. Love, as he holds, will make a silent man speak, a modest man most officious, dull, quick, slow, nimble, and that which is most to be admired, a hard, base, untractable churl, as fire doth iron in a smith's forge, free, facile, gentle, and easy to be entreated. Nay, twill make him prodigal in the other extreme, and give a hundred sesterces for a knight's lodging, as they did of old to Lais of Corinth, or ducenta drachmarum milia pro unica nocte, as mundus to Paulina, spend all his fortunes, as too many do in like case, to obtain his suit. For which cause many compare love to wine, which makes men jovial and merry, frolic and sad, whine, sing, dance, and what not. But above all the other symptoms of lovers, this is not lightly to be overpassed, that likely of what condition soever, if once they be in love, they turn to their ability, rhymers, ballad-makers, and poets. For as Plutarch saith, they will be witnesses and trumpeters of their paramours' good parts, bedecking them with verses and commendatory songs, as we do statues with gold, that they may be remembered and admired of all. Ancient men will dote in this kind sometimes as well as the rest. The heat of love will thaw their frozen affections, dissolve the ice of age, and so far enable them, though they be sixty years of age above the girdle, to be scarce thirty beneath. Joeanus Pontanus makes an old fool rhyme, and turn poetaster to please his mistress. Ne ringas Mariana, meos me dispice canos, de sene nam juvenem dia refere potes, etc. Sweet Marian, do not mine age disdain, for thou canst make an old man young again. They will be still singing amorous songs and ditties, if young especially, and cannot abstain, though it be when they go to, or should be at, church. We have a pretty story to this purpose in West Monasteriensis, an old writer of ours, if you will believe it, Anno Dominis, 1012, at Colowitz in Saxony, on Christmas Eve, a company of young men and maids, whilst the priest was at mass in the church, were singing catches and love-songs in the churchyard. He sent to them to make less noise, but they sung on still, and, if you will, you shall have the very song itself. Equitabat 
homo per silvam frondosam ducebatque secum mesvindem formosam quid stamus cur non imus a fellow rid by the greenwood side and fair mesvinde was his bride why stand we so and do not go this they sung he chafed till at length impatient as he was he prayed to saint magnus patron of the church they might all three sing and dance till that time twelve month and so they did without meat and drink wearisomeness or giving over till at year's end they ceased singing and were absolved by herbertus archbishop of cologne they will in all places be doing thus young folks especially reading love stories talking of this or that young man such a fair maid singing telling or hearing lascivious tales scurrilous tunes such objects are their sole delight their continual meditation and as guastavinius adds ob seminis abundantiam crebrae cogitationes veneris frequens recordatio et pruriens voluptas etc an earnest longing comes hence pruriens corpus pruriens anima amorous conceits tickling thoughts sweet and pleasant hopes hence it is they can think discourse willingly or speak almost of no other subject tis their only desire if it may be done by art to see their husband's picture in a glass they'll give anything to know when they shall be married how many husbands they shall have by chromniomantia a kind of divination with onions laid on the altar on christmas eve or by fasting on saint anne's eve or night to know who shall be their first husband or by amphitomantia by beans in a cake etc to burn the same this love is the cause of all good conceits neatness exornations plays elegancies delights pleasant expressions sweet motions and gestures joys comforts exultancies and all the sweetness of our life qualis jam vita foret aut quid jucunde sina aurea venere emoria cum ista non amplius mihi cura fuerit let me live no longer than i may love saith a mad merry fellow in mimnermus this love is that salt that seasoneth our harsh and dull labours and gives a pleasant relish to our other unsavoury proceedings absit amor surgunt tenebrae torpedo veternum pestis etc all our feasts almost masks mummings banquets merry meetings weddings pleasing songs fine tunes poems love stories plays comedies atellans jigs fescanines elegies odes etc proceed hence danaus the son of belus at his daughter's wedding at argos instituted the first plays some say that were ever heard of symbols emblems impresses devices if we shall believe jovius cutiles paradine camillus de camillis may be ascribed to it most of our arts and sciences painting amongst the rest was first invented saith patritius ex amoris beneficio for love's sake for when the daughter of de boreades the scionian was to take leave of her sweetheart now going to wars ut desiderio eius minus tabesceret to comfort herself in his absence she took his picture with coal upon a wall as the candle gave the shadow which her father admiring perfected afterwards 
and it was the first picture by report that ever was made and long after scion for painting carving statuary music and philosophy was preferred before all the cities in greece apollo was the first inventor of physic divination oracles minerva found out weaving vulcan curious ironwork mercury letters but who prompted all this into their heads love nunquam talia invenescent nisi talia adamasent they loved such things or some party for whose sake they were undertaken at first tis true vulcan made a most admirable brooch or necklace which long after axion and temenus figius's sons for the singular worth of it consecrated to apollo at delphos but pharilus the tyrant stole it away and presented it to ariston's wife on whom he miserably doted parthenius tells the story out of philarchus but why did vulcan make this excellent ausch to give hermione cadmus's wife whom he dearly loved all our tilts and tournaments orders of the garter golden fleece etc nobilitas sub amore jacet o oh, their beginnings to love and many of our histories by this means saith jovius they would express their loving minds to their mistress and to the beholders tis the sole subject almost of poetry all our invention tends to it all our songs whatever those old anacreons and therefore hesiod makes the muses and graces still follow cupid and as plutarch holds menander and the rest of the poets were love's priests all our greek and latin epigrammatists love writers antony diogenes the most ancient whose epitome we find in phocius bibliotheca longus sophista eustathius achilles tatius aristinetus heliodorus plato plutarch lucian parthenius theodorus prodromus ovid catullus tibullus etc our new ariostos boyards authors of arcadia urania fairy queen etc marullus leotichius angerianus strosa secundus capellanus etc with the rest of those facete modern poets have written in this kind are but as so many symptoms of love their whole books are a synopsis or breviary of love the portuous of love legends of lovers lives and deaths and of their memorable adventures nay more quod leguntur quod laudantur amori debent as nevisanus the lawyer holds there never was any excellent poet that invented good fables or made laudable verses which was not in love himself had he not taken a quill from cupid's wings he could never have written so amorously as he did cynthia te watem fecit lascive properti ingenium galli pulcra lucoris habet fama est arguti nemesis formosa tibuli lesbia dictavit docte catula tibi non me peligus nec spernet mantua vatem si qua corina mihi si quis alexis erit wanton propertius and witty callus subtle tibullus and learned catullus it was cynthia lesbia lycoris that made you poets all and if alexis or corinna chance my paramour to be virgil and ovid shall not despise me non me carminibus vincet nec traceos orpheus 
nec linus petrarch's laura made him so famous astrophel's stella and jovianus pontanus's mistress was the cause of his roses violets lilies nequitiae blanditiae jochi decor nardus ver corolla thus mars pallas venus caris crocum laurus unguentem costum lacrimae mira musae etc and the rest of his poems why are italians at this day generally so good poets and painters because every man of any fashion amongst them hath his mistress the very rustics and hog rubbers manalcus and corridon qui faitant de stercore equino those fulsome knaves if once they taste of this love liquor are inspired in an instant instead of those accurate emblems curious impresses gaudy masks tilts tournaments etc they have their wakes whitsunales shepherds feasts meetings on holidays country dances roundelays writing their names on trees true lovers knots pretty gifts with tokens hearts divided and half rings shepherds in their loves are as coy as kings choosing lords ladies kings queens and valentines etc they go by couples corridon's phyllis nisa and mopsis with dainty ducibel and sir tophus instead of odes epigrams and elegies etc they have their ballads country tunes oh the broom the bonny bonny broom ditties and songs bess a bell she doth excel they must write likewise and indite all in rhyme thou honeysuckle of the hawthorn hedge vouchsafe in cupid's cup my heart to pledge my heart's dear blood sweet sis is thy carouse worth all the ale in gammer gubbin's house i say no more affairs call me away my father's horse for provender doth stay be thou the lady cresset light to me sir trolly lolly will i prove to thee written in haste farewell my cowslip sweet pray let's a sunday at the alehouse meet your most grim stoics and severe philosophers will melt away with this passion and if athenaeus belie them not aristippus apollodorus antiphanes etc have made love songs and commentaries of their mistress's praises orators write epistles princes give titles honours what not xerxes gave to themistocles lampsacus to find him wine magnesia for bread and meunte for the rest of his diet the persian kings allotted whole cities to like use haec civitas mulieri redimiculum praebeat haec incolum haec incrines one whole city served to dress her hair another her neck a third her hood ahasuerus would have given esther half his empire and herod bid herodias ask what she would she should have it caligula gave a hundred thousand sesterces to his courtesan at first word to buy her pins and yet when he was solicited by the senate to bestow something to repair the decayed walls of rome for the commonwealth's good he would give but six thousand sesterces at most dionysius that sicilian tyrant rejected all his privy councillors and was so besotted on myra his favourite and mistress that he would bestow no office or in the most weightiest business of the kingdom do aught without her especial advice prefer depose send 
entertain no man, though worthy and well-deserving, but by her consent. And he again whom she commended, howsoever unfit, unworthy, was as highly approved. Kings and emperors, instead of poems, build cities. Adrian built Antinoa in Egypt, besides constellations, temples, altars, statues, images, etc., in the honour of his Antinous. Alexander bestowed infinite sums to set out his Hephaestion to all eternity. Socrates professeth himself love's servant, ignorant in all arts and sciences, a doctor alone in love matters. Et cum alienarum rerum omnium scientiam defeteretur, saith Maximus Tyrius, his sectator huius negotii professor, etc. And this he spake openly, at home and abroad, at public feasts, in the academy, in Pireo, Lyceo, sub Platano, etc. The very bloodhound of beauty, as he is styled by others. But I conclude there is no end of love's symptoms, tis a bottomless pit. Love is subject to no dimensions, not to be surveyed by any art or engine. And besides, I am of Hydus's mind, no man can discourse of love matters or judge of them aright that hath not made trial in his own person, or, as Aeneas Silvius adds, hath not a little doted, been mad, or lovesick himself. I confess I am but a novice, a contemplator only. Nescio quid sit amor nec amo. I have a tincture, for why should I lie, dissemble, or excuse it, yet homo sum, etc., not altogether inexpert in this subject, non sum praeceptor amandi, and what I say is merely reading, ex altorum forsan ineptiis, by mine own observation, and others' relation. End of section 19section twenty of the anatomy of melancholy volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by morgan scorpion the anatomy of melancholy volume three by robert burton section twenty partition three section two member four prognostics of love melancholy what fires torments cares jealousies suspicions fears griefs anxieties accompany such as are in love i have sufficiently said the next question is what will be the event of such miseries what they foretell some are of opinion that this love cannot be cured Nullis amor est medicabilis herbis. It accompanies them to the last. Idem amor exitio est pecori, pecorisque magistro. The same passion consume both the sheep and the shepherd. And is so continuate, that by no persuasion almost it may be relieved. Bid me not love, said Euryalus. Bid the mountains come down into the plains. Bid the rivers run back to their fountains. I can as soon leave to love as the sun leave his course. Et prius equoribus pisces, et montibus umbrae, ad volucres deerunt silvis, et mumora ventis, quam mihi discedent formosae amarillidis ignes. First seas shall want their fish, the mountains shade, woods singing birds, the winds murmur shall fade, 
than my fair Amaryllis's love allayed. Bid me not love, bid a deaf man hear, a blind man see, a dumb speak, lame run, counsel can do no good, a sick man cannot relish, no physic can ease me. Non prosent domino quae prosent omnibus artes, as Apollo confessed, and Jupiter himself could not be cured. Omnis humanus curat medicina dolores, solus amor morbi non habet artificem. Physic can soon cure every disease, excepting love that can it not appease. But whether love may be cured or no, and by what means, shall be explained in his place. In the meantime, if it take his course and be not otherwise eased or amended, it breaks out into outrageous often and prodigious events. Amor et liber violenti dii sunt, as Tatius observes, et eosque animum incendunt, ut pudoris oblivisci cognant. Love and Bacchus are so violent gods, so furiously rage in our minds, that they make us forget all honesty, shame, and common civility. For such men ordinarily, as are thoroughly possessed with this humour, become insensati et insani. For it is amor insanus, as the poet calls it, beside themselves. And as I have proved, no better than beasts, irrational, stupid, headstrong, void of fear of God or men, they frequently forswear themselves, spend, steal, commit incests, rapes, adulteries, murders, depopulate towns, cities, countries, to satisfy their lust. A devil tis, and mischief such doth work, as never yet did pagan, Jew, or Turk. The wars of Troy may be a sufficient witness, and as Appian saith of Antony and Cleopatra, their love brought themselves and all Egypt into extreme and miserable calamity. The end of her is as bitter as wormwood, and as sharp as a two-edged sword, Proverbs verses 4-5. Her feet go down to death, her steps lead on to hell. She is more bitter than death, Ecclesiastes 7-28. And the sinner shall be taken by her. Qui in emore precipitavit, pages perit, quam qui saxos salit. He that runs headlong from the top of a rock, is not in so bad a case as he that falls into this gulf of love. For hence, saith Platina, comes repentance, dotage. They lose themselves, their wits, and make shipwreck of their fortunes altogether. Madness, to make away themselves and others. Violent death. Prognosticatio est talis, saith Gordonius. Sinon succuratur is. Aut in maniam cadunt, aut moriuntur. The prognostication is, they will either run mad or die. For if this passion continue, saith alien Montaltus, it makes the blood hot, thick, and black. And if the inflammation get into the brain, with continual meditation and waking, it so dries up, that madness follows, or else they make away themselves. O Corridon, Corridon, quete dementia crepit? Now, as Arnoldus adds, it will speedily work these effects, if it be not presently helped they will pine away, run mad, and die upon a sudden. Facile incidunt in manium, saith Valescus, quickly mad, nisi succurato, if good order be not taken. Ehu triste jugum quisquis amoris habet, is prius se noet se pertisse perit. O heavy yoke of love, which whoso bears is quite undone, and that at unawares, so she confessed of herself in the poet. Insanium priusquam quius sentiat, vix pili intervalio a furore absum. I shall be mad before it be perceived. A hair breath off scarce am I, now distracted. As mad as Orlando for his Angelica, or Hercules for his Hylas. At ille ruabat corpedes ducebant, furibundus, nam illi sabus deus juntus jecor laniabat. He went he cared not whither, mad he was, the cruel god so tortured him, alas. At the sight of Hero I cannot tell how many ran mad. Alias vulnus celans insanit pulcritudine puellae. And whilst he doth conceal his grief, 
madness comes on him like a thief. Go to Bedlam, for examples. It is so well known in every village how many have either died for love or voluntarily made away themselves, that I need not much labour to prove it. Nec modus aut requies nisi mors reperito amoris. Death is the common catastrophe to such persons. Mori mihi contingat, non enim alia, liberatio ab eramnis puerit ulo peto istis. Would I were dead, for naught, God knows, but death can rid me of these woes. As soon as Euryalus departed from Senes, Lucretia, his paramour, never looked up. No jests could exhilarate her sad mind, no joys comfort her wounded and distressed soul. But a little after she fell sick and died. But this is a gentle end, a natural death. Such persons commonly make away themselves. Proprioque in sanguine latus, indignantum animum vacuus eludit in aurus. So did Dido. Sed moriamo ait, sic sic juvat ire per umbras. Pyramus and Thisbe, Medea, Coresus and Caliroi, Theagenes the philosopher, and many myriads besides, and so will ever do. Et mihi fortis est manus, est et amor, dabit hic in vulnera vires. Who ever heard a story of more woe than that of Juliet and her Romeo? Read Parthenium in Eroticis, and Plutarch's Amatorius Narrationes, or love stories, all tending almost to this purpose. Valeriola, Book Two, Observation Seven, hath a lamentable narration of a merchant, his patient, that raving through impatience of love, had he not been watched, would every while have offered violence to himself. Amatus Lusitanus hath such another story, and Felix Plater, a third of a young gentleman that studied physic, and for the love of a doctor's daughter, having no hope to compass his desire, poisoned himself. Anno 1615. A barber in Frankfurt, because his wench was betrothed to another, cut his own throat. At Neuburg the same year, a young man, because he could not get his parents' consent, killed his sweetheart, and afterward himself, desiring of the magistrate, as he gave up the ghost, that they might be buried in one grave. Quodque rogis superest, una requiescat in una. Which Gismunda besought of Tancredius, her father, that she might be in like sort buried with Griscardus, her lover, so that their bodies might lie together in the grave, as their souls wander about Campus Lugentes in the Elysian fields. Quos duus amor crudeli tabe peredit, in a myrtle grove. Et myrtea circum silver tegit, curae non ipsa in morte reliquunt. You have not yet heard the worst. They do not offer violence to themselves in this rage of lust, but unto others, their nearest and dearest friends. Catiline killed his only son, misitque at occi pallida, lethi ob nubila, obsita tenebris loca, for the love of Aurelia Oristella, quod aegis nuptias vivo filio recusaret. Laodice, the sister of Mithridates, poisoned her husband, to give content to a base fellow whom she loved. Alexander, to please Theus, a concubine of his, set Persepolis on fire. Nereus's wife, a widow and lady of Athens, for the love of a Venetian gentleman, betrayed the city, and he for her sake murdered his wife, the daughter of a nobleman in Venice. Constantine Despota made away Catherine his wife, turned his son Michael and his other children out of doors, for the love of a base scrivener's daughter in Thessalonica, with whose beauty he was enamoured. Leucophria betrayed the city where she dwelt, for her sweetheart's sake, that was in the enemy's camp. Pythidice, the governor's daughter of Methinia, for the love of Achilles, betrayed the whole island to him. Her father's enemy, Diogenes, did as much in the city where he dwelt, for the love of Polycrita. Medea for the love of Jason. She taught him how to tame the fire-breathing, brass-feated bulls, and kill the mighty dragon that kept the golden fleece, and tore her little brother Absurtus in pieces, that her father Aethes might have something to detain him, while she ran away with her beloved Jason, etc. Such acts and scenes hath this tragic comedy of love. 
End of section 20. Section 21 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3, by Robert Burton. Section 21. Partition 3, Section 2. Member 5, Subsection 1. Cure of Love Melancholy by Labour, Diet, Physic, Fasting, etc. Although it be controverted by some whether love melancholy may be cured, because it is so irresistible and violent a passion, for, as you know, facilis descensus averni, sed revocari gradium, superosque evadere ad aurus, hic labor hoc opus est. It is an easy passage down to hell, but to come back once there you cannot well. Yet without question, if it be taken in time, it may be helped, and by many good remedies amended. Avicenna sets down seven compendious ways how this malady may be eased, altered, and expelled. Savonarola 9, Principal Observations, Jason Pratensis, prescribes eight rules besides physic. How this passion may be tamed. Laurentius II, main precepts. Arnoldus, Valeriola, Montaltus, Hildesheim, Langius, and others inform us otherwise, and yet all tending to the same purpose. The sum of which I will briefly epitomize, for I light my candle from their torches, and enlarge again upon occasion, as shall seem best to me, and that after mine own method. The first rule to be observed in this stubborn and unbridled passion is exercise and diet. It is an old and well-known sentence. Sine carere et sacco frigat Venus. Love grows cool without bread and wine. As an idle sedentary life, liberal feeding are great causes of it, so the opposite, labour, slender and sparing diet, with continual busyness, are the best and most ordinary means to prevent it. Otio si tollas, perieri cupidinis ertes, contemptaeque jacent, et sine luce faces. Take idleness away, and put to flight our cupid's arts, his torches give no light. Minerva, Diana, Vesta, and the nine muses were not enamoured at all, because they were never idle. Frustra blanditae apolistis ad has. Frustra nequitiae venistis ad has. Frustra delitiae obsidebitis has. Frustra has ilecebrae et procacitatis. Et suspiria et oscula et susuri. Et quisquis male sana corda amantum. Blandis aberia fascinat veneris. In vain are all your flatteries. In vain are all your knaveries, delights, deceits, procacities, sighs, kisses, and conspiracies, and whatever is done by art to bewitch a lover's heart. Tis in vain to set upon those that are busy. Tis Savonarola's third rule. Occupari in multus et magnus negotius, and avicenneth cedit amor rebus, res age tutus eris. To be busy still. And as Guianerius enjoins about matters of great moment, if it may be, Magninus adds, never to be idle but at the hours of sleep. Et si poscas ante diem librum cum lumine, si non intendas animum studius, at rebus honestis, invidia vel amore miser toquebere. For if thou dost not ply thy book by candlelight to study bent, employed about some honest thing, Envy or love shall thee torment. No better physic than to be always occupied, seriously intent. Cor in penatis rarius tenuis subit, haec delicatus elegans pestis domus, mediumque sanus vulgus affectus tenet, etc. Why dost thou ask, poor folks are often free, and dainty places still molested be? Because poor people fare coarsely, work hard, go woolward, and bear. 
non habet unde suum paupertas pascat amorem. Guianerius therefore prescribes his patient to go with haircloth next his skin, to go barefooted and barelegged in cold weather, to whip himself now and then, as monks do, but above all to fast, not with sweet wine, mutton, and pottage, as many of those tender bellies do, howsoever they put on Lenten faces, and whatsoever they pretend, but from all manner of meat. Fasting is an all-sufficient remedy of itself, for, as Jason Pratensis holds, the bodies of such persons that feed liberally, and live at ease, are full of bad spirits and devils, devilish thoughts. No better physic for such parties than to fast. Hildesheim to this of hunger adds, often baths, much exercise and sweat. But hunger and fasting he prescribes before the rest. And tis indeed our Saviour's oracle. This kind of devil is not cast out but by fasting and prayer, which makes the fathers so immoderate in commendation of fasting. As hunger, saith Ambrose, is a friend of virginity, so it is an enemy to lasciviousness, but fullness overthrows chastity, and fostereth all manner of provocations. If thine horse be too lusty, Hieromi adviseth thee to take away some of his provender. By this means those Pauls, Hilaries, Antonies, and famous anchorites subdued the lusts of the flesh. By this means Hilarion made his ass, as he called his own body, leave kicking. So Hieromi relates of him in his life, when the devil tempted him to any such foul offence. By this means those Indian Brahmins kept themselves continent. They lay upon the ground covered with skins, as the red shanks do on heather, and dieted themselves sparingly on one dish, which Guianerius would have all young men put in practice, and if that will not serve, Gordonius would have them soundly whipped, or, to cool their courage, kept in prison, and there fed with bread and water till they acknowledge their error and become of another mind. If imprisonment and hunger will not take them down, according to the directions of that Theban Crates, time will wear it out. If time will not, the last refuge is a halter. But this, you will say, is comically spoken. Howsoever, fasting, by all means, must still be used. And as they must refrain from such meats formerly mentioned, which cause venery or provoke lust, so they must use an opposite diet. Wine must be altogether avoided of the younger sort, so Plato prescribes, and would have the magistrates themselves abstain from it, for example's sake highly commending the Carthaginians for their temperance in this kind. And t'was a good edict, a commendable thing, so that it were not done for some sinister respect, as those old Egyptians abstained from wine, because some fabulous poets had given out, wine sprang from the first blood of the giants, or out of superstition, as our modern Turks. But for temperance, it being animae virus et vitiorum formes, a plague itself, if immoderately taken. Women of old for that cause, in hot countries, were forbid the use of it, as severely punished for drinking of wine as for adultery. And young folks, as Leonicus hath recorded, out of Athenaeus and others, and is still practised in Italy, and some other countries of Europe and Asia, as Claudius Minois hath well illustrated in his comment on the twenty-third emblem of Alciat so choice is to be made of other diet. Nec minus erucus aptum est vitare salaces, et quidquid veneri corpora nostra parat. Eringos are not good for to be taken, and all lascivious meats must be forsaken. Those opposite meats which ought to be used are cucumbers, melons, purslane, water lilies, rue, woodbine, ami, lettuce, which Lemnius so much commends, and Mizaldus to this purpose, Vitex or Agnus Castus before the rest, which, saith Magninus, hath a wonderful virtue in it. Those Athenian women, in their solemn feasts called Thesmopheres, were to abstain nine days from the company of men, during which time, saith Alien, they laid a certain herb, named Hanea, in their beds, which assuaged those ardent flames of love, and freed them from the torments of that violent passion. See more in Porta, Matthiolus, Crescentius, etc., and what every herbalist, almost and physician, hath written, 
chapter de satyriase et priapismo races amongst the rest in some cases again if they be much dejected and brought low in body and now ready to despair through anguish grief and too sensible a feeling of their misery a cup of wine and full diet is not amiss and as valescus adviseth cum alia honesta venerum saepe exercendo which langius epistolus medicae book one epistle twenty four approves out of rasis rasis ad assiduationem coitus invitat and guianerius seconds it as a very profitable remedy tumunt tibi cum inguina cum si ancilla ad verna praesto est ten tigine rumpi malis non ego namque etc jason pretensis subscribes to this counsel of the poet excretio enim aut tollet prosus aut lenit egritudinem as did the raging lust of ahasuerus qui ad impatientiam amoris leniedium per singulus fere noctes novas puellas de virginavit and to be drunk too by fits but this is mad physic if it be at all to be permitted if not yet some pleasure is to be allowed as that which vive speaks of book three de anima a lover that hath as it were lost himself through impotency impatience must be called home as a traveller by music feasting good wine if need be to drunkenness itself which many so much commend for the easing of the mind all kinds of sports and merriments to see fair pictures hangings buildings pleasant fields orchards gardens groves ponds pools rivers fishing fowling hawking hunting to hear merry tales and pleasant discourse reading to use exercise till he sweat that new spirits may succeed or by some vehement affection or contrary passion to be diverted till he be fully weaned from anger suspicion cares fears etc and habituated into another course semper tecum sit as sempronius adviseth callisto his lovesick master qui sermones joculares moviat conciones ridiculas dicteria falsa suaves historias fabulous venustas recensiat coram ludat etc still have a pleasant companion to sing and tell merry tales songs and facet histories sweet discourse etc and as the melody of music merriment singing dancing doth augment the passion of some lovers as avicenna notes so it expelleth it in others and doth very much good these things must be warily applied as the party symptoms vary and as they shall stand variously affected if there be any need of physic that the humours be altered or any new matter aggregated they must be cured as melancholy men carolus a lormi amongst other questions discussed for his degree at montpellier in france hath this an amantes et amantes listem remedies curentor whether lovers and madmen be cured by the same remedies he affirms it for love extended is mere madness such physic then as is prescribed as either inward or outward as hath been formerly handled in the precedent partition in the cure of melancholy consult with valeriola lodovicus mercatus book two chapter four de mulierum affectionibus daniel senatus book one part two chapter ten jacobus ferrandus the frenchman in his tract de amor erotique forestus book ten observations twenty nine and thirty jason pretensis and others for peculiar receipts amatus lusitanus cured a young jew that was almost mad for love with the syrup of hellebore and such other evacuations and purges which are usually prescribed to black collar avicenna confirms as much if need require and bloodletting above the rest which makes amantes nascent amentes lovers to come to themselves and keep in their right minds tis the same which scola salernitana jason pretensis hildesheim etc prescribe bloodletting to be used as a principal remedy those old scythians had a trick to cure all appetite of burning lust by letting themselves blood under the ears and to make both men and women barren 
as Sabellicus in his Aeneades relates of them, which Salmus Mercurialis out of Hippocrates and Benzo say still is in use amongst the Indians, a reason of which Langius gives, Book 1, Epistle 10. Uc faciunt medicamenta venerum sopientia, ut camphora prudendis alligata, et in braca gestata, quidem ait, membrum placidum reddit, laboravit hoc morbo virgo nobilis, cui intercaetera prescripsit medicus, ut laminum plumbiam multis foraminibus pertusum ad dies viginti portaret in dorso, ad exicandum vero sperma jusit eam quam percissime cibari, et manducari frequenta coriandrum preparatum, et semen lactuci, et acetosi, et sim iam amorbo liberavit. Poro impediunt, et remittunt coitum folia salicus trita et epota, et si frequentius usurpentur ipsa in totum affurunt, idem prestat topatius annulo gestatus, dexterum lupi testiculum atritum, et olio vel aqua rosata exhibitum veneris tedium inducere, scribit Alexander Benedictus, lac butiri comestum et semen cannabis, et camphora exhibita idem prestant, verbena herba gestata libidinum extinguit, pulvis quae ranae decolatae et exicatae. Ad extinguendum coitum, ungantum membra genitalia, et renes et pectin aqua in qua opium, thebicum sit dissolutum, libidine maxime contraria camphora est, et coriandum circumfrangit coitum, et erectionum virgae empidet, idem efficit synapium ebibitum, da verbenum in potu et non erigeto virga sex diebus, utere mente sicca cum aceto, Genitalia illinita succo hyosciami aid cicutai, coitus appellitum sedant, etc. End of section 21. Section 22 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3, by Robert Burton. Section 22. Partition 3, Section 2, Member 5, Subsection 2. Withstand the beginnings, avoid occasions, change his place. Fair and foul means, contrary passions, with witty inventions. To bring in another and discommend the former. Other good rules and precepts are enjoined by our physicians, which, if not alone, yet certainly conjoin, may do much. The first of which is obstare principiis, to withstand the beginning. Quisquis in primo obstitit, pepulutque amorem tutus ac victor fuit. He that will but resist at first, may easily be a conqueror at the last. Baldassar Castillo, Book 4, urgeth this prescript above the rest. When he shall chance, saith he, to light upon a woman that hath good behaviour joined with her excellent person, and shall perceive his eyes with a kind of greediness to pull unto them this image of beauty, and carry it to the heart, shall observe himself to be somewhat incensed with this influence which moveth within, when he shall discern those subtle spirits sparkling in her eyes, to administer more fuel to the fire, he must wisely withstand the beginnings, rouse up reason, stupefied almost, fortify his heart by all means, and shut up all those passages by which it may have entrance. Tis a precept which all concur upon, opprime dum nova sunt subiti mala semina morbi, Dum licet in primo lumine siste pedem. Thy quick disease, whilst it is fresh to-day, By all means crush, thy feet at first step stay. Which cannot speedier be done Than if he confess his grief and passion To some judicious friend. Qui tacitus ardet magis uritur. The more he conceals, the greater is his pain. 
that by his good advice may happily ease him on a sudden, and withal to avoid occasions or any circumstance that may aggravate his disease, to remove the object by all means. For who can stand by a fire and not burn? Susilite obsecro et mitite istanchoras, quae misero mihi amanti e bibit sanguinem. Tis good, therefore, to keep quite out of her company, which Hiriom so much labours to Paula, to Nepotheon, Chrysost so much inculcates in Sir in Contuburn, Cyprian and many other fathers of the church, Siracides in his ninth chapter, Jason Pretensis, Savonarola, Arnoldus, Valeriola, etc., and every physician that treats of this subject not only to avoid, as Gregory Tolosanus exhorts, kissing, dalliance, all speeches, tokens, love-letters, and the like, or, as Castilio, book four, to converse with them, hear them speak or sing. Tolerabilius est audire basiliscum sibilantem. Thou hadst better hear, said Cyprian, a serpent hiss. Those amiable smiles, admirable graces, and sweet gestures which their presence affords. Neo capita liment solitis mersiunculis, et his papillarum oppressiunculis abstineant. But all talk, name, mention, or cogitation of them, and of any other women, persons, circumstance, amorous book or tale that may administer any occasion of remembrance, Prosper adviseth the young man not to read the canticles, and some parts of Genesis at other times, but for such as are enamoured, they forbid as before the name mentioned, etc., especially all sight. They must not so much as come near or look upon them. Et fugitare decet simulacra et pabula amoris, abstinere sibi atque alio convertire mentem. Gaze not on a maid, saith Siracides, turn away thine eyes from a beautiful woman, chapter 9, verses 5, 7, 8. Averte oculos, saith David, or if thou dost see them, as Ficinus adviseth, let not thine eye be intentus ad libidinem, do not intend her more than the rest. For as Propertius holds, ipse alimenta sibi maxima prebet amor, Love as a snowball enlarges itself by sight. But as Hierome to Nepotian, aut equaliter ama, aut equaliter ignora. Either see all alike, or let all alone. Make a league with thine eyes, as Job did, and that is the safest course. Let all alone see none of them. Nothing sooner revives, or waxes it sore again, as Petrarch holds, than love doth by sight. As pomp renews ambition, the sight of gold, covetousness, a beauteous object sets on fire this burning lust. At multum saliens incitat unda sitim. The sight of drink makes one dry, and the sight of meat increaseth appetite. Tis dangerous, therefore, to see. A young gentleman in merriment would needs put on his mistress's clothes and walk abroad alone, which some of her suitors espying stole him away for her that he represented so much can sight and force. Especially if he have been formerly enamoured, the sight of his mistress strikes him into a new fit, and makes him rave many days after. Infirmis causa pusilla nocet, ut pene extinctum cinerem si sufure tangas, vivet et ex minimo maximus ignis erit, sic nisi vitabis quiquit renovabit amorem, Flamma recrudescet, quae modo nulla fuit. A sickly man a little thing offends, as brimstone doth a fire decayed renew, and makes it burn afresh, doth love's dead flames, if that the former object it review. Or, as the poet compares it to embers in ashes, which the wind blows, ut solet aventis, etc., a scald head, as the saying is, is soon broken, dry wood quickly kindles, and when they have been formerly wounded with sight, how can they, by seeing, but be inflamed? 
Ismenias acknowledged as much of himself when he had been long absent and almost forgotten his mistress at the first sight of her as straw in a fire are burned afresh, and more than ever I did before. Chariclia was as much moved at the sight of her dear Theagenes, after he had been a great stranger. Mercela, in Aristenetus, swore she would never love Pamphilus again, and did moderate her passion so long as he was absent, but the next time he came in presence she could not contain a fuse amplexa attractari sessinet, etc. She broke her vow, and did profusely embrace him. Hermotinus, a young man, in the said author, is all out as unstayed. He had forgot his mistress quite, and by his friends was well weaned from her love. But seeing her by chance, ach novit veteris vestigia flammae, he raved amain, ila tamen emergens veluti lucida stella capit el luca, etc. She did appear as a blazing star, or an angel to his sight. And it is the common passion of all lovers to be overcome in this sort. For that cause, belike Alexander discerning this inconvenience and danger that comes by seeing, when he heard Darius's wife so much commended for her beauty, would scarce admit her to come in his sight, for knowing belike that of Plutarch, formosam videre periculosissimum, how full of danger it is to see a proper woman, and though he is intemperate in other things, yet in this superbe segesit he carried himself bravely. And so, when as Araspas in Xenophon had so much magnified that divine face of Panthea to Ceres, by how much she was fairer than ordinary, by so much he was the more unwilling to see her. Scipio, a young man of twenty-three years of age, and the most beautiful of the Romans, equal in person to that Grecian Carinus, or Homer's Nereus, at the siege of a city in Spain, when as a noble and most fair young gentlewoman was brought unto him, and he had heard she was betrothed to a lord, rewarded her, and sent her back to her sweetheart. St. Augustine, as Gregory reports of him, ne cum sorore quidem sua putavit habitandum, would not live in the house with his own sister. Xenocrates lay with the lays of Corinth all night, and would not touch her. Socrates, though all the city of Athens supposed him to dote upon fair Alcibiades, yet when he had an opportunity, solus cum solo, to lie in the chamber with, and was wooed by him besides, as the said Alcibiades publicly confessed, formam sprevit et superbe contempsit, he scornfully rejected him. Petrarch, that had so magnified his Laura in several poems, when by the Pope's means she was offered unto him, would not accept of her. It is a good happiness to be free from this passion of love, and great discretion it argues in such a man that he can so contain himself. But when thou art once in love, to moderate thyself, as he saith, is a singular point of wisdom. Nam vitare plagas in amores ne jaci amor non ita difficile est, quam captum retibus ipsis exire, et validos veneris perumpere nodos. To avoid such nets is no such mastery, but tain escape is all the victory. But for as much as few men are free, so discreet lovers, or that can contain themselves, and moderate their passions, to curb their senses, as not to see them, not to look lasciviously, not to confer with them, such is the fury of this headstrong passion of raging lust, and their weakness, ferox ille ardor a natura in situs as he terms it, such a furious desire nature hath inscribed, such unspeakable delight. Sic divie veneris furor, insanis adio mentibus incubat, which neither reason, counsel, poverty, pain, misery, drudgery, partus dolor, etc., can deter them from. We must use some speedy means to correct and prevent that and all other inconveniences, which come by conference and the like. The best, readiest, surest way, and which all approve, is loci mutatio, to send them several ways, that they may neither hear of, see, nor have an opportunity to send to one another again, or live together, soli cum sola, as so many Gilbertines, elongatio a patria, 
tis Savonarola's fourth rule and Gordonius precept, distrahatur ad longinquas regiones, send him to travel. Tis that which most run upon, as so many hounds, with full cry, poets, divines, philosophers, physicians, all mutet patrium. Felicius, as a sick man he must be cured with change of air. Tully four Tusculans. The best remedy is to get thee gone, Jason pretenses, change air and soil. Laurentius, fuge litus amatum. Virgil, utile finitimis abstinuisse locis. Ovid, i procul et longas carpere perges vias, set fuge tutus eris. Travelling is an antidote of love. Magnum iter ad doctas provicisci cogor Athenas, ut me longa gravi solvat amore via. For this purpose, saith Propertius, my parents sent me to Athens. Time and patience wear away pain and grief, as fire goes out for want of fuel. Quantum oculis animo tam procul ibit amor. But so as they tarry out long enough, a whole year, Xenophon prescribes Critobulus, vix enim intra hoc tempus ab amore sanari poteris. Some will hardly be weaned under. All this, Heinsius merely inculcates in an epistle to his friend Primierus. First fast, then tarry, thirdly, change thy place, fourthly, drink of a halter. If change of place, continuance of time, absence, will not wear it out with those precedent remedies, it will hardly be removed, but these commonly are of force. Felix Plater had a baker to his patient, almost mad for the love of his maid, and desperate. By removing her from him, he was in a short space cured. Iseus, a philosopher of Assyria, was a most dissolute liver in his youth, palam laxiviens, in love with all he met but after he betook himself by his friend's advice to his study and left women's company he was so changed that he cared no more for plays nor feasts nor masks nor songs nor verses fine clothes nor no such love toys he became a new man upon a sudden tanquam si prioris oculos amisiset saith mine author as if he had lost his former eyes peter godefridus in the last chapter of his third book had a story out of St. Ambrose, of a young man that, meeting his old love after long absence, on whom he had extremely doted, would scarce take notice of her. She wondered at it, that he should so lightly esteem her, called him again, Lenibat dictis animum, and told him who she was. Ego sum, inquit, at ego non sum ego. But he replied, he was not the same man. Poripuit se se tandem. As Aeneas fled from Dido, not vouchsaving her any farther parley, loathing his folly, and ashamed of that which formerly he had done. Non sum stultus ut ante iam neaera. O neaera, put your tricks, and practice hereafter upon somebody else. You shall be fool me no longer. Petrarch hath such another tale of a young gallant that loved a wench with one eye, and for that cause by his parents was sent to travel into far countries. After some years he returned, and meeting the maid for whose sake he was sent abroad, asked her how and by what chance she lost her eye. No, said she, I have lost none, but you have found yours, signifying thereby that all lovers were blind, as Fabius saith. Amantes de forma judicare non pusunt. Lovers cannot judge of beauty, nor scarce of anything else, as they will easily confess after they return unto themselves, by some discontinuance or better advice, wonder at their own folly, madness, stupidity, blindness, be much abashed, and laugh at love, and call it an idle thing, condemn themselves that ever they should be so besotted or misled, and be heartily glad they have so happily escaped. If so be, which is seldom, that change of place will not affect this alteration, then other remedies are to be annexed, fair and foul means, as to persuade, promise, threaten, terrify, or to divert by some contrary passion, rumour, tales, news, or some witty invention, to alter his affection, by some greater sorrow to drive out the less, saith Gardonius, as that his house is on fire, 
his best friends dead, his money stolen, that he has made some great governor, or hath some honour, office, some inheritance is befallen him. He shall be a knight, a baron, or by some false accusation, as they do to such as have the hiccup, to make them forget it. St. Jerome, Book 2, Epistle 16 to Rusticus the Monk, hath an instance of a young man of Greece that lived in a monastery in Egypt, that by no labour, no continence, no persuasion, could be diverted, but at last by this trick he was delivered. The abbot sets one of his convent to quarrel with him, and with some scandalous reproach or other to defame him before company, and then to come and complain first. The witnesses were likewise suborned for the plaintiff. The young man wept, and when all were against him, the abbot cunningly took his part, lest he should be overcome with immoderate grief. But what need many words! By this invention he was cured, and alienated from his pristine love-thoughts, injuries, slanders, contempts, disgraces, suetaico injuria formae, the insult of her slighted beauty, are very forcible means to withdraw men's affections. Contumelia affecti amatores amare dissinunt, as Lucian saith, lovers reviled or neglected, contempt or misused, turn love to hate. Rediam non si me obsecret, I'll never love thee more. Egone illam, qua illum, qua me, qua non. So Severus hated Hyacinthus because he scorned him, and preferred his co-rival Apollo, Palephaetus. He will not come again, though he be invited. Tell him but how he was scoffed at behind his back, tis the counsel of Avicenna, that his love is false, and entertains another, rejects him, cares not for him, or that she is a fool, a nasty queen, a slut, a vixen, a scold, a devil, or, which Italians commonly do, that he or she hath some loathsome filthy disease, gout, stone, strangury, falling sickness, and that they are hereditary, not to be avoided, he is subject to consumption, hath the pox, that he hath three or four incurable tetters, issues, that she is bold, her breath stinks, she is mad by inheritance, and so are all the kindred, a hair-brain, with many other secret infirmities, which I will not so much as name, belonging to women. That he is a hermaphrodite, a eunuch, imperfect, impotent, a spendthrift, a gamester, a fool, a gull, a beggar, a whore-master, far in debt, and not able to maintain her, a common drunkard, his mother was a witch, his father hanged, that he hath a wolf in his bosom, a sore leg, he is a leper, hath some incurable disease, that he will surely beat her, he cannot hold his water, that he cries out or walks in the night, will stab his bedfellow, tell all his secrets in his sleep, and that nobody dare lie with him. His house is haunted with spirits, with such fearful and tragical things, able to avert and terrify any man or woman living. Gordonius, chapter 20, part 2. Hunc in modo consulit, paritur aliqua vetula, turpissima aspectu, cum turpi et vili habitu, et portet subtus gremium panum menstrualem, et dicat quod amica sua sit ebriosa, et quod mingat in lecto, et quod est epileptica, et impudicia, et quod in corpore suo sunt excrescentiae enormes, cum fetor anhelitus, et aliae enormitates, quibus vetulae sunt edoctae, si nolit his persuaderi, subito extrahat panum menstrualem, coram facie portando, exclamando, talis est amica tua, et si ex his non demiserit, non est homo, sed diabolus incarnatus, idem fere avicenna, caput viginti quater, de cura elici, liber tres, Narent res immundas vetulae, ex quibus abominationem incurat et res sordidas et hoc assiduent, idem arculanus caput sedecim, in novem rasis, etc. Withal, as they do discommend the old for the better effecting a more speedy alteration, they must command another paramour, altrum induca, set him or her to be wooed, 
or woo some other that shall be fairer, of better note, better fortune, birth, parentage, much to be preferred, in venius alium si te hic fastidit Alexis, by this means which Jason Pretensis wisheth, to turn the stream of affection another way, successore novo truditur omnis amor, or, as Valesius adviseth, by subdividing to diminish it, as a great river cut into many channels runs low at last, hortor et ut pariter binas habeatis amicas, etc. If you suspect to be taken, be sure, said the poet, to have two mistresses at once, or go from one to another, as he that goes from a good fire in cold weather is loath to depart from it, though in the next room there be a better which will refresh him as much. There is as much difference of haec as haec ignis, or bring him to some public shows, plays, meetings, where he may see variety, and he shall likely loathe his first choice, carry him but to the next town, yea, peradventure to the next house, and as Paris lost Oenonus' love by seeing Helen, and Cressida forsook Troilus by conversing with Diomede, he will dislike his former mistress, and leave her quite behind him, as Theseus left Ariadne fast asleep in the island of Dia to seek her fortune, that was erst his loving mistress. Nunc primum dorida fetus amator contempsi, as he said, Doris is but a dowdy to this. As he that looks himself in a glass forgets his physiognomy forthwith, this flattering glass of love will be diminished by remove. After a little absence it will be remitted, the next fair object will likely alter it. A young man in Lucian was pitifully in love. He came to the theatre by chance, and by seeing other fair objects there, mentis sanitatum recipit, was fully recovered, and went merrily home, as if he had taken a dram of oblivion. A mouse, saith an apologer, was brought up in a chest, there fed with fragments of bread and cheese, though there could be no better meat, till coming forth at last, and feeding liberally of other variety of viands, loathed his former life. Moralize this fable by thyself. Plato, in his seventh book, De Legibus, had the pretty fiction of a city underground, to which by little holes some small store of light came. The inhabitants thought there could not be a better place, and at their first coming abroad they might not endure the light, egerime solem intueri, but after they were accustomed to a little to it, they deplored their fellow's misery that lived underground. A silly lover is in like state, none so fair as his mistress at first, he cares for none but her. Yet after a while, when he hath compared her with others, he abhors her name, sight and memory. It is generally true, for, as he observes, priorem flammam novus ignis extrudit, et ea multorum natura, et presentis maxime ament. One fire drives out another, and such is women's weakness, that they love commonly him that is present. And so do many men, as he confessed he loved Amia, till he saw Florial, and when he saw Cynthia, forget them both. But fair Phyllis was incomparably beyond them all. Chloris surpassed her, and yet when he espied Amaryllis, she was his sole mistress. O oh, divine Amaryllis, quam procera, cupressi ad instar, quam elegans, quam decens, etc. How lovely, how tall, how comely she was, saith Polemius, till he saw another. And then she was the sole subject of his thoughts. In conclusion, her he loves best he saw last. Triton, the sea-god, first love, Leucothe, till he came in presence of Milaine. She was the commandress of his heart till he saw Galatea. But, as she complains, he loved another eftsoons, another and another. Tis a thing which, by Hierom's report, hath been usually practised. Heathen philosophers drive out one love with another, as they do a peg or pin with a pin, which those seven Persian princes did to Arasurus, that they might requite the desire of Queen Vashti with the love of others. Pausanias in Iliacis saith that therefore one Cupid was painted to contend with another, and to take the garden from him, because one love drives out another. Alterius Virus subtrahit autum amor, and Tully, three, on the nature of the gods, disputing with C. Cotta, makes mention of three several cupids, all differing in office. 
Felix Plater, in the first book of his observations, boasts how he cured a widower in Basel, a patient of his, by this stratagem alone, that doted upon a poor servant his maid, when friends, children, no persuasion could serve to alienate his mind. They motioned him to another honest man's daughter in the town, whom he loved and lived with long after, abhorring the very name and sight of the first. After the death of Lucretia, Euryalus would admit of no comfort, till the Emperor Sigismund married him to a noble lady of his court, and so in short space he was freed. End of section 22section twenty three of the anatomy of melancholy volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by cynthia moyer the anatomy of melancholy volume three by robert burton Section 23, Partition 3, Section 2, Member 5, Subsection 3, Part 1. By counsel and persuasion, foulness of the fact, men's, women's, faults, miseries of marriage, events of lust, etc., as there be diverse causes of this burning lust or heroical love so there be many good remedies to ease and help amongst which good counsel and persuasion which i should have handled in the first place are of great moment and not to be omitted many are of opinion that in this blind headstrong passion counsel can do no good quae enim res in se neque consilium neque modum habet ullo eam consilio regere non potes which thing hath neither judgment or an end how should advice or counsel it amend quis enim modis adsit amori but without question good counsel and advice must needs be of great force especially if it shall proceed from a wise fatherly reverent discreet person a man of authority whom the parties do respect stand in awe of or from a judicious friend of itself alone it is able to divert and suffice gordonius the physician attributes so much to it that he would have it by all means used in the first place Amoeatur ab illa consilio viri quem timet, ostentendo pericula saeculi, judicium inferni, gaudia paradisi. He would have some discreet men to dissuade them, after the fury of passion is a little spent, or by absence allayed. For it is as intempestive at first to give counsel, as to comfort parents when their children are in that instant departed. To no purpose to prescribe narcotics, cordials, nectarines, potions, Homer's nepenthes, or Helen's bowl, etc. Non cessabit pectus tundere, she will lament and howl for a season. Let passion have his course a while, and then he may proceed by foreshowing the miserable events and dangers which will surely happen, the pains of hell, joys of paradise, and the like, which by their preposterous courses they shall forfeit or incur. And tis a fit method, a very good means, for what Seneca said of vice, I say of love. Sine magistro discitur, Vix sine magistro deseritur. Tis learned of itself, but hardly left without a tutor. 
tis not amiss therefore to have some such overseer to expostulate and show them such absurdities inconveniences imperfections discontents as usually follow which their blindness fury madness cannot apply unto themselves or will not apprehend through weakness and good for them to disclose themselves to give ear to friendly admonitions tell me sweetheart saith tryphena to a lovesick charmides in lucian what is it that troubles thee peradventure i can ease thy mind and further thee in thy suit and so without question she might and so mayst thou if the patient be capable of good counsel and will hear at least what may be said if he love at all she is either an honest woman or a whore if dishonest let him read or inculcate to him that fifth of solomon's proverbs ecclesiasticus twenty six ambrose book one chapter four in his book of abel and cain philo judeus de mercede platinus dialogus in amores espencaeus and those three books of petrus haidus aeneas silvius's tart epistle which he wrote to his friend nicholas of warturge which he calls medelam illiciti amores etc for what's a whore as he saith but a polar of youth a ruin of men a destruction a devourer of patrimonies a downfall of honour fodder for the devil the gate of death and supplement of hell talis amor est laqueus animae etc a bitter honey sweet poison delicate destruction a voluntary mischief comixtum coenum sterquilinium and as peter aretine's lucretia a notable queen confesseth gluttony anger envy pride sacrilege theft slaughter were all born that day that a whore began her profession for as she follows it her pride is greater than a rich churl's she is more envious than the pox as malicious as melancholy as covetous as hell if from the beginning of the world any were mala pejor pessima bad in the superlative degree tis a whore how many have i undone caused to be wounded slain o antonia thou seest what i am without but within god knows a puddle of iniquity a sink of sin a pocky queen let him now that so dotes meditate on this let him see the event and success of others samson hercules holofernes etc those infinite mischiefs attend it if she be another man's wife he loves tis abominable in the sight of god and men adultery is expressly forbidden in god's commandment a mortal sin able to endanger his soul if he be such a one that fears god or have any religion he will eschew it and abhor the loathsomeness of his own fact if he love an honest maid tis to abuse or marry her if to abuse tis fornication a foul fact though some make light of it and almost equal to adultery itself if to marry let him seriously consider what he takes in hand look before ye leap as the proverb is or settle his affections and examine first the party and condition of his estate and hers whether it be a fit match for fortunes years parentage 
and such other circumstances, an sit sitai veneris, whether it be likely to proceed, if not, let him wisely stave himself off at the first, curb in his inordinate passion, and moderate his desire by thinking of some other subject divert his cogitations. Or if it be not for his good, as Aeneas, forewarned by Mercury in a dream, left Dido's love, and in all haste got him to see. Mnestea, surgestumque vocat fortemque cloantem, classem aptent taciti iubet. And although she did oppose with vows, tears, prayers, and imprecation, nullis ille muetur fletibus aut illas voces tractabilis audit, let thy mercury reason rule thee against all allurements, seeming delights, pleasing inward or outward provocations. Thou mayst do this if thou wilt. Pater non deperit filiam, nec frater sororem. A father dotes not on his own daughter, a brother on a sister. And why? Because it is unnatural, unlawful, unfit. If he be sickly, soft, deformed, let him think of his deformities, vices, infirmities. If in debt, let him ruminate how to pay his debts. If he be in any danger, let him seek to avoid it. If he have any lawsuit or other business, he may do well to let his love matters alone and follow it, labor in his vocation whatever it is. But if he cannot so ease himself, let him wisely premeditate of both their estates. If they be unequal in years, she young and he old, what an unfit match must it needs be, an uneven yoke, how absurd and indecent a thing is it, as Lycinus in Lucian told Timolaus, for an old bald crook-nosed knave to marry a young wench, how odious a thing it is to see an old lecher. What should a bald fellow do with a comb, a dumb doter with a pipe, a blind man with a looking-glass, and thou with such a wife. How absurd it is for a young man to marry an old wife for a piece of good. But put case she be equal in years, birth, fortunes, and other qualities correspondent, he doth desire to be coupled in marriage, which is an honourable estate. But for what respects? Her beauty belike and comeliness of person, that is commonly the main object, she is a most absolute form, in his eye at least. Cui formam paphia et carites tribuere decoram. But do other men affirm as much? Or is it an error in his judgment? Fallunt nos oculi vagique sensus, oppressa ratione mentiuntur. Our eyes and other senses will commonly deceive us. It may be, to thee thyself upon a more serious examination, or after a little absence, she is not so fair as she seems. Quaedam videntur et non sunt. Compare her to another standing by. Tis a touchstone to try. Confer hand to hand, body to body, face to face, eye to eye, nose to nose, neck to neck, etc. Examine every part by itself, then altogether, in all postures, several sights, and tell me how thou likest her. It may be not she that is so fair, but her coats or put another in her clothes, and she will seem all out as fair. As the poet 
then prescribes separate her from her clothes suppose thou saw her in a base beggar's weed or else dressed in some old hirsute attires out of fashion foul linen coarse raiment besmeared with soot colly perfumed with apoponax sagapenum asafetida or some such filthy gums dirty about some indecent action or other or in such a case as brasivola the physician found malatasta his patient after a potion of hellebore which he had prescribed manibus in terram depositis et anno versus caelum elevato ac si videretur socraticus ille aristophanes qui geometricas figuras in terram scribens tubera colligere videbantur atram bilem in album parietem in iciebat adeoque totam cameram et se deturpabat ut etc all to bereid or worse if thou sawst her i say would thou affect her as thou dost suppose thou beheldest her in a frosty morning in cold weather in some passion or perturbation of mind weeping chafing etc rivelled and ill-favoured to behold she many times that in a composed look seems so amiable and delicious tam scitula forma if she do but laugh or smile makes an ugly sparrow-mouthed face and shows a pair of uneven loathsome rotten foul teeth she hath a black skin gouty legs a deformed crooked carcass under a fine coat it may be for all her costly tires she is bald and though she seems so fair by dark by candle-light or afar off at such a distance as callicratides observed in lucian if thou should see her near or in a morning she would appear more ugly than a beast si diligenter consideres quid per os et nares et caeteros corporis meatus egreditur vilius sterquilinium nunquam vidisti follow my counsel see her undressed see her if it be possible out of her attires furtivis nodatam coloribus it may be she is like aesop's jay or pliny's cantharides she will be loathsome ridiculous thou wilt not endure her sight or suppose thou sawst her pale in a consumption on her deathbed skin and bones or now dead cuius erat gratissimus amplexus whose embrace was so agreeable as barnard saith erit horribilis aspectus non redolet sed olet quae redolere solet as a posy she smells sweet is most fresh and fair one day but dried up withered and stinks another beautiful nereus by that homer so much admired once dead is more deformed than thersites and solomon deceased as ugly as marcolphus thy lovely mistress that was erst caris carior ocellis dearer to thee than thine eyes once sick or departed is willi willior aestimata queno worse than any dirt or dunghill her embraces were not so acceptable as now her looks be terrible thou hadst better behold a gorgon's head than helen's carcass some are of opinion that to see a woman naked is able of itself to alter his affection and it is worthy of consideration saith montaigne the frenchman in his essays 
that the skilfulest masters of amorous dalliance a point for a remedy of venerous passions a full survey of the body which the poet insinuates ille quod obscinus in aperto corpore partes viderat in cursu qui fuit haesit amor the love stood still that run in full career when once it saw those parts should not appear it is reported of seleucus king of syria that seeing his wife stratonice's bald pate as she was undressing her by chance he could never affect her after remundus lullius the physician spying an ulcer or cancer in his mistress's breast whom he so dearly loved from that day following abhorred the looks of her philip the french king as neubrigensis book four chapter twenty four relates it married the king of denmark's daughter and after he had used her as a wife one night because her breath stunk they say or for some other secret fault sent her back again to her father peter matthaeus in the life of lewis the eleventh finds fault with our english chronicles for writing how margaret the king of scots daughter and wife to louis the eleventh french king was ob graveolentiam oris rejected by her husband many such matches are made for by respects or some seemly comeliness which after honeymoons past turn to bitterness for burning lust is but a flash a gunpowder passion and hatred oft follows in the highest degree dislike and contempt cum secutis arida laxat fiunt obscuri dentes when they wax old and ill-favoured they may commonly no longer abide them jam gravis est nobis be gone they grow stale fulsome loathsome odious thou art a beastly filthy queen faciem febe cacantis habes thou art saturni podex withered and dry insipida et vetula tequia rugae turpant et capitis nives i say be gone portae patent proficiscere yea but you will infer your mistress is complete of a most absolute form in all men's opinions no exceptions can be taken at her nothing may be added to her person nothing detracted she is the mirror of women for her beauty comeliness and pleasant grace inimitable merae deliciae meri lepores she is mirotetium veneris gratiarum pixis a mere magazine of natural perfections she hath all the venerees and graces mille faces et mille figuras in each part absolute and complete laeta genas laeta os roseum vaga lumina laeta to be admired for her person a most incomparable unmatchable piece orea proles ad simulacrum aliquius numinis composita a phoenix vernantis aetatulae venerila a nymph a fairy like venus herself when she was a maid nulli secunda a mere quintessence flores spirans et amaracum feminae prodigium put case she be how long will she continue florem decoris singuli carpunt dies every day detracts from her person and this beauty is bonum fragile a mere flash a venice glass quickly broken anceps forma bonum mortalibus 
exigui donum breve temporis it will not last as that fair flower adonis which we call an anemone flourisheth but one month this gracious all-commanding beauty fades in an instant it is a jewel soon lost the painter's goddess fulsa veritas a mere picture favor is deceitful and beauty is vanity proverbs thirty one thirty vitrea gemula fluxa quebulula candida forma est nix rosa fumus ventus et aura nihil a brittle gem bubble is beauty pale a rose dew snow smoke wind air not at all if she be fair as the saying is she is commonly a fool if proud scornful sequiturque superbia formam or dishonest rara est concordia formae atque pudicitiae can she be fair and honest too aristo the son of agasicles married a spartan lass the fairest lady in all greece next to helen but for her conditions the most abominable and beastly creature of the world so that i would wish thee to respect with seneca not her person but qualities will you say that's a good blade which hath a gilded scabbard embroidered with gold and jewels no but that which hath a good edge and point well-tempered metal able to resist this beauty is of the body alone and what is that but as gregory nazianzen telleth us a mock of time and sickness or as boethius as mutable as a flower and tis not nature so makes us but most part the infirmity of the beholder for ask another he sees no such matter dic mihi per gratias qualis tibi videtur i pray thee tell me how thou likest my sweetheart as she asked her sister in aristinetus whom i so much admire methinks he is the sweetest gentleman the properest man that ever i saw but i am in love i confess nec pudet fateri and cannot therefore well judge but be she fair indeed golden-haired as anacreon his bathyllus to examine particulars she have flameolos oculos colaque lacteola a pure sanguine complexion little mouth coral lips white teeth soft and plump neck body hands feet all fair and lovely to behold composed of all graces elegances an absolute peace lumina sint melitae eunonia dextra minervae mamillae veneris suramaris dominae etc let her head be from prague paps out of austria belly from france back from brabant hands out of england feet from rhine buttocks from switzerland let her have the spanish gait the venetian tire italian compliment and endowments candida sideriis ardescant lumina flamis sudent colorosas et cedat crinibus aurum melea purpurum de promant ora ruborum folgeat ac venerem celesti corpore vincat forma de aurum omnis etc let her be such a one throughout as lucian deciphers in his imagines as euphranor of old painted venus aristinetus describes lais another helena caraclea leucippe lucretia 
Pandora. Let her have a box of beauty to repair herself still, such a one as Venus gave Phaon, when he carried her over the ford. Let her use all helps art and nature can yield. Be like her, and her, and whom thou wilt, or all these in one. A little sickness, a fever, smallpox, wound, scar, loss of an eye or limb, a violent passion, a distemperature of heat or cold, mars all in an instant, disfigures all. Childbearing, old age, that tyrant time will turn Venus to Erinis. Raging time, care, rivels her upon a sudden. After she hath been married a small while, and the black ox hath trodden on her toe, she will be so much altered, and wax out of favour, thou wilt not know her. One grows too fat, another too lean, etc. Modest Matilda, pretty pleasing Peg, sweet singing Susan, mincing Mary Mall, dainty dancing Doll, neat Nancy, jolly Joan, nimble Nell, kissing Kate, bouncing Bess with black eyes, fair Phyllis with fine white hands, fiddling Frank, tall Tib, slender Sib, etc., will quickly lose their grace, grow fulsome, stale, sad, heavy, dull, sour, and all at last out of fashion. Ubi jam vultus argutia, suavis suavitatio, blandus risus, etc. Those fair sparkling eyes will look dull. Her soft coral lips will be pale, dry, cold, rough, and blue. Her skin rugged, that soft and tender superficies will be hard and harsh, her whole complexion change in a moment. And as Matilda writ to King John, I am not now as when thou sawst me last. That favour soon is vanished and past. That rosy blush lapped in a lily veil, now is with more few overgrown and pale. Tis so in the rest, their beauty fades as a tree in winter, which De Janeira hath elegantly expressed in the poet, De forme solis aspicis truncis nemus, Sic nostra longum forma percurrens iter, De perdit aliquid semper, et fulgit minus, Malisque minus est quiquid in nobis fuit, olim petitum cecidit, et partu labat, maturque multum rapuit ex illa mihi, aetas citato senior eripuit gradu. And as a tree that in the green wood grows, with fruit and leaves and in the summer blows, in winter like a stock deformed shows, our beauty takes his race and journey goes, and doth decrease and lose and come to naught, admired of old to this by childbirth brought. And mother hath bereft me of my grace, and crooked old age coining on apace. To conclude with Chrysostom, when thou seest a fair and beautiful person, a brave Bonaroba, a belladonna quae salivam moveat lepidam puellam et quam tu facile ames, a comely woman having bright eyes, a merry countenance, a shining lustre in her look, a pleasant grace wringing thy soul and increasing thy concupiscence. Bethink with thyself that it is but earth thou lovest, a mere excrement which so vexeth thee which thou so admirest and thy raging soul will be at rest take her skin from her face and thou shalt see all loathsomeness under it that beauty is a superficial skin and bones 
nerves, sinews. Suppose her sick, now rivelled, hoary-headed, hollow-cheeked, old. Within she is full of filthy phlegm, stinking, putrid, excremental stuff, snot and snivel in her nostrils, spittle in her mouth, water in her eyes, what filth in her brains, etc. Or take her at best, and look narrowly upon her in the light, stand near her, nearer yet, thou shalt perceive almost as much, and love less, as Cardan well writes, Minus amant qui acute vident, though Scaliger deride him for it. If he see her near, or look exactly at such a posture, whosoever he is, according to the true rules of symmetry and proportion, those I mean of Albertus Durer, Lomatius, and Tasnir, examine him of her. If he be elegans formarum spectator, he shall find many faults in physiognomy and ill color. If form one side of the face likely bigger than the other, or crooked nose, bad eyes, prominent veins, concavities about the eyes, wrinkles, pimples, red streaks, freckles, hairs, warts, knaves, inequalities, roughness, scabredity, paleness, yellowness, and as many colors as are in a turkey-cock's neck, many indecorums in their other parts. Est quod desideres, est quod amputes one leers another frowns a third gapes squints etc and tis true that he saith diligenter consideranti raro facies absoluta et quaevitio caret seldom shall you find an absolute face without fault as i have often observed not in the face alone is this defect or disproportion to be found, but in all the other parts of body and mind. She is fair, indeed, but foolish. Pretty, comely, and decent, of a majestical presence, but, peradventure, imperious, dishonest, acerba, iniqua, self-willed. She is rich, but deformed hath a sweet face but bad carriage no bringing up a rude and wanton flirt a neat body she hath but it is a nasty queen otherwise a very slut of a bad kind as flowers in a garden have colour some but no smell others have a fragrant smell but are unseemly to the eye one is unsavoury to the taste as rue, as bitter as wormwood, and yet a most medicinal cordial flower, most acceptable to the stomach. So are men and women. One is well qualified, but of ill proportion, poor and base. A good eye she hath, but a bad hand and foot. Fede pedes et fede manus a fine leg, bad teeth, a vast body, etc. Examine all parts of body and mind, I advise thee to inquire of all. See her angry, merry, laugh, weep, hot, cold, sick, sullen, dressed, undressed, in all attires, sights, gestures, passions, eat her meals, etc and in some of these you will surely dislike. Yea, not her only let him observe, but her parents, how they carry themselves. For what deformities, defects, encumbrances of body or mind be in them at such an age, they will likely be subject to, be molested in like manner, they will patrezare or matrezare, and withal let him take notice of her companions, in convictu, as Civeric prescribes, 
et quibus cum conversetur, whom she converseth with. Noscitur ex comite, qui non cognoscitur ex se. According to Thucydides, she is commonly the best, de quo minimus foras habetur sermo, that is least talked of abroad. For if she be a noted reveller, a gadder, a singer, a pranker or dancer, then take heed of her. For what saith Theocritus? At vos festivae ne ne saltate puellae, en malus hierus adest in vos saltare paratus. Young men will do it when they come to it. Fawns and satyrs will certainly play reeks when they come in such wanton Bacho's or Eleonora's presence. Now, when they shall perceive any such obliquity, indecency, disproportion, deformity, bad conditions, etc., let them still ruminate on that, and as Haidus adviseth out of Ovid, earum mendas notent, note their faults, vices, errors, and think of their imperfections. Tis the next way to divert and mitigate love's furious headstrong passions. As a peacock's feet and filthy comb, they say, make him forget his fine feathers and pride of his tail. She is lovely, fair, well-favoured, well-qualified, courteous and kind, but if she be not so to me, what care I how kind she be? I say with Philostratus, Formosa aliis mihi superba. She is a tyrant to me, and so let her go. Besides these outward knaves or open faults, errors, there may be many inward infirmities, secret, some private, which I will omit, and some more common to the sex, sullen fits, evil qualities, filthy diseases, in this case fit to be considered. Consideratio feditatis mulierum, menstruae imprimis quam immundae sunt, quam savanarola proponit regula septima penitus observandam, et platina diologus amoris fuse perstringit, Lodovicus bonaxialus, Petrus haedus, Albertus et infiniti fere medici. A lover in Calcagninus's apologies wished with all his heart he were his mistress's ring, to hear, embrace, see, and do I know not what. O oh, thou fool, quoth the ring, if thou wert in my room, thou shouldst hear, observe, and see, pudenda et poenitenda, that which would make thee loathe and hate her, yea, peradventure, all women, for her sake. I will say nothing of the vices of their minds, their pride, envy, inconstancy, weakness, malice, self-will, lightness, insatiable lust, jealousy. Ecclesiasticus 5.14 No malice to a woman's, no bitterness like to hers. Ecclesiastes 7.21 And as the same author urgeth, Proverbs 31.10 Who shall find a virtuous woman? He makes a question of it. Neque ius, neque bonum, neque aequum sciunt, melius, peius, prosit, opsit, nihil vident, nisi quod libido sugerit. They know neither good nor bad, be it better or worse, as the comical poet hath it, beneficial or hurtful, they will do what they list. Insidiae humani generis queremonia vitae, Exuviae noctis, durissima cura die, poena virum, nex et juvenum, etc. 
and to that purpose were they first made as jupiter insinuates in the poet the fire that bold prometheus stole from me with plagues called women shall revenged be on whose alluring and enticing face poor mortals doting shall their death embrace in fine as diogenes concludes in nevisanus nulla est femina quae non habeat quid they have all their faults every each of them hath some vices if one be full of villainy another hath a liquorish eye if one be full of wantonness another is a chideress when leander was drowned the inhabitants of sestos consecrated hero's lantern to anteros anteroti sacrum and he that had good success in his love should light the candle but never any man was found to light it which i can refer to naught but the inconstancy and lightness of women for in a thousand good there is not one all be so proud unthankful and unkind with flinty hearts careless of others moan in their own lusts carried most headlong blind but more herein to speak i am forbidden sometimes for speaking truth one may be chidden i am not willing you see to prosecute the cause against them and therefore take heed you mistake me not matronam nullam ego tango i honour the sex with all good men and as i ought to do rather than displease them i will voluntarily take the oath which mercurius britannicus took me nihil unquam mali nobilissimo sexui vel verbo vel facto machinaturum etc let simonides mantuan platina petrus aretine and such women haters bear the blame if aught be said amiss i have not writ a tenth of that which might be urged out of them and others non possunt invectivae omnes et satirae in feminas scriptae uno volumine comprehendi and that which i have said to speak truth no more concerns them than men though women be more frequently named in this tract to apologize once for all i am neither partial against them or therefore bitter what is said of the one mutato nomine may most part be understood of the other my words are like passus's picture in lucian of whom when a good fellow had bespoke a horse to be painted with his heels upwards tumbling on his back he made him passant now when the fellow came for his piece he was very angry and said it was quite opposite to his mind but passus instantly turned the picture upside down showed him the horse at that sight which he requested and so gave him satisfaction if any man take exception at my words let him alter the name read him for her and tis all one in effect end of section 23section twenty four of the anatomy of melancholy volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by cynthia moyer the anatomy of melancholy volume three by robert burton section twenty four partition three section two member five subsection three part two
but to my purpose if women in general be so bad and men worse than they what a hazard is it to marry where shall a man find a good wife or a woman a good husband a woman a man may eschew but not a wife wedding is undoing some say marrying marring wooing woeing a wife is a fever hectic as scaliger calls her and not be cured but by death as out of menander athenaeus adds in pelaprus te jacis negotiorum non libium non aegeum ubi ex triginta non pereunt tria navigia duceus uxorem servatur prorsus nemo thou wadest into a sea itself of woes in libya and aegean each man knows of thirty not three ships are cast away but on this rock not one escapes i say the worldly cares miseries discontents that accompany marriage i pray you learn of them that have experience for i have none paedas ego logus egensamen libri mentis liberi for my part i'll dissemble with him este procul nymphae fallax genus este puellae vita jugata meo non facit ingenio me juvat etc many married men exclaim at the miseries of it and rail at wives downright i never tried but as i hear some of them say mare haud mare vos mare acerrimum an irish sea is not so turbulent and raging as a litigious wife scula et caribdis sicula contorcens freta minus est timenda nulla non melio fera est scylla and charybdis are less dangerous there is no beast that is so noxious which made the devil belike as most interpreters hold when he had taken away job's goods corporis et fortuna bona health children friends to persecute him the more leave his wicked wife as pineda proves out of tertullian cyprian austin chrysostom prosper gaudentius etc ut novum calamitatis inde genus viro existeret to vex and gall him worse quam totus infernus than all the fiends in hell as knowing the conditions of a bad woman jupiter non tribuit homini pestilentius malum saith simonides better dwell with a dragon or a lion than keep house with a wicked wife ecclesiasticus twenty five eighteen better dwell in a wilderness proverba twenty one nineteen no wickedness like to her ecclesiasticus twenty five twenty two she makes a sorry heart an heavy countenance a wounded mind weak hands and feeble knees verse twenty five a woman and death are two the bitterest things in the world uxor mihi ducenda est hodie id mihi visus est dicere abidomum et suspende te terence andrea one five and yet for all this we bachelors desire to be married with that vestal virgin we long for it felices nuptae moriar nisi nubere dulce est tis the sweetest thing in the world i would i had a wife saith he for fain would i leave a single life if i could get me a good wife hi ho for a husband cries she a bad husband nay the worst that ever was is better than none o oh, blissful marriage o oh, most welcome marriage and happy are they that are so coupled we do earnestly seek it and are never well till we have effected it
but with what fate like those birds in the emblem that fed about a cage so long as they could fly away at their pleasure liked well of it but when they were taken and might not get loose though they had the same meat pined away for sullenness and would not eat so we commend marriage donec miseli liberi aspicmis dominam sed postquam hiu janua clausa est fel intus est quod mel fuit so long as we are wooers may kiss and call at our pleasure nothing is so sweet we are in heaven as we think but when we are once tied and have lost our liberty marriage is an hell give me my yellow hose again a mouse in a trap lives as merrily we are in a purgatory some of us if not hell itself dulce bellum in expertis as the proverb is tis fine talking of war and marriage sweet in contemplation till it be tried and then as wars are most dangerous irksome every minute at death's door so is etc when those wild irish peers saith stanahurst were feasted by king henry the second at what time he kept his christmas at dublin and had tasted of his prince-like cheer generous wines dainty fare had seen his massy plate of silver gold enamelled beset with jewels golden candlesticks goodly rich hangings brave furniture heard his trumpets sound fifes drums and his exquisite music in all kinds when they had observed his majestical presence as he sat in purple robes crowned with his sceptre etc in his royal seat the poor men were so amazed enamoured and taken with the object that they were pertaisi domestici et pristini tirotarchi as weary and ashamed of their own sordidity and manner of life they would all be english forthwith who but english but when they had now submitted themselves and lost their former liberty they began to rebel some of them others repent of what they had done when it was too late tis so with us bachelors when we see and behold those sweet faces those gaudy shows that women make observe their pleasant gestures and graces give ear to their siren tunes see them dance etc we think their conditions are as fine as their faces we are taken with dumb signs in amplexum ruimus we rave we burn and would fain be married but when we feel the miseries cares woes that accompany it we make our moan many of us cry out at length and cannot be released if this be true now as some out of experience will inform us farewell wiving for my part and as the comical poet merrily saith perdatur ille pessime qui feminam duxit secundus nam nihil primo imprecor ignarus ut puto mali primus fuit foul fall him that brought the second match to pass the first i wish no harm poor man alas he knew not what he did nor what it was what shall i say to him that marries again and again stulta maritali qui porigit ora capistro i pity him not for the first time he must do as he may bear it out sometimes by the head and shoulders and let his next neighbour ride or else run away or as that syracusian in a tempest when all ponderous things were to be exonerated out of the ship quia maximum pondus erat fling his wife into the sea but this i confess is comically spoken and so i pray you take it in sober sadness 
marriage is a bondage a thraldom a yoke a hindrance to all good enterprises he hath married a wife and cannot come a stop to all preferments a rock on which many are saved many impinge and are cast away not that the thing is evil in itself or troublesome but full of all contentment and happiness one of the three things which please god when a man and his wife agree together an honourable and happy estate who knows it not if they be sober wise honest as the poet infers sicomodos nan ciscantur amores nullamiis abes voluptatis genus if fitly matched be man and wife no pleasures wanting to their life but to undiscreet sensual persons that as brutes are wholly led by sense it is a feral plague many times a hell itself and can give little or no content being that they are often so irregular and prodigious in their lusts so diverse in their affections uxor nomen dignitatis non voluptatis as he said a wife is a name of honour not of pleasure she is fit to bear the office govern a family to bring up children sit at a board's end and carve as some carnal men think and say they had rather go to the stews or have now and then a snatch as they can come by it borrow of their neighbours than have wives of their own except they may as some princes and great men do keep as many courtesans as they will themselves fly out impune per molere uxores alienas that polygamy of turks lex julia which caesar once enforced in rome though levinus torentius and others suspect it uti uxores quot esquas velent liceret that every great man might marry and keep as many wives as he would or irish divorcement were in use but as it is tis hard and gives not that satisfaction to these carnal men beastly men as too many are what still the same to be tied to one be she never so fair never so virtuous is a thing they may not endure to love one long say thy pleasure and counterfeit as thou wilt as parmeno told thais neque tu uno eris contenta one man will never please thee nor one woman many men but as pan replied to his father mercury when he asked whether he was married nequaquam pater amator enim sum etc no father no i am a lover still and cannot be contented with one woman pythias echo menades and i know not how many besides were his mistresses he might not abide marriage varietas delectat tis loathsome and tedious what one still which the satirist said of iberina is verified in most unus iberinae vir sufficit ocius illud extorquibis ut haec oculo contentasit uno tis not one man will serve her by her will as soon she'll have one eye as one man still as capable of any impression as materia prima itself that still desires new forms like the sea their affections ebb and flow husband is a cloak for some to hide their villainy once married she may fly out at her pleasure the name of husband is a sanctuary to make all good eo ventum saith seneca ut nulla virum habeat nisi ut irritet adulterum they are right and straight as true trojans as mine host's daughter that spanish wench in ariosto as good wives as messalina 
many men are as constant in their choice and as good husbands as nero himself they must have their pleasure of all they see and are in a word far more fickle than any woman for either they be full of jealousy or masterful or lovin novelty good men have often ill wives as bad as xanthippa was to socrates elvora to st louis isabella to our edward the second and good wives are as often matched to ill husbands as mariamne to herod serena to diocletian theodora to theophilus and tyra to germunde but i will say nothing of dissolute and bad husbands of bachelors and their vices their good qualities are a fitter subject for a just volume too well known already in every village town and city they need no blazon and lest i should mar any matches or dishearten loving maids for this present i will let them pass being that men and women are so irreligious depraved by nature so wandering in their affections so brutish so subject to disagreement so unobservant of marriage rites what shall i say if thou beest such a one or thou light on such a wife what concord can there be what hope of agreement tis not conjugium but conjurgium as the reed and fern in the emblem averse and opposite in nature tis twenty to one thou wilt not marry to thy contentment but as in a lottery forty blanks were drawn commonly for one prize out of a multitude you shall hardly choose a good one a small ease hence then little comfort nec integrum unquam transiges laetus diem if he or she be such a one thou hadst much better be alone if she be barren she is not etc if she have children and thy state be not good though thou be wary and circumspect thy charge will undo thee fecunda domum tibi prole gravabit thou wilt not be able to bring them up and what greater misery can there be than to beget children to whom thou canst leave no other inheritance but hunger and thirst cum fames dominatur studident voces rogantium panem penetrantes patris cor what so grievous as to turn them up to the wide world to shift for themselves no plague like to want and when thou hast good means and art very careful of their education they will not be ruled think but of that old proverb heroon tecna pemata heroum filii noxai great men's sons seldom do well o utinam aut celebs mansissem aut prole carerum would that i had either remained single or not had children augustus exclaims in suetonius jacob had his reuben simeon and levi david an amnon an absalom adoniah wise men's sons are commonly fools insomuch that spartian concludes neminem prope magnorum virorum optimum et utilem reliquisse filium they had been much better to have been childless tis too common in the middle sort thy son's a drunkard a gamester a spendthrift thy daughter a fool a whore thy servants lazy drones and thieves thy neighbours devils they will make thee weary of thy life if thy wife be froward when she may not have her will thou hadst better be buried alive she will be so impatient raving still and roaring like juno in the tragedy there's nothing but tempests all is in an uproar if she be soft and foolish 
thou wert better have a block, she will shame thee and reveal thy secrets. If wise and learned, well qualified, there is as much danger on the other side. Mulierum doctam ducere periculosissimum, saith Nevisanus, she will be too insolent and peevish. Malo venusinam quam te cornelia mater. Take heed, if she be a slut, thou wilt loathe her. If proud, she'll beggar thee, so she'll spend thy patrimony in baubles. All Arabia will not serve to perfume her hair, saith Lucian. If fair and wanton, she'll make thee a cornuto. If deformed, she will paint. If her face be filthy by nature, she will mend it by art. Alienis et ad scitiis imposturis, which who can endure? If she do not paint, she will look so filthy thou canst not love her, and that peradventure will make thee dishonest. Cromerus, Book Twelve, Histories, relates of Casimirus, that he was unchaste because his wife, Alida, the daughter of Henry, Landgrave of Hesse, was so deformed. If she be poor, she brings beggary with her, saith Nevisanus, misery and discontent. If you marry a maid, it is uncertain how she proves. Haec for san veniet non satis apta tibi. If young, she is likely wanton and untaught, if lusty, to lascivious, and if she be not satisfied, you know where and when. Nil nisi jurgia. All is in an uproar, and there is little quietness to be had. If an old maid, tis a hazard she dies in childbed. If a rich widow, induces te in laqueum, thou dost halter thyself, she will make all away beforehand to her other children, etc. Dominam quis posset fere tonantem? She will hit thee still in the teeth with her first husband. If a young widow, she is often insatiable and immodest. If she be rich, well descended, bring a great dowry, or be nobly allied, Thy wife's friends will eat thee out of house and home. Dives ruinam aedibus inducit. She will be so proud, so high-minded, so imperious. For nihil est magis intolerabile dite. There is nothing so intolerable. Thou shalt be as the tassel of a goshawk. She will ride upon thee, domineer as she list wear the breeches in her oligarchical government, and beggar thee besides. Uxores divites servitutem exigunt, as Seneca hits them. Declamations, Book 2, Declamation 6. Dota macepi imperium perdidi. They will have sovereignty, pro coniuge dominum arcesis. They will have attendance. They will do what they list. In taking a dowry thou losest thy liberty. Dos intrat libertas exit. Hazardest thine estate. Hai sunt atque aliae multa in magnis dotibus, in commoditates sumptusque intolerabiles, etc. With many such inconveniences. Say the best, she is a commanding servant. Thou hadst better have taken a good housewife maid in her smock. Since then there is such hazard, if thou be wise, keep thyself as thou art. Tis good to match, much better to be free. Procreare liberos lepidissimum, hercle vero libero messe id molto est lepidius. Art thou young, then match not yet if old, match not at all. Vis juenis nubere, non dum venit tempus, in gravescente aetate jam tempus praeteriit. 
and therefore with that philosopher still make answer to thy friends that importune thee to marry ad hoc impentestivum tis yet unseasonable and ever will be consider withal how free how happy how secure how heavenly in respect a single man is as he said in the comedy et isti quod fortunatum esse autumant uxorem nunquam habui and that which all my neighbours admire and applaud me for account so great a happiness i never had a wife consider how contentedly quietly neatly plentifully sweetly and how merrily he lives he hath no man to care for but himself none to please no charge none to control him is tied to no residence no cure to serve may go and come when whither live where he will his own master and do what he list himself consider the excellency of virgins virgo calum meruit marriage replenisheth the earth but virginity paradise elias eliseus john baptist were bachelors virginity is a precious jewel a fair garland a never fading flower for why was daphne turned to a green bay tree but to show that virginity is immortal ut flos inceptis secretus nascitur hortis ignotus pecori nullo contusus aratro quam mulcant aurae firmat sol educat imber etc sic virgo dum intacta manet dum cara suis sed cum castum amisit etc virginity is a fine picture as bonaventure calls it a blessed thing in itself and if you will believe a papist meritorious and although there be some inconveniences irksomeness solitariness etc incident to such persons want of those comforts quae aegro assideat et curet aegrotum fomentum paret roget medicum etc embracing dalliance kissing calling etc those furious motives and wanton pleasures a new married wife most part enjoys yet they are but toys in respect easily to be endured if conferred to those frequent encumbrances of marriage solitariness may be otherwise avoided with mirth music good company business employment in a word gaudebit minus et minus dolebit for their good nights he shall have good days and methinks some time or other amongst so many rich bachelors a benefactor should be found to build a monastical college for old decayed deformed or discontented maids to live together in that have lost their first loves or otherwise miscarried or else are willing howsoever to lead a single life the rest i say are toys in respect and sufficiently recompensed by those innumerable contents and incomparable privileges of virginity think of these things confer both lives and consider last of all these commodious prerogatives a bachelor hath how well he is esteemed how heartily welcome to all his friends quam mentitis obsequiis as tertullian observes with what counterfeit courtesies they will adore him follow him present him with gifts humatis donis it cannot be believed saith ammianus with what humble service he shall be worshipped how loved and respected if he want children and have means he shall be often invited attended on by princes and have advocates to plead his cause for nothing as plutarch adds wilt thou then be reverenced and had in estimation dominus tamen et domini rex si tu vis fieri nullus tibi parvulus aula 
luserit aeneas nec filia dulcior illa jucundum et carum steriles facit uxor amicum live a single man marry not and thou shalt soon perceive how those hieradipitae for so they were called of old will seek after thee bribe and flatter thee for thy favour to be thine heir or executor aruntius and aterius those famous parasites in this kind as tacitus and seneca have recorded shall not go beyond them periplectomenes that good personate old man delicium senis well understood this in plautus for when Pleucides exhorted him to marry that he might have children of his own, he readily replied in this sort, Quando habeo multos cognatos quid opus mihi sit liberis, nunc bene vivo et fortunate, atque animo ut lubet, mea bona mea morte cognatis dicam interpartiant, ilia pud me edunt me curant, visunt quid agam et quid velim, qui mihi mitunt munera ad prandium ad canem vocant whilst i have kin what need i brats to have now i live well and as i will most brave and when i die my goods i'll give away to them that do invite me every day that visit me and send me pretty toys and strive who shall do me most courtesies this respect thou shalt have in like manner living as he did a single man but if thou marry once cogitato in omni vita te servum fore bethink thyself what a slavery it is what a heavy burden thou shalt undertake how hard a task thou art tied to for as hierom hath it qui uxorum habet debitor est et uxoris servus alligatus and how continue it what squalor attends it what irksomeness what charges for wife and children are a perpetual bill of charges beside a myriad of cares miseries and troubles for as that comical plautus merrily and truly said he that wants trouble must get to be master of a ship or marry a wife and as another seconds him wife and children have undone me so many and such infinite encumbrances accompany this kind of life furthermore uxor in tumuit etc or as he said in the comedy duxi uxorem quam ibi miseriam vidi nati filii alea cura all gifts and invitations cease no friend will esteem thee and thou shalt be compelled to lament thy misery and make thy moan with bartholomeus shereus that famous poet laureate and professor of hebrew in wittenberg i had finished this work long since but that inter alia dura et tristia quae misero mihi penetericum fregeront i use his own words amongst many miseries which almost broke my back suzugia op chantipismum a shrew to my wife tormented my mind above measure and beyond the rest so shalt thou be compelled to complain and to cry out at last with foraneus the lawyer how happy had i been if i had wanted a wife if this which i have said will not suffice see more in lemnius book four chapter thirteen de occulta natura miracula espincaeus de continentia book six chapter eight cornman de virginitate platina in amores dialogus practica artis amandi Barbarus de re uxoria arnesaios in politicae chapter three and him that is in star omnium nevisanus the lawyer silva nuptial almost in every page end of section twenty four
Section 25 The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April Gonzalez. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3, by Robert Burton. Section 25. Partition 3, Section 2, Member 5, Subsection 4. Filters, Magical and Poetical Cures. Where preservations and other remedies will not take place, many fly to unlawful means. Filters, amulets, magic spells, ligatures, characters, charms, which are so worn with the spare vatulis, so made and caused, must so be cured. If forced by spells and filters, saith Paracelsus, it must be eased by characters and by incantations. Fenelius, Skenkius, Book 4, Observationes Medicae, has some examples of such have been so magically caused and magically cured, and by witchcraft, so said Baptista Codroncus, Book 3, Chapter 9, De Morbis, Venereis, Malius Maleficarum, Chapter 6. It is not permitted to be done. I confess, yet often attempted. See more, Beerus, Book 3, Chapter 18, Del Rio, Cardan, Book 16, Chapter 90, recounts of many magnetical medicines, as to piss through a ring, etc. Miseldu Centuria, 3, 30, Baptista Porta, Jason Pratensis, Labellius, Matthiolus, etc. Prescribe many absurd remedies. Radix Mandragora, Ebibitae, Anuli ex ungulis asini, estericus amatae sub cervical, positum, ila nesiente, etc., cum odorem feditati sentit, amor solvitur, noctue ocum abstemius facit comestum, ex consilio jarte, indorum gymnosophiste, apud philostratum, liber tres, sangis amasie, ebibitus omnem amoris, sensum tolit, Faustina Marci Aureli Oxorem, Latiatoris Amore Captam, Ita Penitus Concilio Chaldiorum Liberatam, Refert Julius Capitolinus. Some of our astrologers will affect as much by characteristical images, Exigilis Hermetis, Salomonis, Caelis, etc., Mulieris Imago Habentis, Crines Parsos, etc., our old poets and fantastical writers have many fabulous remedies for such a lovesick. As that of Potesilaus Tomb in Philostratus, in his dialogue with Phoenix and Vinitor. Vinitor, upon occasion discoursing with the rare virtues of that shrine, telleth him that Potesilaus, altar, and tomb cures almost all manner of diseases, consumptions, dropsies, cuts and agues, sore eyes. And amongst the rest, such as a lovesick, shall there be help. But the most famous is Lucata Petra, that renowned rock in Greece, of which Strabo writes, Geographiae Libertem. Not far from St. Maurice, it sounds, Book 1. If any lover flung himself down headlong, he was instantly cured. Venus after the death of Adonis, when she could take no rest for love, cum visana sua toreret flama medulas, came to the temple of Apollo to know what she should do to be eased of her pain. Apollo sent her to Lucata Petra, where she precipitated herself and was fought with freed. And when she would need to know of him a reason of it, he told her again that he had observed Jupiter, when he was enamoured by Juno, Tithe to go east and wash himself, and after divers others. Cephalus with the love of Pratella, Digonetta's daughter leaped down here, that a lesbian Sappho, for found, on whom she miserably doted, Cupidinis aisro persita is sumo preceps ruit. Hoping thus to ease herself, and to be freed of her love pangs. Hic se de caulion perei so sensus amore. Mercit et elaiso corpore presit aquas. Nec mora, fugit amor, etc. Hider de caulion came, when Fira's love tormented him, and leapt down to the sea, and had no harm at all. But by and by, his love is gone and chased caught away. This medicine Josephus Scaliger speaks of, Alsoniarum Lectionum, Book 18, Salmos and other writers, Pliny reports that amongst the Saezini, 
There is a well consecrated to Cupid, of which at any lover taste his passion is mitigated, and Anthony Vidurio saith that amongst the ancients there was a more lethus. He took burning torches and extinguished them in river. His statute was to be seen in the temple of Venus Eleusina, of which Ovid makes mention, and said that all lovers of old went tither to pilgrimage. They would be rid of their love pangs. Posanias, in Phocesis, writes of a temple dedicated Veneri in Espelunca, to Venus in the vault, at Nopactus in Achaia, now Lepanto, in which your widows that would have second husbands made their supplications to the goddess. All manner of his concerning lovers were commenced, and their grievances helped. The same author, in Achaises, tells as much of the river Senelus in Greece. If any lover wash himself in it, by secret virtue of that water, by reason of extreme coldness the like, he was healed, of love's torments. Amoris vulnus idem qui sanat facit, which if it be so, that water, as he holds, is omne auro pretiosior, better than any gold. Where none of these remedies will take place, I know no other that all lovers must make ahead and rebel, as they did in Ausonius, and crucify Cupid till he grant the request, or satisfy the desires. End of section 25. Recording by April Gonzalez in Cavita, Philippines. Section 26 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3, by Robert Burton. Section 26. Partition 3, Section 2, Member 5, Subsection 5, Part 1. The last and best cure of love melancholy is to let them have their desire. The last refuge and surest remedy to be put in practice in the utmost place, when no other means will take effect, is to let them go together and enjoy one another. Potissima cura est ut heros amasia sua potiatur, saith Guenerius, Capitum 15, Tract 15. Esculapius himself to this malady cannot invent a better remedy. Quam ut amanti cedat amatum. Jason pretenses, than that a lover has his desire. Et pariter torulo bini jungantur in uno, et pulcho detur enee lavinia conjux. And let them both be joined in a bed, and let Aeneas fair lavinia wed. Tis the special cure, to let them bleed in vena himancea, for love is a pleurisy, and if it be possible, so let it be. Optataque Gaudia Carpant. Arculanus holds it the speediest and the best cure. Tis Savonarola's last precept, a principal infallible remedy, the last, sole, and safest refuge. Julia sola poles nostras extinguere flammas, non nive, nun glacie, set potes igne pari. Julia alone can quench my desire, with neither ice nor snow, but with like fire. When you have all done, saith Avicenna, there is no speedier or safer course than to join the parties together according to their desires and wishes, the custom and form of law, and so we have seen him quickly restored to his former health, that was languished away to skin and bones. After his desire was satisfied, his discontent ceased, and we thought it strange. Our opinion is therefore that in such cases nature is to be obeyed. Eretius, an old author, Book Three, Chapter Three, had an instance of a young man, when no other means could prevail, was so speedily relieved. What remains then but to join them in marriage? Tunc et basia, morsiunculasque, sureptim dare, mutios fovere, amplexus licet et licet iocari. They may then kiss and call, lie and look babies in one another's eyes, as heir sires before them did, they may then satiate themselves with love's pleasures, which they have so long wished and expected. Atque una simul in toro quiescant, conjuncto simul ore suvientur, et somnos agitent 
quiete in una. Yea, but hic labor hoc opus, this cannot conveniently be done by reason of many and several impediments. Sometimes both parties themselves are not agreed. Parents, tutors, masters, guardians will not give consent. Laws, customs, statutes hinder. Poverty, superstition, fear and suspicion. Many men dote on one woman, semul et simul. She dotes as much on him or them, and in modesty must not, cannot woo, as unwilling to confess as willing to love. She dare not make it known, show her affection or speak her mind. And hard is the choice, as it is in Euphius, when one is compelled either by silence to die with grief, or by speaking to live with shame. In this case almost was the fair lady Elizabeth, Edward the Fourth, his daughter, when she was enamoured on Henry the Seventh, that noble young prince and new saluted king, when she broke forth into that passionate speech, Oh, that I were worthy of that comely prince, but my father being dead, I want friends to motion such a matter. What shall I say? I am all alone, and dare not open my mind to any. What if I acquaint my mother with it? Bashfulness forbids. What if some of the lords? Audacity wants. Oh, that I might but confer with him, perhaps in discourse I might slip such a word that might discover mine intention. How many modest maids may this concern? I am a poor servant, what shall I do? I am a fatherless child, and want means. I am blithe and buxom, young and lusty, but I have never a suitor. Expectant stolidi ut ego illos rogatum veniam, as she said. A company of silly fellows look belike that I should woo them and speak first. Fain they would and cannot woo. Que primum exordia sumam. Being merely passive, they may not make suit, with many such lets and inconveniences, which I know not. What shall we do in such a case? Sing fortune my foe? Some are so curious in this behalf, as those old Romans, our modern Venetians, Dutch and French, that if two parties clearly love, the one noble, the other ignoble, they may not by their laws match, though equal otherwise in years, fortunes, education, and all good affection. In Germany, except they can prove their gentility by three descents, they scorn to match with them. A nobleman must marry a noble woman, a baron a baron's daughter, a knight a knight's a gentleman, a gentleman's. As slaters sort their slates, do they degrees and families. If she be never so rich, fair, well qualified otherwise, they will make him forsake her. The Spaniards abhor all widows, the Turks repute them old women, if past five and twenty. But these are too severe laws and strict customs. Dandum aliquid amori. We are all the sons of Adam. Tis opposite to nature, it ought not to be so. Again, he loves her most impotently, she loves not him, and so a contra. Pan loved Echo, Echo Satyrus, Satyrus Lida. Quantum ipsorum aliquis amantem oderat, tantum ipsius amans odiosus erat. They love and loathe of all sorts, he loves her, she hates him, and is loathed of him on whom she dotes. Cupid hath two darts, one to force love, all of gold, and that sharp, quod facet auratum est, another blunt of lead, and that to hinder. Fugat hoc, facet illut amorem. This dispels, that creates love. This we see too often verified in our common experience. Choresus dearly loved that virgin, Calirue, but the more he loved her, the more she hated him. Enone loved Paris, but he rejected her. They are stiff of all sides, as if beauty were therefore created to undo, or be undone. I give her all attendance, all observance, I pray and entreat. Alma precor miserere me, fair mistress pity me, I spend myself, my time, friends and fortunes, to win her favour, as he complains in the o'clock. I lament, sigh, weep, and make my moan to her, but she is hard as flint, Cautibus is mariis immotior, as fair and hard as a diamond, she will not respect, despectus tibi sum, or hear me, fugit illa vocantem, nil lacrimas miserata meas, nil flexa querilis. What shall I do? I wooed her as a young man should do, but, sir, she said, I love not you. Durior scopulis mea coelia, marmore, 
ferro, robore, rupe, antro, cornu, adamante, gelu, rock, marble, hard of oak with iron barred, frost, flint, or adamants are not so hard. I give, I bribe, I send presents, but they are refused. Rusticus est corridon, nec munera curat Alexis. I protest, I swear, I weep. Odioque rependit amores, irisu lacrimas. She neglects me for all this, she derides me, contemns me, she hates me. Philida flouts me, caute feris, quer cudurior uridice, stiff, churlish, rocky still. And is most true, many gentlewomen are so nice, they scorn all suitors, crucify their poor paramours, and think nobody good enough for them, as dainty to please as Daphne herself. Multi illum petiere, illa aspernate petentes, nec quid hymen, quid amor, quid sint conubia curat. Many did woo her, but she scorned them still, and said she would not marry by her will. One while they will not marry, as they say at least, when as they intend nothing less. Another while not yet, when is their only desire, they rave upon it. She will marry at last, but not him. He is a proper man indeed, and well qualified, but he wants means. Another of her suitors hath good means, but he wants wit. One is too old, another too young, too deformed, she likes not his carriage. A third too loosely given, he is rich, but base-born. She will be a gentlewoman, a lady, as her sister is, as her mother is. She is all out as fair, as well brought up, hath as good a portion, and she looks for as good a match as Matilda or Dorinda. If not, she is resolved as yet to tarry, so apt are young maids to boggle at every object, so soon won or lost with every toy, so quickly diverted, so hard to be pleased. In the meantime, quod torsit amantis, one suitor pines away, languisheth in love, mori quod denique cogit, another sighs and grieves, she cares not, and which Sirosa objected to Ariadne. Nec magis oreali gemitu, lacrimisque moveris, quam preca turbati flectitur ora sati. Tu juvenem co non formosior alter in urbe, spernis et insano cogis amore mori, is no more moved with those sad sighs and tears of her sweetheart than raging sea with prayers. Thou scornst the fairest youth in all our city, and makest him almost mad for love to die. They take a pride to prank up themselves, to make young men enamored. Captare viros et spernere capias, to dote on them, and to run mad for their sakes. Set nullis illa movetur flitibus, aut voces ullas tractabilis audit. Whilst niggardly their favours they discover, they love to be beloved, yet scorn the lover. All suit and service is too little for them, presence too base. Tormentis gaudet amantis et spoliis. As Atalanta, they must be overrun or not won. Many young men are as obstinate and as curious in their choice, as tyrannically proud, insulting, deceitful, false-hearted, as irrefragable and peevish on the other side, Narcissus like multi illum juvenis multi petiere puele set fuit in tenera tam dira superbia forma nulli illum juvenis nullas petiere puele young man and maids did to him sue but in his youth so proud so coy was he young man and maids bade him adieu echo wept and wooed him by all means above the rest love me for pity or pity me for love but he was obstinate. Ante ait emuriar quam sit tibi copia nostri. He would rather die than give consent. Psyche ran whining after Cupid. Formosum tua te Psyche, formosa requirit, et poscit te dia deum, purumque puella. Fair Cupid, thy fair Psyche to thee sues, a lovely lass of fine young gallant woos. But he rejected her nevertheless. Thus many lovers do hold out so long, doting on themselves, stand in their own light, till in the end they come to be scorned and rejected, as Trosas Gargiliana was. Te juvenes te odere sinus, te zertaque langues, que fueras procerum publica cura prius. 
Both young and old do hate thee scorned now, that once was all their joy and comfort too. As Narcissus was himself, who, despising many, died ere he could enjoy the love of any. They begin to be contempt themselves of others, as he was of his shadow, and take up with a poor curate, or an old serving-man at last, that might have had their choice of right good matches in their youth, like that generous mare in Plutarch, which would admit of none but great horses, but when her tail was cut off and mane shorn close, and she now saw herself so deformed in the water when she came to drink, ab asino conscendi se passa, she was contented at last to be covered by an ass. Yet this is a common humour, will not be left and cannot be helped. Hanc volo que non vult, ilam que vult ego nolo, vincere vult animos non satiare venus. I love a maid, she loves me not, full fain, she would have me, but I not her again. So love to crucify men's souls is bent, but seldom doth it please or give consent. There love danceth in a ring, and Cupid hunts them round about, he dotes, is doted on again. Dumque petit petitur, pariterque accedit et ardet. Their affection cannot be reconciled. Oftentimes they may and will not. Tis their own foolish proceedings that mars all. They are too distrustful of themselves, too soon dejected. Say she be rich, thou poor, she young, thou old, she lovely and fair, thou most ill-favoured and deformed, she noble, thou base, she spruce and fine, but thou an ugly clown. Nil desperandum, there's hope enough yet. Mopso nisadator, quit non speremus amantes. Put thyself forward once more, as unlikely matches have been and are daily made. See what will be the event. Many leave roses and gather thistles, loathe honey and love virtues. Our likings are as various as our palates. But commonly they omit opportunities, oscula qui sumsit, etc. They neglect the usual means and times. He that will not when he may, when he will he shall have nay. They look to be wooed, sought after, and sued to. Most part they will and cannot, either for the above-named reasons, or for that there is a multitude of suitors equally enamoured, doting all alike, and where one alone must speed, what shall become of the rest? Hero was beloved of many, but one did enjoy her. Penelope had a company of suitors, yet all missed of their aim. In such cases he or they must wisely and warily unwind themselves, unsettle his affections by those rules above prescribed. Quinstultos excutit ignis, divert his cogitations, or else bravely bear it out, as Turnus did, to asit Lavinia conjux, when he could not get her, with a kind of heroical scorn he bid Aeneas take her, or with a milder farewell let her go. Et filida solus habito. Take her to you, God give you joy, sir. The fox in the emblem would eat no grapes, but why? Because he could not get them. Care not then for that which may not be had. Many such inconveniences, lets and hindrances there are, which cross their projects and crucify poor lovers, which sometimes may, sometimes again cannot be so easily removed. But put case they be reconciled all, agreed hitherto. Suppose this love or good liking be between two alone, both parties well pleased, there is mutuus amor, mutual love and great affection, yet their parents, guardians, tutors, cannot agree, thence all is dashed, the match is unequal, one rich, another poor, durus pater, a hard-hearted, unnatural, a covetous father, will not marry his son, except he have so much money, ita in aurum omnes insaniunt, as Chrysostom notes, nor join his daughter in marriage to save her dowry, or for that he cannot spare her for the service she doth him, and is resolved to part with nothing whilst he lives, not a penny, though he may peradventure well give it, he will not till he dies, and then as a pot of money broke, it is divided amongst them that gaped after it so earnestly. Or else he wants means to set her out, he hath no money, and though it be to the manifest prejudice of her body and soul's health, he cares not, he will take no notice of it, she must and shall tarry. Many slack and careless parents, iniqui patris, measure their children's affections by their own, 
they are now cold and decrepit themselves past all such youthful conceits and they will therefore starve their children's genus have them a pueris illico nasci senes they must not marry nec earum affines esse rerum quas secum fert adolescentia ex sua libidne moderator que est nunc non que olim fuit as he said in the comedy they will stifle nature their young bloods must not participate of youthful pleasures but be as they are themselves old on a sudden and is a general fault amongst most parents in bestowing of their children the father wholly respects wealth when through his folly riot indiscretion he hath embezzled his estate to recover himself he confines and prostitutes his eldest son's love and affection to some fool or ancient or deformed piece for money Fanaretae ducet filiam rufam ilam virginem caesiam sparso ore adunco naso and though his son utterly dislike with clitipho in the comedy non possum pater if she be rich ea he replies at elegans est credas animum ibi esse he must and shall have her she is fair enough young enough if he look or hope to inherit his lands he shall marry not when or whom he loves Arconidis huius filium, but whom his father commands, when and where he likes, his affection must dance attendance upon him. His daughter is in the same predicament, forsooth, as an empty boat. She must carry what, where, when, and whom her father will. So that in these businesses the father is still for the best advantage. Now the mother respects good kindred, must part the son a proper woman. All which Livy exemplifies a gentleman and a yeoman wooed a wench in rome contrary to that statute that the gentry and commonalty must not match together the matter was controverted the gentleman was preferred by the mother's voice que quam splendissimis nuptis jungi puellam volebat the overseer stood for him that was most worth etc but parents ought not to be so strict in this behalf beauty is a dowry of itself all sufficient virgo formosa et si opido pauper abunde dotata est rachel was so married to jacob and bonaventure in four cent denies that he so much as venially sins that marries a maid for comeliness of person the jews the geronimus twenty one eleven if they saw amongst the captives a beautiful woman some small circumstances observed might take her to wife they should not be too severe in that kind especially if there be no such urgent occasion or grievous impediment it is good for commonwealth plato holds that in their contracts young men should never avoid the affinity of poor folks or seek after rich poverty and base parentage may be sufficiently recompensed by many other good qualities modesty virtue religion and choice bringing up i am poor i confess but am i therefore contemptible and an abject love itself is naked the graces the stars and hercules clad in a lion's skin give something to virtue love wisdom favour beauty person be not all for money besides you must consider that at amor cogi non potest love cannot be compelled they must affect as they may fatum est in partibus illis quas sinus abscondit as the saying is marriage and hanging goes by destiny matches are made in heaven it lies not in our power to love or hate, for will in us is overruled by fate. A servant maid in Aristinetus loved her mistress's minion, which, when her dame perceived, furiosa emulatione, in a jealous humour, she dragged her about the house by the hair of the head, and vexed her sore. The wench cried out, O oh, mistress, fortune hath made my body your servant, but not my soul. Affections are free, not to be commanded. Moreover, it may be to restrain their ambition, pride, and covetousness, to correct those hereditary diseases of a family. God in his just judgment assigns and permits such matches to be made. For I am of Plato and Bodine's mind, that families have their bounds and periods as well as kingdoms, beyond which, for extent or continuance, they shall not exceed six or seven hundred years, as they there illustrate by a multitude of examples, and which Poker and melancton approve but in a perpetual tenor as we see by many pedigrees of knights gentlemen yeomen continue as they began for many descents with little alteration 
Howsoever let them, I say, give something to youth, to love, they must not think they can fancy whom they appoint. Amor enim non imperatur, affectus liber si quis alius et vices exigens. This is a free passion, as Pliny said in a panegyric of his, and may not be forced. Love craves liking, as the saying is, it requires mutual affections, a correspondency. Invito non datur nec aufertur. It may not be learned. Ovid himself cannot teach us how to love. Solomon describe, a palace paint, or Helen express it. They must not therefore compel or intrude. Quis enim, as Fabius urgeth, amar alieno animo potest. But consider with all the miseries of enforced marriages, take pity upon youth and such above the rest as have daughters to bestow, should be very careful and provident to marry them in due time. Seracidus, chapter 7, verse 25, calls it a weighty matter to perform, so to marry a daughter to a man of understanding in due time. Virginis enim tempestive locandae, as Lemnius admonisheth, book 1, chapter 6. Virgins must be provided for in season, to prevent many diseases, of which Rodericus a Castro de Morbis Mulierum, Book Two, Chapter Three, and Lot Mercatus, Book Two, De Mulier Effect, Chapter Four, De Melancholia Virginum et Viduarum, have both largely discoursed. And therefore, as well to avoid these feral maladies, it is good to get them husbands betimes, as to prevent some other gross inconveniences, and for a thing that I know besides. Ubi nuptiarum tempus et aetis ad venerit, as Chrysostom adviseth, let them not defer it. They perchance will marry themselves else, or do worse. If Nevisanus the lawyer do not impose, they may do it by right, for as he proves out of Curtius and some other civilians, Silve, Book 2, Number 30, a maid past twenty-five years of age, against her parents' consent, may marry such a one as is unworthy of and inferior to her, and her father by law must be compelled to give her a competent dowry. Mistake me not in the meantime, or think that I do apologize here for any headstrong, unruly, wanton flirts. I do approve that of St. Ambrose, commentary in Genesis 24:51, which he hath written touching Rebecca's spousals. A woman should give unto her parents the choice of her husband, lest she be reputed to be malapert and wanton, if she take upon her to make her own choice, for she should rather seem to be desired by a man than to desire a man herself. To those hard parents alone I retort that of Curtius, in the behalf of modester maids, that are too remiss and careless of their due time and riper years, for if they tarry longer, to say truth, they are past date, and nobody will respect them. A woman with us in Italy, says Aretine's Lucretia, twenty-four years of age, is old already, past the best, of no account. An old fellow, as Ligistrata confesseth in Aristophanes, etsi sit canus, quito puellam virginem ducat uxorem, and is no news for an old fellow to marry a young wench, but as he follows it, mulieris brevis occasio est, etsi hoc non apprehenderit, Nemo vult ducre uxorum, expectans vero sedet. Who cares for an old maid? She may set, etc. A virgin, as the poet holds, la sciva et petulans puella virgo, is like a flower, a rose withered on a sudden. Quam modo nascentem ritulus conspexit eus, hanc radiens sero vespere vidit anum. She that was erst a maid as fresh as may, is now an old crone, time so steals away. Let them take time, then, while they may, make advantage of youth, and as he prescribes, Colige virgo rosas dum flos novus et nova pubes, et memor esto evium, sic properare tuum. Fair maids, go gather roses in the prime, and think that as a flower so goes on time. Let's all love, dum vires aniques sinunt while we are in the flower of years, fit for love matters, and while time serves, for solus occidere et redere possunt, nobis cum semel occidit brevis lux, nox est perpetuo una dormienda. Suns that set may rise again, but if once we lose this light, this withers perpetual night. 
volat irrevocabile tempus time past cannot be recalled but we need no such exhortation we are all commonly too forward yet if there be any escape and all be not as it should as diogenes struck the father when the son swore because he taught him no better if a maid or young man miscarry i think their parents oftentimes guardians overseers governors neque vos saith chrysostom a supplicio immunes evaditis si non statim ad nuptias etc are in as much fault and as severely to be punished as their children in providing for them no sooner now for such as have free liberty to bestow themselves i could wish that good counsel of the comical old man were put in practice opulentiores pauperiorum ut filias in dotas dicant uxores domum et multo fiat civitas concordior et invidia nos minore utemur quam utimur that rich man would marry poor maidens some and that without dowry and so bring them home so would much concord be in our city less envy should we have much more pity if they would care less for wealth and we should have much more content and quietness in a commonwealth beauty good bringing up methinks is a sufficient portion of itself dos est sua forma puellis her beauty is a maiden's dower and he doth well that will accept of such a wife Eubelidis, in Aristenetus, married a poor man's child, facie non illetabili, of a merry countenance and heavenly visage, in pity of her estate, and that quickly. Aconsius, coming to Delos, to sacrifice to Diana, fell in love with Cidipe, a noble lass, and wanting means to get her love, flung a golden apple into her lap, with this inscription upon it, Juro tibi sana per mystica sacra Dianae me tibi venturum comitem sponsum que futurum i swear by all the rights of diana i'll come and be thy husband if i may she considered of it and upon some small inquiry of his person and estate was married unto him blessed is the wooing that is not long a doing as the saying is when the parties are sufficiently known to each other what needs such scrupulosity so many circumstances dost thou know her conditions her bringing up like her person let her means be what they will, take her without any more ado. Dido and Aeneas were accidentally driven by a storm both into one cave, they made a match upon it. Massinissa was married to that fair captive Sophonisba, King Syphax's wife, the same day that he saw her first, to prevent Scipio Lelius, lest they should determine otherwise of her. If thou lovest the party, do as much. Good education and beauty is a competent dowry, stand not upon money erant olim aurei homines saith theocrates et adamantes redamabant in the golden world men did so in the reign of ogigas belike before staggering ninus began to domineer if all be true that is reported and some few nowadays will do as much here and there one tis well done methinks and all happiness befall them for so doing Leontius, a philosopher of Athens, had a fair daughter called Athenais, multo corporis lepore ac venere, said mine author, of a comely carriage. He gave her no portion but her bringing up, occulto forme, presagio, out of some secret foreknowledge of her fortune, bestowing that little which he had amongst his other children. But she, thus qualified, was preferred by some friends to Constantinople to serve Pulcheria, the emperor's sister, of whom she was baptized and called Eudokia. Theodosius, the emperor, in short space took notice of her excellent beauty and good parts, and a little after, upon his sister's sole commendation, made her his wife. It was nobly done of Theodosius. Rudophi was the fairest lady in her days in all Egypt. She went to wash her, and by chance, her maids meanwhile looking but carelessly to her clothes, an eagle stole away one of her shoes and laid it in Sametticus, the king of Egypt's lap at Memphis. He wondered at the excellency of the shoe and pretty foot, but more equilae factum at the manner of the bringing of it, and caused forthwith proclamation to be made that she that owned that shoe should come presently to his court. The virgin came and was forthwith married to the king. I say this was heroically done and like a prince. I commend him for it and all such as have means that will either do as he did themselves or so for love etc marry their children 
if he be rich, let him take such a one as once, if she be virtuously given, for as Siracides, chapter 7, verse 19, adviseth, Forgo not a wife and good woman, for her grace is above gold. If she have fortunes of her own, let her make a man. Danaus of Lacedaemon had a many daughters to bestow, and means enough for them all. He never stood inquiring after great matches as others used to do, but sent for a company of brave young gallants to his house, and bid his daughters choose every one one whom she liked best, and take him for her husband, without any more ado. This act of his was much approved in those times. But in this iron age of ours we respect riches alone, for a maid must buy her husband now with a great dowry if she will have him. Covetousness and filthy lucre mars all good matches, or some such by respects. Crelis, a Servian prince, as Nicephorus Gregoras relates it, was an earnest suitor to Eudokia, the emperor's sister, though her brother much desired, yet she could not abide him, for he had three former wives, all basely abused. But the emperor still, Crelis amicitiam magni faciens, because he was a great prince and a troublesome neighbour, much desired his affinity, and to that end betrothed his own daughter Simonida to him, a little girl five years of age, he being forty-five, and five years older than the emperor himself. Such disproportionable and unlikely matches can wealth and a fair fortune make. And yet not that alone, it is not only money, but sometimes vain glory, pride, ambition, do as much harm as wretched covetousness itself in another extreme. If a yeoman have one sole daughter, he must overmatch her, above her birth and calling, to a gentleman forsooth, because of her great portion, too good for one of her own rank, as he supposeth. A gentleman's daughter and heir must be married to a knight baronet's eldest son at least, and a knight's only daughter to a baron himself, or an earl, and so upwards, her great dower deserves it. And thus, striving for more honour to their wealth, they undo their children. Many discontents follow, and oftentimes they ruinate their families. Paulus Jovius gives instance in Galeatius the second, that heroical Duke of Milan, externas affinitatis, decoras quidem regio fastu, sed sibi et postris damnosas et ferre exitiales quesivit. He married his eldest son, John Galeatius, to Isabella, the king of France, his sister, but she was socorutam gravis, ut ducentis milibus aureoram constiterit. Her entertainment at Milan was so costly that it almost undid him. His daughter of Violenta was married to Lionel, Duke of Clarence, the youngest son to Edward the Third, King of England. But at eus adventum tantae opes tam admirabili liberalitate profusae sunt, ut opulentissimorum regum splendorem superasse videretur, he was welcomed with such incredible magnificence that a king's purse was scarce able to bear it, for besides many rich presents of horses, arms, plate, money, jewels, etc., he made one dinner for him and his company, in which were thirty-two messes, and as much provision left, ut relatae amensa tapes deca milibus hominum sufficerent, as would serve ten thousand men, but a little after Lionel died, novae nuptae et intempestivis conviviis operam dans, etc., and to the duke's great loss the solemnity was ended. So can titles, honours, ambition, make many brave but unfortunate matches of all sides for by-respects, though both crazed in body and mind, most unwilling, averse, and often unfit. So love is banished, and we feel the smart of it in the end, but I am too lavish peradventure in this subject. End of section twenty six.